International Company Plastic Course. You know, we perform it every year since 20 years, uh, two times in the year in Dresden, but because of uh, the Corona program, we have not. Otherwise, if you ha would have 1,200 people in Dresden now, it would become also a problem. So thank you very much to uh, come in, into this course. And um, I'm very glad that we changed a little bit our concepts. We invited a lot of um, speakers, um, international surgeons, um, very, very uh, perfect international surgeons. And um, so we will see different techniques in middle ear reconstruction. For the program, I'd like to um, mention that um, we start with some lectures of basics in middle ear reconstruction. And um, at 10.30, we start with uh, instructive video sessions. What does it mean? It means that the surgeons demonstrate their own videos, but they are not uh, preformed videos, they are not uh, pre um, um, pre prepared resources are live videos and they speak to say what they are doing. So, so we have something in the course like an, a live atmosphere in the operation theater. And um, uh, you can also ask during the um, um, demonstrations with um, in the chat room and can, uh, can ask, uh, send on some ask. Before we start with the surgeries, uh, we, we split the surgery topics to different uh, sections. The first is tumoric membrane reconstruction, and then comes ossicular chain reconstructions and status plasty and reconstruction of the posterior wall. And uh, before we start every video sessions, uh, we have some mechanical backgrounds we want to introduce because it's very important to know how and why you insert prosthesis and how you couple the prosthesis, we think. it, And this is trained in Dresden um, regularly in temporal bones. We have um, very nice experiments with headphones where you can control what you are doing in, in the preparation of how the sound effect is by, during the coupling of your prosthesis. And this we transformed uh, into the course now we prepared uh, videos from these uh, thermal bone preparations with uh, sound control, and you can hear what's happened when you uh, when you uh, place your prosthesis on the malleus or on the mantle. Um, but um, this course would not be working with uh, uh, the surgeons from all over the world. And we have uh, from the US surgeons, we have from uh, Great Britain, from Europe. And um, I'd like to welcome the surgeons and introduce the surgeons. Um, I'm not sure if we could change the, uh, um, the picture so that the surgeons are named uh, are visible at the screen. Um, I start uh, at the alphabet with Chris Aldrin. Chris Aldrin. Good morning. Um, hello. Hi. Chris Aldrin. He's uh, from uh, Great Britain and he comes from the hospital in Windsor. Um, it's near London and he's a very experienced surgeon with middle ear prosthesis. He has done very good. Uh, videos on middle ear reconstruction, a very experience um, with tumanoplasty and osigoloplasty. I'm proud that we have you here, Chris. Uh, the next is Cesar Orush. Cesar, where are you? Cesar. Uh, Cesar is from Spain. He is from Barcelona and is also a very excellent surgeon and he has also experts in his clinic with uh, diagnostic of CT scan, very good um, CT scan qualities. And he performed also 
um, international courses, October the Fasti in Barcelona, and we did surgery together in Barcelona and also in Porto. Nice to have Pleasure you. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. Uh, Alex Huber. Alex Huber is known from everybody. Alex, we have no picture from you. Maybe Alex Huber come from Switzerland and he did a lot of work with middle ear mechanics and published a lot of middle ear um, papers, uh, middle ear mechanics, and is also a very excellent surgeon in uh, scalp based surgery, also in stable surgery. Welcome to the course, Alex. And the next is uh, Carl Bernd Hüttenbrink. Carl Bernd Hüttenbrink is, <laughs> was here in Dresden 10 years from 2000, from 90, uh, uh, 1993 to LPS to 2004. And then he moved to Cologne. He was the head of the department here and he um, uh, built up together with me the Middle Ear Lab in Dresden and then after in Cologne. He's also a very experienced surgeon and uh, he uh, is a very innovative in uh, development of prosthesis and uh, other tools for middle ear surgery. Welcome to the course. Hi, everybody. Uh, the next is Chuck Cartouche. Chuck Cartouche, or Jack, how to say? Jack. <laughs> Jack. Jack, nice to meet you. We have. Um, a contact over the oceans. Um, you comes from Detroit in US, near Detroit, yes. And, Correct. Uh, he is a very innovative surgeon. He developed also some middle ear prosthesis and he was also the head of the department of the um, Michigan Ear Institute many years. Now he is retired and he is also a good guitar player as me. Very welcome in the course. Thank you. Glad to be here. And then we have Jan Christoph Wiers. He is from Cologne. Um, we did also together uh, courses in Cologne. He did also a lot of publications um, on middle ear prosthesis and is also an excellent surgeon and demonstrate us, um, I think, a very interesting uh, videos on middle ear reconstruction. Jan Christoph, welcome from Cologne, Germany. Thank you, hello world. And then I'm very proud that we have uh, Daniel Marchioni. Daniel is from Italy, you know, and he is an endoscopic surgeon and he is one of the leading endoscopic surgeons in the world, I think. And that was also one of our intention to mix the techniques so that we have um, the traditional microscopic uh, technique and also the endoscopic uh, for middle ear reconstruction. And uh, I'm, I'm so glad that you are in the course and um, very welcome, warm welcome. Thank you, thank you, good morning, thank you. And uh, last but not least is uh, Robert Vincent. Robert Vincent is from the Cousin Clinic in France. I think, uh, Many doctors know him because he has also excellent courses in middle ear reconstruction and excellent techniques, camera techniques and the video techniques. And he is also an excellent surgeon in middle ear reconstruction. And it's very nice to have Robert also here in the course. Um, last but least, well, yeah, I want to introduce two people from my staff. Uh, regularly, we have here a lot of engineers uh, included in this course. Uh, today, we have uh, two doctors. One is uh, a lady's first, Susan Leilach. Susan Leilach is also active in, um, mm -hmm. in middle ear research and did a lot of publications also on quality of life and reconstruction techniques, and she will present. Um, a lecture about uh, pre-diagnostic. Welcome, Susan. And uh, Professor Neudert is um, side, the director of the Middle Ear Lab. And he is also 
extremely active in the publications and development of uh, prosthesis and other parts in our lab. And he will also do a presentation on um, quality um, requirements in the re uh, uh, reconstruction. And um, also in, uh, have also prepared some videos for the uh, reconstruction with our signal chains. Marcus, you're welcome. Thank you, hello all together. So um, I'd like to thank the Kurtz company, uh, especially Matthias Mertens. He give us a chance to be online in the whole world. Um, and I'd like to thank the Kurtz company for the support. I think uh, we have all uh, of the speakers have some connections with <coughs> Kurtz company. Um, so we have, of course, some um, conflicts of interest because we got support from the company, but we have also the research projects with the company. So I think uh, once we present something, we are close to the company, of course, but we are also close to everything which uh, makes uh, middle ear reconstruction. And we want to include also in our presentations um, other technique or other techniques uh, independent from Kurtz. So thank you very much for Kurtz company for the support and the technical support, especially in this course. Thank you. So the program um, I'd like to demonstrate at the screen. The program I'd like to demonstrate here. Um, we start now with um, presentations, basic presentations on middle ear function, and uh, also with some general voice presentations. And then we have a, a small uh, 30 minutes of uh, preoperative lectures uh, for preoperative uh, diagnostic with uh, hearing tests, what is necessary, CT scan, MRI, uh, coherence tomography, and quality management. And uh, then we have a small panel discussion, what is really necessary in this topic. And from 11.30 to um, 12, it starts with a tumoric membrane reconstruction. Uh, then comes a cellular chain reconstruction uh, 0.3 with bridging. Then we have a small break of half an hour at one o'clock. And then comes a tumoroplastic cellular chain reconstruction with type three. A type 3 B, B and um, after the video presentations, we have panel discussions about these topics. And then at the end, Davis Blasty and Connor, Connor Wall uh, reconstruction. So that is uh, a very uh, intensive program. And uh, we have a timeline. I hope that we are in the, uh, can stay in the timeline. Um, um, please look if you come out or in um, to the clock, but maybe we are some minutes before or after uh, the scheduled uh, time. So if you have any questions in the chat, you can send it to me now. Otherwise, we would uh, see some questions from India, Pakistan, Okay, greetings from Malaysia. Okay, thank you so much. So we want to start with the first presentation on um, basics. Um, this means the function of the middle ear and one who was did a lot of research in this topic was Carl van Hittenbrink. And I want to please him to start with the first presentation. Okay. So it's my turn. I will start with the first picture. Is it correct? Yes. So, so I give uh, Bildschirm freigeben. Share the screen, yes. Share the screen. Wow. And then this is it. Yes, we have it. And then you should see my first slide. Yes. Is it correct? That's correct. Thank you. Oh, fine, fine. So uh, just for a few minutes to get into the topic, 
before we start reconstruction, we have to understand how it works. Before you repair a car, you must know if you have an electro car or a, a gasoline car, for example. And uh, the same with the middle ear. So this is how we started when we started the middle ear lab. We wanted first to understand the function of the middle ear. And there are two topics on it. We all know the acoustic function, but there is also an atmospheric and non-acoustic function of the middle ear because this highly sensitive microphone in the inner ear has also to withstand the atmospheric pressures around because all the system is a, is a mechanical pressure receiver. We all know the uh, construction of the middle ear tympanic membrane, malleus, incus, tapes, and the sound pressure goes into the inner ear and then over changed into the cochlear impulse into the brain. So this is the basics, which we all know. And this, by the way, middle ear cavity is air-filled, the only air-filled cavity in the body with a separated little tympanic membrane between the both air fields there. So why did nature develop this middle ear? Why did it need to develop it? Well, when life expanded from sea shore to life in the air, uh, nature faced a problem because this mechanical pressure receiver, which was always the most important warning organ, suddenly didn't work anymore because in air, sound pressure travels a different way than underwater. Underwater, pressure waves travel through any water co uh, contact, and that is also the fish underwater without any obstacle. Whereas pressure waves in the air with their large amplitudes and small pressure, when they hurt to water to another to another media, it will most of the energy will be reflected. It's the same with the water of the inner ear. So nature had designed something to bring these air pressure, large amplitudes, low pressure vibrations into the water. And for this purpose, nature developed the tympanic membrane, which means that the sound pressure from outside is collected with the tympanic membrane. The bird's tympanic membrane is always curved outwards and then transferred it to the inner ear via a columella in the birds or in all the mammals, which is also men, with the incurved tympanic membrane and the three ossicular chain. So mammals, you can uh, see them also as the three ossicular animals. They, all the mammals have the three ossicles. So, this is the transformation. The most important part for this transfer from sound pressures from the outer world into the water of the inner ear starts at the tympanic membrane. This is the motor of the engine, the motor of the whole hearing. If this, this transformation from pressure waves to mechanical vibration in and outwards of the ossicular chain is not working due to the tympanic membrane, then the rest will not work, work anymore or work with the less, least with very low efficiency because this transformation is not working. So this is where we autosurgeons concentrate on to make this motor and the structure working again. And you can hear this also. This is, we made a little experiment. Uh, this is look into the middle ear cavity from, uh, from a hole and there is the tympanic membrane is around here. And where we have a loudspeaker and it transfers sound into through the ossicular chain into the inner ear and we have a microphone placed in the inner ear. And so if you give music here, you will hear now what you hear is the sound in the inner ear. And if we fill the middle ear with water, that means if the air is not on both sides of the tympanic membrane, then the tympanic membrane will not vibrate efficiently. And this shows the important fact, the important factor of the tympanic membrane. Here you hear the music. This is normal music in the inner ear now. But now we fill the middle ear with water so that the tympanic membrane cannot vibrate efficiently anymore. And this is, everybody knows this phenomenon, but this is also how little children with their mucoserotympanon will hear. That means they will not hear very well. And this shows the importance of the tympanic membrane as the motor. So, Next slide. Next step for the function is what are the vibrations? What are the dimensions of the vibration we are talking about? So in normal tympanometry, that means an atmospheric sound, uh, atmospheric pressure environment, you will even see the umbo and the tympanic membrane moving. Uh, we use it in Siegel's maneuver, tympanometry, blowing the nose, going in the air, in the aeroplane or diving underwater. This is around one millimeter. 
much smaller will be the vibrations or the movements if you go uh, to lower pressure pressures. And here you start with the acoustic range and the threshold, adhering threshold is so many tenfold times smaller that is incredibly small. In the beginning, when they started to investigate it, people or researchers didn't believe it, that the ear is so sensitive that at the threshold of hearing in one kilohertz, it is tenfold smaller than the diameter of the hydrogen molecule. Bikushi said, we were, we, our ear will, call, will detect amplitudes which are in the men dimensions between the uh, proton of, a, of, a, of, the atom, uh, of the atomic and the electron uh, cloud around it. So incredibly small. We have a sort of atomic force, atomic pressure sensor in the middle ear, in our ear. And just to give you an example, this is very difficult to understand, nanometer, angstrom, micrometer, transfer it to the normal life where we live in the world. If we imagine that we, for example, have a microphone that is sensitive to detect amplitudes of one millimeter around, one millimeter, then if you blow the nose, this microphone will, will, be, ex, um, will be irritated by a pressure wave which is around 1,000 kilometers large. This is the dimensions of the ear where it works our ear. This is the sensitive hearing, and this is blowing the nose. So nature had to design something so that this very sensitive microphone will not collapse, will not, will not be destroyed. And it had also to design something to detect these molecular sized uh, amplitudes of vibration. So this is why the ossicles are the smallest bones of the body. By the way, nature had to see this also in animals. Growing size of an animal means that the ossicles cannot grow the same size. This is, for example, in order to detect at the hearing threshold. If the ossicles are too large, the, the, uh, will not, um, the, they will not vibrate in this, atmos in this uh, atomic sizes. So the upper, the, upper, um, the upper is a malleus here of a little hamster, little mouse-like creature. And this four millimeter, and this is 12 millimeter, the malleus of a lion. But a lion is more than three times larger than a mouse. So you see this negative allometry is also, these physical laws must be respected by evolution. This is the principle how the, how the middle ear works. We will, the collect sound collection, the pressure waves will be collected by the large tympanic membrane and transferred, <coughs> sorry, transferred directly to the foot plate. If you ask an acoustic engineer, <coughs> he would say, just place a little rod in between the center of the tympanic membrane and the center of the foot plate. And this will vibrate. And this sort of columella vibrates fantastically. We'll see this in the animals of the birds. The snow owl will even hear the mouse running underneath the snow. So a direct columella there is also a very effective uh, transmission of sound. So, but the ossicle chain, the ossicular chain, how does it vibrate? We have joints in here, but for the sound pressure transfer, where we have really only at, uh, atomic sizes of vibrations, the whole ossicular chain will vibrate mostly in an in and out movement, completely fixed. That means it is really vibrating like a rigid rod. There are only minimal movements in the ossicular chain, which have nothing to do with the sound transfer. But then the question comes, why did nature construct the ossicles and especially the joints? Because the joints are not working, are functionally fixed for sound transport. Well, these joints are not just negligible. They are delicate and nature never constructs anything without any purpose. So this is the malleus incus joint and you see hyaline cartilage on top. You even see a synovial fluid. You see a, a joint cartilage and a, a joint capsule around there. So this is a real little joint similar in basic construction like the big joints of the body. Why did it construct? It? Well, again, let's look in the environment. Nature constructed the ear as a warning organ for extremely small uh, pressure waves to detect it. On the other side, this very sensitive microphone must withstand, for, for me as an ear surgeon, water column is more easily to understand than Pascal or Bar, because we all know 10 meters is one atmosphere, we jump into the water and so, and this microphone, our ear withstands pressure waves up till 10 meters, which I already showed you, a million times larger than the here at the hearing threshold, these pressure waves. So this would distract any artificial micro, microphone, which 
any engineer can construct. You cannot build microphones, uh, which covers all these dimensions. But nature did. And how did nature do it? Just by introducing these two joints, malleus incus, incus tapis. And there's a, a, a funny micro mechanism in there. This is the rotation axis, the famous Helmholtz rotational axis. And when there is a large movement inside, like a gush of wind, this tsunami of 1,000 kilometer height rushes into the ear, then there will be a rotation around this axis ligament. The malleus incus joint will glide. The malleus will lift. The incus will lift a little bit up. And then there will be a start a gliding in the incus, incus tapis joint. That means the tapis is decoupled from all these huge tsunami pressures in the outer world, and the inner ear is protected. And this is, it's only unfortunately it's still in German, the Losbrechmoment. That means at which, which will be the force necessary to break loose this joint, this cartilage joint. It is interestingly around one millimeter, millinewton, around 120 decibel. That means at this moment, when you increase the acoustic pressure, then suddenly the middle ear becomes nonlinear. That means you will have a, a loose breaking of the joints, gliding in the joint. That means not a linear transmission of sound from the outer world to the inner world. You can measure all this, these gliding. For example, if you exert pressure to the external ear canal in tympanometry, you have 400 millimeter water column in and outward pressure. And the ambo, that means the malleus, will move outwards in one case of up to 600 micrometers out or 400 meters in. That means one millimeter, 1,000 micrometers. But the stapes will never move more than 10 or 15 micrometers. Uh, regardless of the outside pressure, this comes from the jo gliding joints. And what is 10, 15, 15 micrometers? You just must remember that the diameter of an erythrocyte is only six micrometers. That means the stapes will never move more than the diameter of two, micros, two erythrocytes in and outward. This peculiar movement <clears throat> can also be seen in the positioning of the joint, this malleus incus joint. It makes no sense if you have a piston-like vibration of the whole ossicular chain in and outwards from the outer world to the inner world. The joint, but the joint is perpendicular because the incus will be lifted up and going down like you saw before. Uh, and then the joint can glide. And here you see the cartilage in between the joint. This is a X-ray magnification and it really looks like a normal joint of the body. This is the hyaline cartilage in the malleus incus joint, and it also is the same histologic development like in the big joints of the body. That means hyaline cartilage is not nourished by blood supply. The blood stops here, but it will be nourished by synovial fluid displacement and circulation and by diffusion. So when you ask an orthopedic surgeon about this hyaline cartilage, when you look at this hyaline cartilage from above in the scanning electron uh, microscopy, you see it is completely smooth, the surface, like the big joints of the body. How smooth is it? Well, look down here. This is five micrometers. That means this would be an erythrocyte, the size of an erythrocyte. You can see it's completely smooth, thus to break loose at around 100, 120 decibel. That means when you have atmospheric pressures, this tsunami acting onto the ear. And you all know that uh, these joints, this circulation of the synovial fluid, uh, fluid which is so crucial for, uh, the, uh, for the hyaline cartilage, because it is only depending on this circulation, uh, this movement, how does it work? Where, where does this movement come from in the middle ear? It is not the sound, because for sound transport, the joints are functionally fixed. Nature had to design something, and the joints in the whole body are moved by the muscles. Well, we have two muscles in the middle ear. The, the acoustic function of these muscles is not explained and cannot be explained. Tensor tympani has no effect whatsoever on sound transport. Stapedius muscle has only a very tiny um, effect on the low frequencies and some two, three decibels in the high frequencies. And especially how do they work? If you act on the stapedius muscle reflex, you can also elicit it by moving, by, by touching your outer ear canal and the tensor tympani even more, here it will contract when you blow air into the orbit, into the, onto the eye. So no acoustic function. But if you cut the, the, the um, incudus tapedial joint here, if you, for example, in an erosion of the long incus process, when these both muscles cannot contract anymore, cannot work antagonistically, and they cannot no longer move the joint between malleus and incus, 
you will find very interesting surface scanning if you're asked an orthopedic surgeon. And again, this is five micrometers. That means this is an erythrocyte, the size. He will tell you, well, this is typical arthrotic. This is a demasking of the um, collagen fibers, the loss of the ground substance. That means this is atrocious if the muscles do not move the joints anymore. So in compendium, in summary, if you look into this middle ear function, you have in reality, you have two functions. The one function is the easy way. There's where we are doing surgery. That means piston-like in and out vibration to transport the sound, this uh, atomic sizes, dimensions of amplitudes into the inner ear. But on the other hand side, this very sensitive microphone must survive in the outer world with its high, huge pressures, million times large pressures, blowing the ear and so on, or wind gusts on the ear. And then suddenly we have a joint function, the joints will glide, and we will have a decoupling of the outer world of the tympanic membrane from the inner ear. In reconstruction, we have to concentrate on a piston-like vibration in and outwards. We must not change it. And especially we must not try to integrate any joints because they have nothing to do with hearing. They will only decrease the efficiency of sound transport because there you need a very hard sound contact from the outer world to the inner ear. So don't try to reconstruct any joint because any joint, for example, placing connective tissue under a prosthesis so will only decrease the efficiency because connective tissue will dampen the sound transport. So, and this is the entrance for our reconstructive procedures, respect the piston-like vibrations in and outwards. Thank you very much for your hearing. Thank you. That's it. Yes, Carl Bern, thank you. Thank you very much for this nice presentation. And um, these are basics. I'd like to continue with some pictures about sounds transmission. Um, not too much and demonstrate you some tumble bones. So um, I will share the screen now. Sorry. Um, Professor Hüttenbrink, can you stop screen sharing, please? Where is that? I would like to stop. Ah, stop, stop it. Yes, stop. Thank you. No, Thank you. I just didn't find the stop. Yeah. OK. <clears throat> um, <coughs> you have heard something about uh, the tumbonic membrane as a motor of the middle ear. And I'd like to continue with uh, this picture here. The sound comes to the membrane, and the membrane has also a shield function. Once the membrane is intact, then we have a uh, poor uh, ossicular chain coupling to the inner ear. That's very important. Otherwise, we have a coupling to the round window. Uh, but what I want to show you are some pictures from the vibration of the whole system. Uh, that is a mechanical metal, um, model, but we did measurements on uh, temporal bones and measured the vibrations of the uh, membrane. And that is a vibration of the membrane at 400 hertz. This is a vibration, it's a butterfly vibration at one kilohertz. Here you see the malleus, and it, it, it's an extremely different. If you couple here to the malleus, your prosthesis, or to the um, membrane itself in the posterior part. In the higher frequency, if you have different vibration spots and we have a large in and outward movement of the malleus, so for the sound transfer, the coupling to the malleus is uh, important. We can measure that also in vivo, but it will be demonstrated by Markus Neudert. And we learned from this that we have different vibration modes depending from the frequencies we stimulate. And the vibration modes dominates the malleus vibration and it as influence uh, also of the quality of the sound transfer. We can do it also with the chain to measure the chain vibrations. That's the malleus, that's the malleus body, uh, the head of the malleus, the incus body, and the long process of the incus, 500 hertz. Here we have it, the malleus in an outward movement, 
And here is a long process at 2.5 Hertz. And here we have it at four kilohertz. And you can see a rotation here. It's a long process of increase. And this rotation leads in the lower frequencies, we have no rotation. In low frequencies, we have a piston like movement of the food plate. That's the stable food plate. But by coming from the rotation of the long process, we have a, a tilting like movement of the stable piston. <coughs> so, Carl Brandt, please, please uh, block your microphone. Um, we have a three dimensional ossicular chain vibration. We have no fixed rotation axis um, and we have a loss of energy also in the sound transmission of the normal chain. Um, I'd like to demonstrate to you a small uh, temporal bone experiments. We give sound to the external channel and we can hear what's happened. So that is the mother's handle and we give stress to the tendon of the malleus. And in intact chain, it doesn't matter. We have not an effect of the sound of the inner ear. We picked up the sound with a microphone in the round window, in the oval round window niche, no effect. But it's uh, completely different if we change to. Um, To the stapedius tendon. So the annular ligament is very sensitive for tension and you take, should take care once you cover a prosthesis to the stapedius head that you give not too much tension um, to the uh, stapedius and annular ligament. Also in case of intact, uh, intact chain sensitive, but also in case of reconstruction. So I'd like to stop here and I want to give uh, the talk to our next speakers um, about the preoperative diagnostic. And I want to please uh, see Susan Lila to um, uh, give a small uh, lecture about the preoperative diagnostic in autograms. Hmm. Hmm. So, audiometric uh, preoperative diagnostics. The question is what we need really, what should we not do, or how we can uh, find out in cases of uh, intact membrane what is the reason of the airborne gap? Hmm. Then, then. You can share the screen? No, no, not yet. Sie müssten unten in der Menüleiste Bildschirm freigeben haben. Wenn Sie mit dem Mauszeiger runtergehen. Ja. So? Ja, das sieht gut aus. Jawohl. Jetzt noch Präsentationsmodus. Okay. Okay. It's my task to uh, speak about basics of preoperative audiological diagnostics in middle ear uh, disease. The lack of national and international standards makes it a little bit difficult to recommend a standardized diagnostic procedure. And generally, audiological diagnostics depends on clinical findings, medical history, and the intention of surgical intervention. And it makes a difference whether it, you look at a patient with an obvious cholesterotoma or a patient with an intact normal tympanic membrane. In patients with typical pathological findings such as cholesterotoma, Uterine audiometry may be sufficient to confirm the diagnosis and the indication for surgery. With this, you can make statements about the hearing level, the cochlea reserve, and the middle ear related aspect of the hearing loss. 
but in patients with an intact tympanic membrane and conductive hearing loss, further audiological tests are necessary for differential diagnosis, such as disruption of the ossicular chain or the sclerosis, fixation of the malleus head or canal descent syndromes. In these patients, we generally recommend to perform speech audiometry to verify the results of the pure tone audiometry. And in patients with an additional inner ear component, um, it's really necessary to uh, confirm the bone conduction hearing fresh threshold by a um, speech audiometric test via a bone conduction transducer. And further objective tests are necessary for the differential diagnosis, such as tympanometry, stapitus reflex measurements, and WAMS. For example, in patients with disruption of the ossicular chain, you nearly almost find an elevated tympanogram on the affected side. The PTS reflex measurements should also be performed in these patients because uh, in autosclerosis patients, it's, um, the PTS reflexes are almost not detectable on the affected side in all frequencies. And um, if you want to exclude a canal DSN syndrome, uh, it's necessary to record the WAMS, especially the O RAMS, because in patients with canal DSN syndromes, nearly almost all patients uh, will offer uh, elevated amplitudes of the O RAMS on the affected side. In patients with a preoperative hearing aid fitting, it is useful to make a hearing aid assessment before surgery, because in these patients, um, we can assess the potential of the hearing rehabilitative intervention before surgery. And um, you can identify perfect candidates for um, implantable hearing aids, for example, and this, this patient, um, he's a patient after multiple tympanoplasties with poor middle ear ventilation, high airborne gap, and uh, speech comprehension of 15% with a conventional hearing aid. This is the perfect um, patient for an active middle ear implant. So when we conclude, we have a, um, a patient with conductive hearing loss, then we should uh, differentiate. Um, is the um, tympanic membrane intact or is there a typical pathological finding? With typical pathological findings, um, the pure tone autometry may be enough in the preoperative setting. But in patients with intact and normal tympanic membrane. We need pure tone autometry. We need speech autometry to verify the pure tone autometry results. And we need the objective tests uh, battery uh, to for the differential diagnosis. And with this short overview about basics of um, audiological diagnostics, I will move on to the further lectures on imaging, which complement um, the Oh, Susan, many thanks. Uh, the last words were cancelled by your microphone, but uh, thank you very much. Um, he was working the last 24 hours in the clinic, I know it, and uh, thank you for this nice presentation. Um, yes, are there any questions to this topic? Um, if yes, you can do it in the chat, I think. Otherwise, I would like to continue. Um, I think from the line timeline, it would be good for Cesar Oros. Cesar, would you start with CD scan? Would it be possible? Yes, it's possible. Do you hear me? Yes, we hear you. 
Okay, good morning, everybody, dear colleagues, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's a uh, First of all, I would like to Dr. Sanner his kind invitation to participate in this strength course. It's a pleasure, it's an honor to share this uh, interesting course with uh, such a brilliant authorities as all of you are. So Dr. Sanner suggests me, I will share the, the now the display. Can you see the presentation? Yes. Yes, okay. So Dr. Fanner suggests me to talk about the role of CT scan in the pre-surgical evaluation of tympanoplastids. And in this sense, I think that all agree that uh, CT scan has a crucial role in the pre-surgical assessment of tympanoplasticos because he gives us information, a very interesting information about the most important factors for proper tympanoplastic planning in detail. CT scan help us to make the diagnostic of the etiology of the ear disorder if we're facing a chronic otitis or a cholesteatoma. CT scan let us know the status of the secular change of the prosthesis, the extension of the knee and ear, and even the middle ear ventilation. And in many cases, we can know the anatomy of the surgical field that we will find when to perform the tympanoplasty. So I would like to say that my first meeting is very clear, and we suggest that a pre-op CT scan is a mask when you are facing a tympanoplastic. Let's take a look at these factors. The first factor, etiology of the ear disorder. We all know that uh, otoscopy allows to differentiate these two pathologies easily in most of the cases. It's very simple, like the type of perforation, the presence of granulation tissue. But in some cases, especially with a large inflammatory reaction or granulation tissue, this uh, the differential diagnosis is not that simple. In this situation, it's very useful to use a, uh, to ask for a CT scan, looking for CT scan findings, suggesting of cholesteatoma. I, I, I put the three more important. For me, the most important uh, finding suggestive of, of cholesteatoma is air cavity plus bone erosion. Uh, air cavity occupation is in a specific sign, but if associated with bone erosion is very suggestive of cholesteatoma. You can uh, find erosion of any walls of the ear, attic wall in the attic, in the, in the scutum, in the attic osteotoma, in the mastoid. You can find erosion of the ossicles with the exception of the necrosis of incus lenticular process that can be seen also in a, a benign otitis. And in a large cholesteatoma, you can find erosion of the semicircular channel, fallopian tube. Another characteristic point of cholesteatoma as the erosion is round shapes, is rounded margins. It's very characteristic for cholesteatoma. And another sign, the last one, is ossicular chain displacement. Let's see some, some examples. This is an atical cholesteatoma, and you see the typical erosion of the scutum. You lost the sharp shape is lost. This is characteristic from the attic cholesteatoma. But if you see, if you see the axial plane, you see the, uh, the round uh, shape of the, of the erosion and also the internal displacement of the circular chain. This is very characteristic of cholesteatoma. And in, in, the other, in this other scan, the contrary, internal cholesteatoma that displays the circular chain to outsides. This is an, a CT scan of external cholesteatoma of the channel, external channel, and you see the same. The round erosion is characteristic and in large cholesteatomas, an example of different degrees of erosion of the lateral semicircular channel. You see here, this is a erosion only of the top. Many of the cases you can see, you preserve the endosteum. MRI can help you to see what's, what's happened here. And in this case, you see an, um, an, a huge amputation um, of the semicircular that is very, very, very characteristic of cholesteatoma. But if otoscopy and CT scan are not conclusive, we suggest to ask a diffusion non-epi MRI because it has the best sensitivity and best specificity for cholesteatoma diagnosis. I think next speaker will talk about that. This is a classical example. You, it is a CT scan of a patient that in the when has a tympanoplastic and you see that um, a study is fully equipped of soft tissue. It's impossible to know that this is cholesteatoma or this is uh, uh, 
uh, soft tissues in contrast with the uh, MRI, as you see in the T2 coronal, a uh, hyper signal in the core. In T1 post gadolinium you see hypo signal with little enhanced of the peripheral, but it's very characteristic that the, in uh, no echoplanar diffusion, you see this very, very, very brilliant signal that is almost patosomonic of cholesteatoma. We see the scan, you have doubts with uh, uh, MMI, you can solve this problem. We move to the next information. See the scan allows to know the, uh, the status of the, of the circular change, but not only this, he also uh, know the grading of the circular disorders like Aston Carter's classification score. He let us to know the chances of success like Sestoffer grading scale and also know the risk of the procedure in terms of low or high risk of neurosensorial damage. And this point is very important to know and to explain to the patient to discuss the indication or not of the surgery. Let's see some examples. This is a CT scan of a normal tympanoplasty type one. You can see the cartilage in the axial and in the coronal. This is a CT scan of a type two tympanoplastic. You see the membranic tympan, the graphs, the cartilage graph, but you also can see the remodulated incus between the handle of the malleus. You can see the notch for the handle of the malleus. And in the sagittal plane, you can see the hole that we make for a stabilization the stabilization of the, of the incus in the head of the steps. And these three are type C three panoplastic. In this one, you see the eardrum directly to the head of the steps. In this other is interposition of cartilage in between the eardrum and the steps. And this other, a, a pop tympanoplastic, when you can see the, 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 the pop is perfectly oriented. But you can use also in, in radiation surgery. This is a typical image of a displaced torp in the sinus tympani, or this case of transport transposed incus that is fixed in the, to the uh, to the bone of the anus, and that's the reason of the the surgery doesn't work. And this is an interesting case of a successful stort that presents a progressive hearing loss after surgery, and you can see here in the axial and the coronal. The direction was okay, but the real problem was the sclerosis and calcification of the foot plate. And this is to solve this problem is a high risk procedure because we have to remove the foot plate in contrast with the other that the, the foot plate is normal and you don't have to uh, open the, the inner ear. This is a nice information to know before surgery. Or this case of persistent vertigo after total platinectomy with torp, and you can see here the torp. And what happened is the torp fall down into the vestibulum and causing the vertigo and the hearing loss. And I'd like to show you this, this image because explain that high resolution scan is a high resolution scanner. And you can see this, this uh, image of a hearing loss after a head trauma. And you can see that both cures were broken, like in this, this round. And this is, if you perform it can be seen with a, a CT scan, this level of detail. Finally, the CT scan shows the extension of the lesions, and this is very important for choosing the best approach. Here are some examples. Look at this a small optical external, external cholesteatoma in the coronal and in the axial. This cholesteatoma is suitable for endoscopic or microscopic transcanal approach. This is a slightly bigger cholesteatoma. But in the axial uh, uh, plane, you see that this cholesterol don't go beyond the antrum, so it's still suitable for transcanal or endoscopic approach in comparison with this other cholesteatoma, huge cholesteatoma that will be treated with an retroricular microscopic approach, or this other cholesteatoma, a supralabyrinthic cholesteatoma that goes surrounding the uh, superior channel, then you need to do a middle force approach to solve this problem. And finally, but very important, with the CT scan, you can see the anatomy of your surgical that you will find during operation, the sinus, sinus, the sigmoid sinus position, mastoidal attestation, et cetera. And this helps you to choose the best surgical technique. Two examples, look at this case of a, a sigmoid sinus procedure, very 
proceedings of the senior sentence. This only can be treated with a channel down mastidectomy or these other uh, CT scans of uh, cholesteatomas, but in this case with a good pneumatization of the mastoid, and in this case with a poor pneumatization, this is suitable for a canal up mastoidectomy, and this is for canal down mastoidectomy. So as a final comment, I would like to show you different images to explain that in my opinion, I think it's the most uh, uh, accepted opinion, CT scan is the autologist's best friend, so it doesn't matter how ugly, handsome is your radiologist, you have to make him fall in love with you because corroboration is very important for to get a good information of CT scan. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cesar, for an excellent presentation. It was short and complex and very instructive. Thank you so much. And uh, if you have some questions to CT scan diagnostic, you can connect us in the chat. Okay. And then we have a discussion uh, afterwards. Uh, okay. Please, Cesar, close your microphone. And okay. I'd like to continue um, with a um, presentation about MRI diagnostic. Um, you can see my screen, I think. No? Yes. So um, we have today not only CD scan, but we have also MRI. We know from MRI that it's not suitable to detect um, small bony defects. So for the osteoclastic chain, it's not sufficient. But we know that is uh, that we have a high recurrence rate of cholesteatoma dependent from the age and dependent from um, the technique. Uh, for example, once we have a uh, power wall up technique uh, without obliteration, we have here in this study in children in 75% uh, recurrence of cholesteatoma. And uh, it can happen after 10 to 10, 15 years. So it's a long time. And the question is how we should control these children. In adults, it's the same. In column all up without obliteration, we have a recurrence rate of thirty-five um, percent, and um, over the long time, over the time, and um, it can happen until twenty-five years after surgery. Um, so um, recurrence in adults fifteen percent, and in children thirty-seven percent. So uh, we had to control this, uh, these people and the MRI is very uh, suitable to detect cholesteatoma, but it is limited too. Uh, we have here uh, MRI scan in case of cholesteatoma, the T1. T1, you know, it's fat uh, visible. T2, it's more fluid. And we see here some fluid in the mass to it. And then we made a diffusion baked imaging, and we can see here an enhancement um, also in this case. But sometimes it's difficult to make, um, to differentiate from uh, cannulation tissue. We have here T1, T2 in the mastoid fluid, and uh, we have here diffusion weighted no enhancement, and we have here diffusion weighted uh, with a small enhancement. And uh, one factor we can use is the uh, apparent diffusion coefficient. So once you talk with your radiologics as to the EDC level, and if you see there's a cholesteatoma, the EDC level in case of cholesteatoma, it's much more lower than in case of cannulation tissue. And you can use the cutoff. It's a cutoff of 0.68. It was detected here in this study. So ADC level is important. Uh, but the MRT, MRI can fail the diagnosis. For example, in this case, we have here an enhancement in non diffusion weighted imaging. And uh, after in T2, we have also an enhancement here in fat, after fat uh, suppression. So it looks like um, 
uh, cholesteatoma, but it's not. It was cartilage. It was infected cartilage. Um, the question is how safe is the MRI in the control um, of patients after uh, cholesteatoma surgery? And here's a prospective study um, with non diffusion weighted imaging um, and the follow up of. Uh, around 300 days, it's around one year. And the results was that we have a predicted value of, of 93% and a negative predicted value of 53, depends. And also large cholesterol were overlooked. So we have a good sensitivity, but uh, we cannot say in every case that there is no cholesterol, also in some large cases. And so, we think that um, the MRI today, it's difficult to say if it could uh, replace the second look surgery. It's also here in this table shown in this study that we have a problem with sensitivity and negative predictive value. Uh, we can uh, improve our investigation technique with uh, target um, um, target uh, effusion imaging. And uh, you can see it here in this paper that uh, they could down with this technique down to two millimeter. Maybe that is in future, it's from 2020 uh, method to detect also small cholesterol Um There is a publication also from the kids, uh, from the Pittsburgh group and they was, as the question was, um, do we have a paradigm shift in the control of cholesterol uh, because of the use of MRI? And they uh, have the opinion that it's sensitive enough to detect cholesterol in general bones. Um, the surgical trend moves toward the minimal invasive surgery uh, in children with uh, control um, by MRI. And they perform also a single cycloplasty stage, single plasty, and they use also endoscope. But the main manage is they also start with control the children after surgery with MRI. And once I would summarize, I would say the MRI is not suitable for detection of ocicular chain defects. It's sensitive for large cholestatoma than three, larger than three millimeters. We have a problem in dry retraction pockets. You should think about this. Um, the specificity is poor, especially uh, in case of cartilage and granulation uh, tissue. So we cannot trust um, the MRI technique in every case. So that was my presentation on MRI. And I'd like to stop and give now the talk to Markus Neudel. Yeah, hello everybody. Try to share my screen. He wants to do a presentation about uh, um, optical coherence tomography. It's a new method and about quality management, Markus. Yeah, thank you very much. It's both. It's a pleasure and an honor to uh, be part of this delighted board here and uh, the course, which is presented online. Um, and as we've heard so far regarding imaging techniques, um, I'm very happy that ENT is the beauty and not the beast. Um, one disadvantage is that uh, we only produce static pictures. And one of the advantages of this maybe new technique, the optical coherence uh, tomography or OCT, is that uh, we have both. We um, can assess motions and vibration patterns and therefore we have non-static pictures, but we have pictures as well. So um, it's a technique which uses uh, laser light and thereby creates pictures in terms of, uh, you know, from uh, ultrasound in terms of B scan and A scan. So we have information not only about uh, about the, the, the point where you measure, but also about oscillation. And this helps us to uh, 
have an overlay of information. And this really nicely complements the uh, established methods of middle ear diagnostic, which we use in daily clinical routine, like autoscopy, uh, of course, the uh, functional assessments in terms of hearing, uh, pure tone audiometry, and other uh, audiometric measurements. Uh, and also, as we've heard uh, previously, of uh, imaging techniques like CT, MRI. Um, the advantage of the optical coherence tomography is that um, since we have also uh, non-static but uh, functional pictures, uh, we are able to detect uh, the vibration patterns of the tympanic membrane and thereby by make a uh, statement on what happens within the tympanic membrane and what happens behind the tympanic membrane. And we hope that we are able in the future to make differentiations between or make uh, assessments regarding contactive hearing loss and between uh, uh, otitis media with effusion, whether we have an acute bacterial inflammation, uh, especially if the uh, tympanic membrane is not uh, translucent. The technique is uh, pretty simple. Um, when, uh, when, when, when you look uh, at, at the, at the it, it's, it's, uh, it's not that simple um, because we need a picture. Therefore, we use an endoscopic technique, as you can see here. So um, this looks kind of rude, but uh, uh, in the hands of experienced examiners, uh, it's not. So we have the endoscope, which is, into, uh, which is put into the outer ear canal of the patient. And we have then an endoscopic view of the tympanic membrane, which can be reconstructed out of the information. And the very nice thing is that we have an overlay of information regarding vibration patterns. And this uh, is at the moment not clinical routine, but um, we, uh, we are working on it. Um, and as you can see, so this, uh, you remember the, the, the pictures and the vibration patterns we have seen in the, in the first less, uh, lectures this morning. These were very, um, very elaborate measurements with laser Doppler vibrometry, and you have to go into a lab and stuff like that. But this is something you can really do in vivo. And this is the um, physiologic vibration pattern of a healthy tympanic membrane. And you can see how the vibration of the tympanic membrane changes its pattern uh, in respect to the frequency uh, of excitation. And the higher the frequency gets, the more diffuse the vibration patterns goes through the tympanic membrane and uh, uh, overlays the vibration patterns in a low frequency, which are aiming more or uh, mimicking more like an inward and outward movement. So this is the physiologic movement of the tympanic membrane. And of course, we want to see if we are able to um, make any statements on what's behind the tympanic membrane. And the answer is yes. So for example, here we have a, a middle ear fusion. In this case, you can make the diagnosis up on the autoscopy, of course, but you can also see that the vibration patterns changed of the tympanic membrane and especially regarding the amplitude. So because of the fluid behind the tympanic membrane, it can't move that, uh, that properly. And so the, um, the magnitude of and the amplitude of the uh, tympanic membrane pattern movement is diminished. So we are able to make detection uh, behind the tympanic membrane, see whether there's fluid or if the tympanic cavity is gas filled. Um, then, of course, we are interested, and this is something um, I think the technology has to uh, be further investigated, whether we are able to distinguish between different patho uh, pathologies, between cholesteatoma tissue uh, or simple retractions, but you can see it's very promising to see the reconstruction of the, uh, of the, uh, um, of the pictures. And, uh, uh, in combination with uh, vibration patterns, you would see that remnants of the tympanic membrane are still moving, whereas other parts are not. Um, uh, and, um, and this is uh, at the moment preliminary data, we are um, able to distinguish very nicely uh, through openings or defects of the tympanic membrane, membrane, the remnants of the ossicular chain. And when it comes to reconstruction, some would, uh, one would wonder why we have remaining air bone gaps. So maybe, so in this case, the overlay uh, of cartilage on the prosthesis head plate was not that sufficient, um, but uh, 
um, when we have a look at a reconstruction of a uh, CT scan, you can see the um, head plate of the prosthesis underneath the uh, tympanic membrane and um, also how the tympanic uh, membrane vibrates, especially, especially also here in the area where the prosthesis head plate is coupled. And the interesting thing is that um, if you do some calculations, you could see that the reduction of the vibration of the head plate is in good keeping and in correspondence with the vibration, uh, with the frequency loss in the um, mid frequencies. Okay, so now I. Yeah. Um, yeah, so summing up, I think OCT is not uh, widespread uh, clinical routine yet, but it can. Uh, get there because it's very promising. We have high resolution um, uh, diagnostics of the tympanic membrane and some middle ear structures which are behind the tympanic membrane. We can visualize and see morphologic alterations and we have the function, uh, the, the functional aspect as well. So we can make statements on the vibration patterns and the examination time is really short uh, and we don't have any radiation exposure uh, compared to x-ray and therefore um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a very nice thing because it combines morphologic and functional, uh, functional assessment of the middle ear. Thanks. So, Marcus, thank you so much. Uh, it's, a, it's a few to the future, I think, because this device is not commercially available yet, but we hope that we can find a company who will uh, develop with us uh, industrial project. Uh, I think it's very important for the detection and future of the um, of the uh, airborne gaps. So, um, once there is no question, we'd like to move to the next presentation of Mark Snyder. It's about quality management. We know that um, it's not only important to make the surgery, it's also important to control these patients and to have uh, um, an idea about the, da uh, the data you produce with this and um, it um, plays uh, in the field of uh, quality management and uh, there was a lot of developments in the last years worldwide to this and I'd like to please you to come up to the topic. Yeah. So I don't know if uh, Mr. Mertens should give me the right to share the screen because since I stopped it. Um, you should be able to. We didn't. Yeah. Check. Okay. Thailand. Yeah. I think you can see it now. Okay, talking about quality assessment uh, and quality assurance in middle ear surgery, it uh, comes that uh, to the attempt that we would like to measure the ear. And uh, we have a lot of um, outcomes, classification, indices, staging, uh, and stuff like that. And the question is, uh, do we need them? I think we all agree that we do. The question then would be why and how do we do this? And this is a discussion which is ongoing, maybe since uh, the first attempts on Middle East surgery have been made, uh, because it's all about like uh, all about this uh, description of pathologies and procedures. We want to classify diseases, especially if we want to compare patients and the outcomes and the results, and we want to stage uh, uh, diseases. Uh, especially in terms of prognostication and when it comes to counsel our patients. And uh, the, the, the key step in all this is that we have to make operationalisierung. Opera, um, so we have to make diseases measurable. It's a very complicated word, sorry. Um, but the key message is how can we measure and make diseases and especially symptoms measurable? Um, for that, doing so, we need uh, special um, special requirements. We have to define parameters, and not only the type of parameters, but also the timing. When do we assess the parameters, and how do we describe them? We have to make definitions, and we have to use uniform definitions, and not all different kinds of uh, definitions. And we have to have a uniform nomenclature so that we all describe the same aspects in the same way and that we are know what we are talking about. And then very 
um, crucial part is commitment, commitment by ourselves, by everybody who's listening to this, uh, to this uh, course and is participating. Um, this only lives when we use uh, the systems and the classifications that we have, otherwise uh, it's not going to work. And of course, when it comes to big data, um, then we would need technical assistance. Um, the thing is that when we're talking about middle ear reconstruction, then we're talking about a very, very tiny area in, the, uh, in our head uh, of the middle ear cavity and the ossicles. But uh, describing what happens here is only an intraoperative assessment, which makes, uh, gives us information about the middle ear. We have classifications and standards uh, to describe this and uh, um, check uh, cartridges here and, and the defect classification of Austin cartridges is uh, uh, probably, not probably, but is worldwide the most used and uh, 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 most used classification to describe a defect. And uh, especially since we're from Germany, the Wolstein classification for the reconstruction of the middle ear is also very well known, but it also, it only makes uh, informative gives information about the middle ear and its reconstruction. And if you want to have a further, further aspects, if we want to include them, then we have to uh, include special information about the history and clinical findings uh, to make a, uh, to give information about the, the disease. And uh, if we want to overall assess the whole patient, then we have to ask him how is he impaired uh, uh, in terms of his quality of life by the disease. Uh, and if we want to talk with others about our results, then we have to report our data and assess uh, several patients within a study. And of course, if we want to create evidence, then we have to combine and pool different uh, studies to create evidence. And therefore we have to be pretty clear uh, how we report on what, and that's very, very important. So surgery, time, time of surgery is only one specific uh, flashlight moment in the in the whole history of a patient and what we do as surgeons. So we have something before we heard about imaging, audiology, but we have aspects of quality of life. And we have indices which include information about the preoperative findings like the Mary, like the OOPS, like the SPIKE criteria, which kind of combine these information and mix it together with the surgery information to make a prognostication of the outcome. And of course, afterwards we can assess the same parameters and make a comparison if there's any improvement or not. The most important publication regarding this was in already in 1995 uh, of, because it was the first, um, the, the, the first uh, con convention on, um, on, on describing uh, uh, um, hearing outcome in Ossicoloplasty and middle ear uh, studies, and it's from the American uh, Academy of Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery, and it was from 1995. And the parameters were set; they were very clearly defined. And the the the, the idea was to make a very very uh, low level uh, low level um, uh, applicable uh, parameter setting. The problem is that when you look into into the, the, the publication since 1995 uh, until now and in 2017 we did a retrospective study and showed about the application of these parameters in the autologic um, um, literature the results were kind of um, yeah not that promising because just focusing on the on a parameter like the description of the air bone gap, preoperative, postoperative, and closure, which are three parameters that, according to the AAO, um, AAO um, ORL uh, convention, should be stated. We have thirty one percent of all the studies, and we. Uh, looked on more than 160 studies. So in 31%, we don't have any statement on that. Uh, and also the, the, the postoperative bone gap wasn't stated in 27% of the, of, the, um, of the studies. And this was not an effect by the impact factor of the journal. So as I said in the beginning, commitment is a very important thing. Uh, so when we report studies, then please use um, uh, use definitions and report in a in a scientific way. Um, classifications are well known. I already mentioned them. Wolstein as a reconstruction uh, classification and the combination of Austin and Kartusch 
as a defect uh, classification. We have others which are very well or not that well known. But the thing is, uh, two years ago, we had a very, very powerful classification which came up, which is the Sami or Artu, and it's from the uh, Autologi International Autologic Outcome Group. And the very interesting thing is that this was a consensus statement which was made up on a Delphi process. And this, uh, the, the very nice thing is that it describes the classification of the timber nomastoid surgery. And it's um, talking about nomenclature and definition. It helps us to describe what we did by having little pictures uh, where a surgeon can identify the, the, the status of what he did. And there's no doubt about uh, whether uh, I had uh, cannibal up, cannibal down, if I removed the, the, the attic or not. So this is very nicely um, uh, recorded and depicted here. And also when it comes to the reconstruction, um, we have the same sort of pictures uh, where you can see what kind of reconstruction um, one did. And for example, if you do a tympanopolisty type 3A, um, that would be a OSM, like you see here, if you couple to a to, to the malleus remnant. Um, and if not, if you then there, there's a differentiation. As you can see, this is not really differentiated by the uh, by the Wilstein classification, but it will be with the Sameyato. So this is, um, as we think, a very powerful classification which should be used uh, in the future. And last but not least, um, talking about quality also implies that we face our fears and that we have to talk about um, the not so nice events and uh, maybe about complications and failure to cure. And um, to do this, it's very time consuming and it's, uh, it's, 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 it's a great effort to do so. But we implemented here in our clinic a complication register registry where we kind of register every patient that undergoes uh, middle ear surgery. And when, so for example, this is focusing only on one complication, which is a, a bone conduction threshold uh, reduction after surgery uh, at a certain level. And you can see that uh, after four, 540 middle ear surgeries, we had 13% of patients which were suffering on a temporary or permanent reduction of the, of the threshold. But this is a very important thing. Is it permanent or not? And if you, if you follow up all the patients, all these 96 patients, you will see that the number of patients having this uh, reduction over time goes down and down and down until day 135. So after 100, 135 days, the number of patients suffering from this initial complication will not change anymore. And this is a very, very important point because um, that means that if we're talking about complications and bone conduction threshold shifts after surgery, we have to have at least half a year follow-up of the patients. Otherwise, our data are not valid. And if we only report this data after half a year, we kind of not talking about the number of patients who are initially suffering from that. So this kind of kinetic aspect have to be, has to be reported if we really want to talk about quality aspects. And coming back and summing up, so yeah, we have to find parameters in terms of type and timing of, of uh, assessment. We have uniform definitions and nomenclatures, and we have technical assistance. And I think uh, Jack Hartrich will talk about that this afternoon furthermore. So I think, and I leave the interpretation up to you, the only thing that we might improve is our commitment of using them. Thanks. Thank you, Marcus, for your very nice presentation to improve our quality and uh, this starts with uh, classification. And so I would like to encourage you to use classification for uh, your surgery. So we have now some uh, minutes for discussion, for a panel discussion, and I'd like to um, pick up some questions from the audience. Uh, one question was coming uh, to Professor Hittenbrink. Um, the question is, how do birds compensate atmospheric pressure? I think it's easy. Yes. To answer. Can I talk? Yeah. Yes. So yes. very simple. <clears throat> if you see me, 
the columella in birds is never straight, but it's always a little bit tilted. For example, in hens, it's 30 degrees. That means if the atmospheric pressure variation comes, it just tilts like this. And especially we have a little joint between the columella and the extra columella, which is a cartilaginous structure which contacts the tympanic membrane. That means we have a sort of rudimentary joints already in the birds, not the two good hyaline cartilage joints like in uh, um, mammals, but there is also a joint surface in there which also tilts so that, for example, the falcon, when it dives down, which, has, which makes a lot of atmospheric pressure uh, changes, is also protected the inner ear. So birds, the nature evolution has also respected these problems of uh, atmospheric pressure variations in the bird's ears. Yes. Okay, another question is uh, to Cesar Osh. Cesar, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yes. Morning. Yes. The question is, uh, do we need um, a CD scan in every um, case of middle ear reconstruction? Do you prefer it in every well, case or not? Or do you feel better when it's possible? To be done? honest, we have in the routine of doing it. But sometimes, in, in few cases, the information about the CT scan you know, is not indispensable. If you have a good otoscopy, you know, you, you have a problem. Imagine a, a, a necrosis of the long process of the incus that you can check with the otoscopy. The ear drum is normal. Maybe in this case, it's not indispensable. But in most of the cases, uh, the information have value. If you, it's a first surgery with a cholecytoma, it's indispensable. If it's only a, a retraction pocket with, with control of the image, maybe it's not indispensable. But we ask from routine, because it's better to have one than not have it. Okay. Um, there is another question. Continue your CD scan. Um, I think CD scan is not suitable to control patients after cholesterol surgery because you have your artifacts coming from the surgery and so it's not suitable, except if you made controls, um, um, several controls after surgery, I think. Do you agree? Yeah. Uh, I think your presentation has been very nice because now things have changed. 50 years ago, we, per we perform a, a closed technique, a channel up technique. We do a, a CT scan uh, in the three months post-op and we follow and the changes in the occupation that's been, that could be a cholesteatoma, but now the protocol have changed and we ask uh, uh, MRMI. So for following to, if you want to know, want to rule out uh, cholesteatoma racism, another time a second cholesteatoma is better, you ask for, a, for MRI. Okay. Um, so another question was, um, is if uh, it's the same direction that's uh, concerning the MRI. The MRI is, uh, was the question, is necessary in every case of cholesteatoma? The answer is not. If you know, if you see that the cholesteatoma CD scan is better to, uh, for the imaging of the bone, and then you have your landmarks, and then you can see if there's erosion of the semicircular cover and so on. So MRI is suitable to control after surgery, but you need also a series of MRI scans. It's not some, it's, uh, in the most cases, not um, possible to control it with one MRI. Another question was, um, how long to wait for second surgery? I would give it to the surgeons now, this question. When, when do you perform second surgery, Cesar? You refer second functional time. Do do do. Do you ask me at that? How long you wait? How long yeah. you wait after the first surgery with second look? At, at least six months. Six months. As okay. Uh, Alex, can you hear me? Alex, or is there anybody else who's? On I hear you. I hear you. I just had to uh, activate the microphone. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Please all activate the microphones. And the question is how long you wait for a second look surgery after cholesterol surgery? 
Also, I use six months. Um, the reason is, of course, that we need to wait until the scar tissue has built up and um, everything is uh, in, a, in a relatively um, stable state before we start to do something else. Okay. How is it in Great Britain? Um, so I don't, do, I don't do second look surgery. You prefer MRI? So I only do MRI. I never do second look surgery. I do primary obliteration and I follow with MRI scanning. Um, so I only go back if I see something on MRI, but I do a primary obliteration there. Oh, so you trust uh, extremely easy MRI diagnostics? Yeah. 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 I have a comment on that. May yeah. I have a comment on that? Do you also do this if you have, if you're not sure, for example, if there are still some cells left between the tapis crura, that means the cholesteratoma residue will grow tapestry line like this which you will not detect on MRI, but it might destroy the crura. That means the good hearing will be destroyed afterwards. Whereas if you look into this ear after six months, you will see perhaps a little cholesteratoma lining, and then you can lift it out without destroying the chain. So MRI is only good if you have pearls, but not if it's tapestry. And we know that cholesteratoma sometimes grows like a tapestry, like a lining in the ear, which will not be detected. But the surgeon, so, so this, my, my, my suggestion is to do it individually. The surgeon decides where is the problem, where it might be the problematic danger, the risk, and then he decides, will we go on with MRI or will we go in perhaps better by looking into it because huh, lifting it up before risks occur might be better. That is my proposal. Okay. Is there anybody else who use only MRI for cholesteratoma control? Instead of uh, second look surgery of the surgeons? No, so uh, Chris, you are in, in the future. Yeah, I think, I think because I'm obliterating all of my cases now, you can't really do second look apart from as uh, Carl says about looking in the middle ear. And I completely agree if I was really, really suspicious, I may well do that. But in practice, I hardly I have to say, I hardly ever do that. Yeah, the problem is we have a resolution around two millimeter of MRI and but a cholesteratoma of two millimeter or three millimeter could destroy the chain before you it, detect it. It could it. do that, but I mean, from a practical point of view, if it does do that, I could reconstruct it anyway. So, you know, you're subjecting your patients to lots of surgeries. You know, if, if everybody has a second look or nobody has a second look, that is a massive difference in terms of resources. And if you look at it more pragmatically and say, well, I'm doing my scans. And of course, if I'm suspicious and I think there's a problem here and the hearing's going off, then, then we'll, you know, would look. So if I have a patient and the ear looks fine and the scan's normal, but the hearing's deteriorating, I may well look in the middle ear. But I'm not looking in the mastoid because I've already obliterated the mastoid. So there's nothing really to look into. Okay. So my question is, uh, we have seen these publications um, how long we can get a recurrent uh, cholesteratoma. And it takes uh, sometimes 15 years, 20 years. How often do you repeat your MI every year? Or what is, the, what is your plan? So, so for me, what I do is I scan them at one year, five years, and sometimes at three if I'm concerned. I discharge them at five years if everything looks great. If it doesn't, I don't. I keep them on the books. And I mean, I completely accept they may get recurrence at 15 years. But again, I come back that if you follow all of your patients up for life, you have very, very full clinics. Whereas if you say to them, look, the ear looks great. Your hearing's good. It's clean and dry. You've got a normal scan at five years. Come back if you have a problem. I think from a pragmatic dealing with your patients day to day and actually how you physically run busy clinics, that seems to be a reasonable Compromise. Okay. Carl Rand. Your mic, your mic, please. Your microphone. Chris, you're completely right because we must differentiate between residual and recurrent. The recurrent will be a retraction pocket. This you can see from the outside. And then if you discover something suspiciously, then you will do a recurrent. Whereas a residual pearl be behind uh, an, an obliteration, this will not grow after 10, start growing after 10 years. That will start in the first and third year and so on. So you're completely right. Indi inter individualize the, the proposal. Yes. 
So we have no standard now um, in, in which um, uh, distance we had to control the people with MRI. Um, but maybe in future we should uh, develop a standard also in this uh, because of the insurance controls and uh, because of the, the lawyers we uh, could get become in, in conflict. Once we, do, once we do not a control with MRI in future, maybe. So uh, everybody's agree with this uh, topic. So I would change to the next topic is um, tympanic membrane reconstruction. And we comes now um, to the first video session, but before I'd like to introduce this topic again with some um, respects to the mechanics. Um, I'd like to share my screen and please stop again um, your mics. Is this my screen? No. <laughs> Sorry. Can you see my screen now? Yeah. In my presentation? Yes? Uh, not yet. Oh. Okay. Yeah, we can see it. Yeah. Okay. So I'd like to uh, speak about uh, how to reconstruct the tympanic membrane. And we have different materials, you know, fascia, Bergeron cartilage. Um, I think the main technique is the underlay technique. And uh, we have also alternative techniques, uh, the push through techniques, fat, that's the inlay technique, butterfly technique. We want to speak about this. Um, and all those results are influenced by the mucosa and the ventilation because the membrane is only free. Uh, we have only a free vibration of the membrane when on both sides is air. So these are the techniques, uh, the underlay technique. You know, you develop a flap and underneath it with uh, our transplant. You could also use cartilage in different manners. You know, the old palisade technique, and then we have also these petal techniques in different layer thicknesses. And uh, this comes to the topic how is the material influence vibration mode. We did a lot of experiments about this because if we have a, a thick piece of a thick piece of cartilage, we have a good withstand against atmospheric pressure, but we have also a high reflection of sun. And a thin piece of cartilage, thin layer, we have not a good withstand, uh, but a good vibration of sound. So we should find the compromise, and this is what we investigated in uh, laser Doppler biometrometry, and you see here the vibration of the membrane over the frequencies and the displacement um, during pure tones of uh, 700 hertz in this space that is cartilage 250, that is the tumoring membrane with a resonance here at 800 hertz, and then falls down. And once you look to the cartilage, then thinner the cartilage is, and more it vibrates like the tumor membrane. Um, there's a cut of around 300 um, micrometer thickness, and then thicker we have a damping of our vibration. The thickness influences the vibration pattern of the membrane, and it influences also the stability. So if um, we need, uh, we have fascia perichantrum, perichantrum, we think that it's similar to the tumoring membrane in point of acoustic uh, vibrations. Stability is less than the normal membrane. In cartilage, we have the similar lateral mechanics in point of stability, but uh, the acoustic quality depends from the thickness and from the reconstruction technique. What is the consequence? Once we have a normal ventilated middle ear, we could use fascia and perichondrium. I prefer more perichondrium because we have no, not so much retractions. 
But if we have ventilation problems, we should use cartilage. We use cartilage foils. We cut it down with a cartilage slicer from uh, the Cox company, and then we can reconstruct in different layers um, um, our demonic membrane. It is uh, in these cases of up here the stabis and the prosthesis, and the cartilage thickness can influence the vibration of the prosthesis depending from the thickness of the cartilage. Because once the cartilage lays on the facial ridge and also at the prosthesis, we have a mechanical bridge and the damping. So in this case, we should use an island or we should use a thin piece of cartilage. It can be demonstrated here in the temporal bowel measurements. We have a cartilage island in the posterior part of the membrane. And it is 300 micrometer in thickness in this, and it's 700 in this. And once you have here your prosthesis behind this cartilage and it's overlaying at the bone, you get a damping of your reconstruction. So take care of it. Another question is where we should couple our uh, prosthesis to the membrane. And I want to show you a laser Doppler um, experiment uh, in temporal bones. We give sound to the external camera and we measure the sound transmission pick, uh, is picked up by the laser and listen to the frequencies. Uh, we move from the malleus to the middle of the membrane and then to the rim of the membrane. And what we can listen is that we have here uh, uh, not so loud vibrations, and we have a large vibration here and a small vibration here. Um, the laser can only, only measure the displacements, not the power. So it's not real the nature. Uh, it also is the nature in the surgery, but we have much more vibrations here in the middle of the membrane as at the malleus or at the remnant. And the message is don't couple your prosthesis at the rim of the membrane. We have otherwise no deep frequencies. Malleus coupling is another topic because we have here not only to regard the displacement, we have also to regard the power. And we have much more power at the malleus in the higher frequencies. I come back to this topic um, in the next. So um, I think uh, now I'd like to start with uh, the presentation of the first um, videos. I'd like to stop here and I want to please um, Robert Vincent, he wanted to be the first in this video session because of uh, his time uh, schedule, but I cannot see him. Is he in the uh, in the speaker's room now? Robert Vincent, no? So I'd like to be the next speaker and it's Carl Bernd Hüttenbrink. Could you present some Surgery videos, how about? Yes, I'd like to wait. Yes, so the first video is just showing how to harvest cartilage. One idea from the posterior auricular from the conchae, you put your finger into the carbon conchae. This will protect from cutting through the skin anteriorly because you're very cautious when you cut into the direction of your finger. And then you lift up the cartilage, you can cut it out, it's just a fraction in just a few seconds, not much longer than taking fascia. So harvesting cartilage is a very simple thing. If you have a cartilage cutter, the quartz cutter, then you put it in there and you can make from one, the normal cartilage is around one millimeter thick. You can cut it into different, several thicknesses. You could cut it and cut 20 times. I always tell my young doctors 20 times toe and throw because never pressing it down because otherwise you will have a bended cartilage, but this is one part, one side there from the original, and this is another piece. 
and you can put several pieces of cartilage in between. Another one, then you take a little sizer, 0.2 in there, put the cartilage back again and cut it and you get another piece of cartilage, a slice, a plate, thinner plate, several times pay attention to your, where is my finger? Pay attention to your finger, not to cut into your finger, which happened already. And suddenly it's so blood stained. It's not, you cannot use the cartilage anymore, of course. And then you take off and you see the next slide. And it must be very thin. Cartilage can be cut very thin that you can see your instrument through. So this is also a slice of cartilage. You will, and then from one piece, you can get several slices. Another technique is the um, is, um, is, is slicing in the original, in the concha already, like this. I saw, learned this from Dr. Magun in Algeria, who didn't want to use the cartilage cutter. And you can get fine little thin slices of cartilage just by pressing your finger back there. What to do? We saw this already in the video by Thomas Sanat. Take cartilage, place it there, and then you can work on it. You can look at the different parts of the cartilage and look if it is well, this is the right ear, and another one which fits better. And then finally, you get a good one. You see how thin it is. And then you can even cut pieces from the cartilage and you can use the trimmed cartilage there to cover, for example, the attic wall and to cover thin gaps between the cartilage slices and then put it there. And another one where I was lucky to have uh, the mallias there and there you see the little hole in there in the cartilage. And this is where I had preformed it to put the short, incus, short malleus process in there so that it's even stabilized. There's the prosthesis, you can put it on top of the prosthesis and this will not dislodge and the little malleus uh, handle will be there. One question was how to this, the, the cartilage slices are good for the posterior part where the bony wall is nearly in flush, flush with the, with the um, membrane. But what to do in the anterior part where you have this vertical, vertical 90 degrees anterior um, uh, external ear canal wall. So you can use another technique which we did since uh, many years already, anterior stabilization. And we often have cartilage with pieces of um, uh, perichondrum still attached. So you make an anterior tympanotomy here, which we always do to look into the tympanic, uh, to the um, tubal orifice. And we pull through, pull out the perichondrium, and then we can fix this piece of cartilage anteriorly here against the wall of the lateral attic wall. And here down it rests on the bony uh, floor. And here you see, this is the video. This was, for example, if you just place your cartilage here, it will fall down. So you lift up and uh, you lift up until the, uh, the you lift up the, the external ear canal until you reach our interior, anterior of the fur. There is the anterior tympanotomy. Here you see the malleus. You test the ossicular chain, it's intact, it's moving. And important is in front of the malleus handle, malleus neck, you go into the uh, tubal or in, into the um, cavity. We always place our little um, celestic sheeting, 100 micrometers thin, uh, thickness like the tympanic membrane to prevent any adhesion between the promontory and the, uh, and the material. And there we have our material. It is a piece of cartilage and attached, now dried a little bit perichondrum. We put the perichondrum in there and now watch this we place on the floor here. And now look here, here through the anterior tympanotomy, we can pull out the perichondrium, fix it to, against the bone, replace the material, the, the cartilage down here, which is well fixed, well stabilized now, and it will not be able, it cannot fall down anymore because it's stabilized up here. And here you see how good it contacts and there is a good stabilization. And that's all, we can fix it now, we can stop the video. Thank you. No. Okay. Well, thank you, Karl Brandt. There was this very nice and instructive uh, video about all the cartilage cutting. And um, I think we want to continue with uh, the alphabet, except if, uh, if Robert Vincent is in, but I don't know. 
Another question was if the loudness is enough for the audience. Uh, there was one uh, critic here that the volume of the speaker is not loud enough or difficult to hear. Um, my impression is it's not, but maybe of uh, Matthias Mertens, you can manage it. So. Actually, his volume is pretty low. Well. OK, good. Thank you. So um, from the alphabet comes now Jan Christoph Lewis from Cologne. OK, um, let's see where I find my video. There you go. That's not the correct one, actually. Just a second. I think I need to switch to another um, video screen because this one doesn't work. Sorry. Um, so there we go. Um, so now it's about uh, perichondrium, uh, and you will recognize some uh, rep uh, repetitive elements, uh, repetitions uh, to the talk of Professor Hüttenbrink, which is no wonder because he has been my medical and surgical teacher for a couple of years here in Cologne. And so we use kind of the same techniques and have the same opinions on, on perichondrium, on cartilage, when to use what. Um, so when and how to get uh, perichondrium, first of all, when to use it, um, uh, well, uh, all these times when you have retractions uh, in college teratomas, um, uh, adhesive processes, then we would opt for uh, cartilage, which is just uh, uh, better and stiffer and more stable than perichondrum. But otherwise, if you have, for example, traumatic defects, uh, a well aerated middle ears, then uh, perichondrium only will uh, suit your um, tympanic membrane um, better. So how to get it? There's, there are basically like three um, ideas or three options to get perichondrum from the uh, carbon cartilage as you see here. First of all, you might just leave in the, um, the cartilage and try to just grab the perichondrum from here. Um, in my opinion, when you cut through it in first uh, uh, instant, then you often just cut a little bit also to the, uh, into the uh, cartilage, which is not a problem. Of course, um, it, it does not heal, but also, um, it will not cause any problems to the patient. And then you use uh, some fine um, delicate um, instruments to, um, to separate the perichondrium and the cartilage. And uh, of course it works, but uh, it, it just takes some time. Um, and as Professor Utenberg just said, harvesting fascia and cartilage is very fast, but this just takes some time. Also what you uh, can do, so second technique is you take it together with your cartilage, obviously. So take out your cartilage and remove the perichondrum attached to both sides, uh, like this, um, holding it with a certain um, uh, cartilage forceps, which is not, which has no sharp um, um, edges at its front, and then you remove your perichondrum. This also works well, but it also takes some time depending on the size of your uh, cartilage. Um, you use this, uh, or you remove the cartilage together with the perichondrum and separate it from each other when you use both variants. For example, if you have a situation where you must reconstruct the posterior canal wall or the attic wall, but also your tympanic membrane in case of a well aerated middle ear, and then you will use perichondrum and cartilage. And third version is just what you just saw, the cartilage cutter um, by the Kurtz company, which uh, I um, literally use in any type of tympanoplasty actually. Um, and also this instrument is, uh, this tool is actually very capable of um, separating cartilage and um, perichondrum. And it actually uh, uh, goes more or less by, by, by accident because uh, uh, so just when you normally, in, in many cases, when you just do your very first slide, uh, then you uh, um, very often you just separate cartilage from uh, perichondrum. You will see it in, in this video here. It's a very small piece of uh, cartilage and, and uh, perihon taken from the tragus uh, cartilage actually, but here you see, I just went through the 
uh, through the original cartilage. And just by chance, I got the peritoneum. It's not by chance. It, it will happen in about 80% of the times in, in my experience that the first slide just separates you, the peritoneum, and you can really use this. And it's, it's not destroyed by any means. And then later on, as you just saw in the other video, you might continue with your um, cartilage slicing. And often, you will end up with pieces of, of, uh, of mixed uh, com uh, composure, so meaning peritoneum and uh, cartilage, which obviously you might also use uh, for your tympanic membrane reconstruction. And you already saw these distance plates, which you need to put in there. And then um, what you need to do is um, you need to really fix these, because otherwise, if it's moving the cartilage, uh, your graft inside the, uh, the, um, the slice, the cutter, then um, you will not have a very nice um, and symmetric um, separation of the pieces. So that's how to harvest uh, perichondrium and, and cartilage. And now let's see what we can do with it. And once again, you will see something you've seen more or less before. I've also chosen a defect in the anterior part uh, because this actually, I mean, obviously, if you have a, a cholesteatoma here and, and a big defect, you will also might want to use some cartilage uh, attached with uh, some perichondrium because perichondrium, you will always need to use this pull through technique, which you will also see right now, but for this uh, defect here, and you see the middle ear appears quite irrated, actually. Uh, it doesn't, it's, it's not a cholesteatoma um, a defect, it's a, tra um, a traumatic defect, actually. And so this is ideal for using uh, perichondrium. First of all, what you need to do uh, to, uh, and you just saw it in the, um, in the theoretic, in the, in the graphics. Um, so you need to remove the skin at the anterior um, wall of your uh, outer ear canal by this U of uh, Y-shaped um, tympanomiatal um, flap. And then you do your anterior tympanotomy and do it wide uh, to the anterior edge. Uh, I would say, so if this is, if this, uh, the short process is like 12 o'clock, then you go up to two or maybe even three o'clock. You just need some little attachment of the limb, uh, the, the anterior limb to the, um, to the bone. And um, you you open up your your uh, scenario. You you expose um, um, the uh, the area. Then I always, especially in these cases, I always also use these um, uh, silicic sheeting because, especially in the anterior area, when then your cartilage or your peritoneum falls down, it uh, also will obviously obstruct and block uh, parts of your tubal entrance and orifice. And so here you can see the foil nicely moving inside um, the, um, the perforation. And then you have your uh, perichondrium, which you um, slide in from, from the inferior um, area. In the underlay technique, uh, you push it through the perforation, and then it ends up at your anterior tympanotomy, and then you lose a, uh, use a small hook, which is really the best instrument. Otherwise, I never really succeed. So th with this hook, you can really nicely uh, arrange this peritoneum in all its angles. Uh, make always sure to have at least two borders where you really stabilize the peritoneum, at least at the bottom. So you actually really need, need a big uh, um, um, piece of peritoneum. So at least at the uh, lower inferior border, the floor of the outer ear canal, and here, uh, as I said, the most important um, area where you need to um, stabilize your graft on is this anterior area right here. Because if you don't, you will you might end up just with the um, uh, uh, recurrent perforation at the anterior edge of your perichondrium um, graft. And yeah, afterwards you have the normal wound closure, where we also use um, some uh, celastic foils and, and sheeting of the tympanic membrane, uh, which I think you will see uh, a couple of times today, how to close up the ear later on. So that would be it for the time being. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Christoph. I think uh, we could discuss it at the end of the presentations because we now contact different topics and techniques. So I'd like to please check to present uh, your video about uh, membrane reconstruction in overlay underlay technique. Thank you.
And the next is then after you um, is uh, Daniel Marcioni. Does my screen show now? Yes. Yes. Very good. Tomas Matias, thank you very much for asking me to discuss over under tympanoplasty. This is a technique we developed 30 years ago. We found it both simple and surprisingly effective. Details can be found in our laryngoscope publication from 2002. There are many different types and sizes of perforations. So having an eclectic approach can be a benefit versus always depending on one technique. Certainly medial tympanoplasty is the simplest method, which works perfectly well for posterior perforations. Its success rate, however, for total and anterior perforations is not as high. Lateral tympanoplasty works well for all size perforations but is more complex, takes longer to perform, and engenders the risk of anterior blunting and lateralization. It was our goal, therefore, to find a technique with the advantages but not disadvantages of lateral tympanoplasty, which led to the over-under method. <clears throat> Here, the graft is placed medial to everything except the malleus handle, where instead it is lateral. This makes the malleus an asset rather than a liability. In other words, it avoids medial collapse of the graft onto the promontory while completely preventing the possibility of anterior blunting. So let's look at some photo highlights before going to video. Begin as usual by de-epithelializing the edges, but then completely separating the drum from the malleus. A few pieces of gel foam are placed in the middle ear and then the graft is speared at its anterior tip in order to place it in position in one move over the malleus and under any residual drum. The flap is then replaced. So now onto the video. Here the epithelium is elevated from the malleus handle using a sharp instrument such as the curved Rosen needle. <clears throat> If the acicular chain is intact, I use a laser to remove the final very adherent fibers at the umbo to minimize vi vibrational trauma. <clears throat> a key side benefit of this method is that the anterior protympanum is maximally visualized every time. It is surprising how often one might find adhesions, granulation tissue, or cholesteatoma that would have otherwise gone undetected. A small amount of gel foam is now placed in the middle ear. And then fascia is impaled on a pick and placed in one move over the malleus and under any remaining drum. Precise graft position is confirmed by elevating and then replacing the tympanomietal flap, unfurling any residual epithelium. And then the outer gel foam is placed beginning at the anterior sulcus. Over the decades, the technique has proven highly successful without a single incident of anterior blunting or lateralization. I recommend it to you highly. And in the next session, we'll talk about the impact of over under tympanoplasty on a secular chain reconstruction. Thank you. So oh, thank you, Jack, for an excellent presentation. And um, we want to discuss it also in the panel discussion, um, but we continue want to continue with Daniel Marchioni with his endoscopic technique now. Please, um, Daniel. Can hello, you... hello, good morning. Good morning. I'm trying to share uh, my, my screen just now. Okay. We can see it. Okay. So, uh, hello. So, regarding the endoscopic uh, technique uh, for a tympanoplastic type one, it's really important uh, to to see 
uh, some condition. The first is uh, the, the situation of the external auditory canal, especially at the beginning, it's very important uh, to choose uh, the right patient with the wide canal. And uh, after when uh, you, uh, you reach the skill, you can manage as you please in every kind of canal. And uh, in endoscopic approaches, uh, it's really important to say that only underlay technique is the most important technique. It's really difficult to perform overlay. And also the condition on the milder ear cavity, in my opinion, is really important to check inside and the eustachian tube function and the position and the size of the perforation is also crucial. So we can start with this uh, uh, case and you can see a uh, um, perforation in the eardrum, but uh, the uh, here look dry. So we can start with the injection of the external auditory canal. Uh, it's really standard technique. We are use a cotonoid just in order to elevate uh, the flap until uh, the annulus. And uh, you have to reach the annulus and after with the, uh, uh, um, a cutting knife, uh, you can elevate the annulus. You can see here the... And under uh, the annulus, you can elevate the annulus and after you have to detach uh, the superior aspect of the skin. The first step is to check inside the tympanic cavity because it's really important to see uh, the color of the mucosa of the tympanic cavity and uh, the presence of granulation tissue and the ventilation pathway because always in order to avoid the failure, we have to check uh, the condition of the hismus and the ossicular chain. In this case, uh, we have to check the movement of the ossicular chain. And uh, my, I usually, I remove just a little bit of bone because improving a lot my view on the tympanic cavity, just in order to see if everything is working. And uh, we can see now uh, the includes the pedial joint. And after this, we can use uh, the, um, the um, a graft in order to uh, repair the eardrum. And in this case, when I see a patient without granulation tissue with a normal mucosal function, a second tube is working, uh, a fascia graft is the best option in order to repair the perforation in underlay technique. And uh, it's really fast uh, and uh, you can manage in a really um, fast way and you can check. When you have a condition in a different situation like this or like this, where there is a not good condition of the membrane and uh, you have to manage an uh, infect here, and the best uh, solution is to use uh, the cartilage. You have to measure the defect and after the tragal graft, uh, we can um, perform a tragal graft with an incisor just for the malleus, you have to put over the malleus. And the most important aspect is to cover also the anterior portions of the perforation with the perichondial graft in order to create the adhesion between the cartilage graft and the most anterior portions of the perforation in underlay technique. And after this, you can replace all the skin perform the ossicloplastic in this way, the, the mingoplastic. In this way, you can have the more stable uh, condition and uh, the rate of failure is uh, just a little bit less with respect to traditional technique because uh, you can put over the malleus and the cartilage and also uh, a pericondial graft over the cartilage between and under the anterior annulus can help you to have uh, the best result. Thank you very much. So Daniel, thank you very much. And uh, we are good in time and I'd like to start with the discussions um, uh, because uh, we have also some questions from the audience. And um, my first question is uh, concerning the thickness of the cartilage. Uh, some uh, colleagues uh, 
fears that uh, we get a um, resolution of the thin pieces of cartilage uh, because of inflammation and other problems. How how thick or what or what is your thinnest cartilage you use in reconstruction? And have you problems with resolution of the cartilage at the membrane? Carband? Ah, you asked me, uh, sorry. <clears throat> well, we, we saw in all these experiments uh, which we had performed in the Dresden laboratory that the thickness is not such a crucial thing. That means the thicker the cartilage, the less good it will work. But on the other hand side, if there is no other pathology, we saw, we learned, we learned also from the palisade techniques, uh, the surgeons who use palisade techniques, that even a thick cartilage will vibrate very well. But why, why transform a thin 100 micrometer thin uh, tympanic membrane into a thick one millimeter cartilage block? Nature never provided, never saw for such a thick cartilage. So if you have air in the middle ear, the thinnest cartilage is, is good, 100, 200, 300 micrometers, this will be enough. So, because if you fear that there will be no, not good aeration, not enough gas production in the middle ear after surgery, what will you expect? This was my first question to the palisade technique doctors. They, I asked them, what do you find behind your palisades? Well, and then they couldn't answer because nobody looked there. And they said, well, there's air. And they said, well, if there's air, then you don't need a one millimeter thick cartilage. A oh, 100, 200, 300 millimeter cartilage plate will be sufficient. And if there's no air, which you want to prevent with a thick cartilage, then it doesn't matter anyhow, because there will be no motor worker. The tympanic membrane will, no, will not be working. So you must be logical. If there's aeration, then a thin cartilage of 200, 300 mic micrometers will be sufficient. If there's no air, well, then you can fill the complete tympanic membrane with a thick cartilage and it will not vibrate sufficiently. So the question is, what is the status of the middle ear aeration? Okay. Um, my question is uh, to the other audience, how they use the cartilage. If you have a normal ventilated middle ear, uh, do you use uh, the thick pieces or original thickness? It means it's one millimeter thickness for the atragus or contra cartilage, or do you, is everybody cutting the cartilage? Chris, what is your technique? Hi, um, so I tend to use an island graft most of the time when I'm using cartilage. If I think it's completely normally ventilated in, it's a smallish hole, then I'll use perichondrium. I usually do a per canal approach and I'm using tragal cartilage. Um, I will, if I think the cartilage is thick, I'll tend to thin it a little bit, but I must say I don't thin it as much as the other guys. I think partly because I use the um, perichondrial island, I worry that when you use the cartilage slicer, that you end up taking the perichondrium off the island. So if I'm going to thin it, I thin it by hand. So that's what I tend to do. Okay. Um, another question is, um, it's, uh, the cartilage is in many cases a favor material, um, but we have not only this, um, these techniques we have seen now, these underlay techniques, we have seen also now with endoscopic techniques, we can see um, the uh, uh, push through technique, where the with the endoscope, a cartilage island is pushed through the uh, refreshed defect and it's uh, supported by gel form or other things. Do you have any experience with this? It would be a great um, surgery if you don't need any flap. You refresh only a sandal defect, uh, put gel form in puts the cartilage in and then waiting that it will be closed. Yeah, I have some experience with that. And I think for small defects, it's remarkably effective. And as you say, it's so quick, you just freshen the edges, put some Merigel or gel foam in the middle ear and then do an underlay. And it's much like you would do otherwise, but I think it works for well for small defects and small antero superior defects, which I think are quite tricky. Uh, I've, I've used this um, cartilage butterfly technique where you freshen you uh, go around the periphery of a cartilage disc and and slice it so that it opens up and then you almost use it like a clip you insert it almost like a grommet and I think for small antero superior uh, perforations that's a really nice technique and again very easy and if it were to fail you've lost very little
Do you have yes. anything to elevate? Another the question is to jail from uh, lead, uh, do the jail from leads to adhesions in the middle here, and can jail from retract your transplant? Or uh, we have never seen that. Daniel, do you use? Oh, sorry. Sorry. It depends. Uh, if uh, I have to reconstruct all uh, um, the problem of the gel form is especially uh, the characteristic of the mucosa of the tympanic cavity. If you have to remove the mucosa of the tympanic cavity, if you put the gel form, you can have the scar in the post-op. But if you respect the mucosa or the middle cavity, uh, it's really difficult to have a scar inside the tympanic cavity. So my, uh, my behavior is uh, I'm using gel form, especially for uh, uh, um, dry here without any problem of the mucosa. When I, I have to reconstruct all uh, uh, the eardrum using the cartilage fixing over the malleus, I needn't to put the gel form because uh, the malleus support my graft. And you use the gel form to support your transplant. That's right. Yeah, when uh, when I'm using the fascia and uh, under the malleus, uh, I think that is necessary. But uh, of course, uh, and it's really important to respect the mucosa in a simple meaning of plastic, of course. And so it's really difficult to have uh, scar and re retraction. This is the problem of the cholestatoma, not in the simple meaning of plastic, honestly. So in simple milling of plastic, you would not uh, give a recommendation for uh, to use gel form. That's right. Gel form, gel form just if you are using the fascia in the anterior aspect of the drum. Okay, how about? Yes, just uh, we have different surgeons and we have different opinions and different. We, we all have good results, no That's problem. Great. But there's uh, one basic comment I want to say. When we are otosurgeons, we look into the ear from the position where the ear lies in this way, for example. And it comes to say, my comment is also for this overlay technique on the malleus. You are afraid that it falls down onto the promontory. This is why you put a perichondrium in there. This is why you put it on the malleus handle when you do like this surgery. But imagine next day the patient will sleep like this. So there is no danger that it falls onto the promontory. And this is why I, I prefer not to put anything to the middle ear, but to stabilize it by itself. That's why I presented this anterior pull through technique to fix it like a sail on a sailing ship with a rope, that means by perichondrium, and not to put anything into the middle ear because nature had foreseen the middle ear with, filled with air and not with, uh, with um, gel foam. We must not look into the ear only at the moment of surgery, but we must imagine afterwards he stands like this or like this, and there must be a stabilization without anything filling the middle ear. This is my objective, why we or why do not use gel foam. And because I'm also afraid of, of uh, some scar tissue formation. Okay, so I think... Uh... In Switzerland is using, Alex, do you use gel form to support your transplant in under lay technique or not? Um, usually not. Uh, I also, uh, we use all, all uh, almost always we use fascia and um, uh, stabilize it the same way as Colbert has showed it before uh, with the anterior pull through and then um, fix it to the annulus inferiorly if there is an anterior perforation. And uh, there are some cases where you want to um, add some uh, gel foam, but these are really, really seldom. Okay. Um, I prepared another video to, for discussion. Um, um, I'd like to share the screen. Um, okay. Okay, we have here, once we not want to use gel form, and we have um, in the posterior part of the membrane, the defect is not a problem, I think, but in the anterior part, we have a problem to support 
our uh, transplant. And once we don't want to use gel forms, then we had to make a push through technique or, or we had to uh, skeletize the malleus. I'd like uh, to discuss this. That is the dissection of the terminal sclerotic parts. It's all the endoscopic managed. And um, then you have such a large defect and it's not possible to make an underneath technique because you have a steep angle of your uh, malleus. And the only chance is to skeletize a little bit the malleus and then to overlay this uh, uh, cartilage falls. I, I would say cartilage falls is a piece of cartilage in several manner. Uh, my question to you is, um, is it okay once you skeletize your, mal uh, your malleus, it's an umbo, uh, and for, use to, for using cartilage? Because I never saw a lateralization of cartilage. Once I saw lateralization, most in cases of fascia and perishondo. So it's allowed to skeletize the malleus or not? Not that is uh, my question to you. Chris, what do you, how do you manage this case? So for a really large perforation, um, I do, uh, do take the drum off the malleus handle, but I tend to do uh, what we call a bucket handle flap where I actually raise pretty much the whole of the annulus. So I take a, an antero inferior posterior tympanomiatal flap and pedicle that superiorly take the drum off the malleus handle, and then I use a cartilage island graft with a skirt of perichondrium up onto the canal wall all the way around, and I make a little notch on that to sit over the malleus, um, and that goes in as a single piece, and then I put that large antero inferior uh, posterior tympanomiatal flap back, and so I'm not using it. I don't use any merogel in that situation because it's sort of supported all the way around on the bone. Okay, I'd like to share the screen again. Um, is this this technique you mean uh, here, like shown in this publication? Uh, it's a talk peak group that you perform an anterior flap instead of a posterior flap. And so I my my flap continues both anteriorly and it continues inferiorly and posteriorly. So it comes all the way around. So it comes from one o'clock right round to 10 o'clock. And then the whole of it is pedicled superiorly. It comes off the malleus handle. I put my graft as an, un, uh, as an underlay, but lateral to the malleus, and then put the whole lot of skin back. Okay. I'd like to ask uh, Daniel. Daniel, the advantage of endoscopic neuroplasty is that uh, we once we have a defect in the anterior part of the membrane, uh, and several times we have an overhanging anterior wall. And once you do it with a microscope and RL, uh, you had to dissect the anterior wall or thin it out by um, uh, using a drill. But this is uh, traumatic because of a noise trauma. Or you could come from posterior with a rate follicular incision. As then you can see sometimes the anterior uh, um, uh, ligament, but sometimes not so that also the drill. So in children, uh, it's in my opinion, uh, very useful to use um, the endoscope uh, to prevent the drilling of the anterior wall. And uh, do you also use this technique in the endoscope, uh, which I've, uh, it's interesting uh, to develop the flap anterior, so we have a minimized your trauma also at the skin. Yes, um, one of the advantages of the endoscopic technique uh, is to uh, perform a, a tympanoplastic type one without uh, manage uh, the anterior annulus and uh, the anterior skin of the ear canal, and also your technique, the trans, uh, uh, the trans uh, membrane approach that you did uh, before, it's, it's perfect for some cases when 
it's not so easy to have a, a good uh, uh, condition, especially when, when the anterior annulus uh, is really difficult to reach uh, through the uh, underlay technique. So I think that one of the best uh, important advantages of the endoscope uh, is to manage uh, uh, underlay technique, uh, avoiding uh, uh, the uh, management of the anterior skin and the anterior annulus. So I, I agree with you. Okay. Uh, once you do it endoscopic, you use more uh, cartilage or more fascia or peritoneum? Because I think uh, to manage it with one hand, uh, cartilage, I think it's easier. That's right? Yeah, this is right. Uh, depending on the condition of the eardrum and uh, the condition of the mucosa of the tympanic cavity, if I have a patient with the normal eustachian tube function, with the norm normal mucosa without infection in the tympanic cavity, and uh, with the perforation in the posterior aspect of the eardrum, uh, I'm using fascia. If I have uh, an anterior perforation or a subtotal perforation or a patient with infection and the failure of the eustachian tube, I'm using cartilage. So depending on the condition of the, the patients. And uh, regarding the endoscopy technique, of course, uh, it's a one hand technique. So it is more easy to manage uh, cartilage because it's more rigid with respect to the, the fascia, of course. Okay. Are there any other comments to this use of endoscopic technique? If not, there is a question from the audience. Um, what do you do if Ambo is medial sized under the promontory or contacts the promontory? You can do in this case no underlay technique. You can no perform an underlay technique, I think, under the, um, under Marius. So I think the question is what would you do if, the, uh, if you have a steep angle of the Marius with contact to the promontory and intact chain? If the chain is destroyed, it's easy. You can lift up the Marius, but once the chain is intact, what is your preferred technique? Jan Christoph. So first of all, I would always insert, um, insert a, a silicon sheeting foil be beyond that um, umbo so that it does not really fix to the promontory, prevent that. And my personal experience is that I always manage to um, put an underlay uh, perichondrum uh, uh, underneath and, and then add some cartilage to the uh, in most cases, subtotal defect of the uh, tympanic membrane. I've actually never really experienced a case where I did not succeed with that technique. Mm -hmm. Alex. Oh, your mic, your mic, please. Switch on your mic. Sorry. Um, if I understood correctly, uh, the, the Ombo is now very close to the promoter and there is no space to insert anything between the Ombo and the and the promontory. And I think this is a, a situation that we see often in, uh, uh, in young patients, uh, in children uh, particularly. And um, it is, to my opinion, crucial to um, use a technique to lateralize the ombo a little bit. Otherwise, the, um, uh, the uh, tympanoplasty will not be successful. And what I do in these cases, because uh, these are the cases that typically have a complete air bone gap. Um, in these cases, um, I uh, do an incus interposition and I cut the, um, the malleus um, uh, neck to take out the um, malleus head. And then you can lateralize very well uh, the uh, malleus handle and uh, place the fascia under it and um, have a very good and very natural situation at the end. Okay, uh, but the problem is once the chain is intact and uh, you have a good transmission and not a fixed chain, then the situation is difficult. And in my opinion, it's the only way is to, to skeletize the Marius handle and to make an overlay technique on the Marius with cartilage and because we use this elastic sheeting of the membrane, I think we can prevent lateralization 
of the membrane. Well, yeah, I want to make a comment that we might prevent lateralization, but is there a point of that we have still um, a, um, a, a bigger air bone gap? Because I mean, there will not be a lateralization of the cartilage coming from the maleocentral, but whether the attachment of this cartilage to the maleocentral in terms of sound transmission is is that good? If we don't have a, uh, an additional um, uh, an additional connection towards the, the the incus, which we in most in many cases have by the the overlaying cartilage. But if it's really just the maleocentral, and if it's really just an overlay cartilage, I personally I have never done it, but I would personally feel that that or, or question whether this uh, whether later on my air bone gap will not maybe result from this worse connection between cartilage and the and the mother's handle. Yes, Chris. Okay. Uh, I, I, I definitely do that. I, I do an overlay as, as Thomas was uh, outlining, skeletonize the malleus, do an overlay. And I don't think you get a big air bone gap. From it. I think it gets quite a good uh, contact. And the other thing, if it's really medialized and you're really worried about that umbo touching the promontory, and you have an intact chain, I sometimes will laser off the umbo. So I'm using cartilage on top of the malleus, but I'm just taking that tip off the malleus handle to stop it coming onto the promontory. And if you use the laser, you can do that with an intact chain. Okay, call that. So, uh, I have no good experience, no, no, no good results in the cases where the malleus handle is shortened. There are cases where the tip of the malleus is destroyed by cholecystoma or fracture of the malleus handle. And with an intact chain, we see quite a large air bone gap because there's no sound transmission from the vibrating tympanic membrane whatsoever you reconstruct it down to the stapes or to the incus. So in these cases, I would always suggest to put cartilage on top of the long incus process to at least create a type two like Wolstein, that means a direct transmission because the malleus handle, if it's not completely inserted, it's, non, it's not useless and it's no useful anymore. And this is why we always try, like Christopher Lewis said, put in a, a little stylistic sheeting between the umbo and the promontory and cut, if, of course, cut if there are any adhesions. We know that if there's the malleus, the umbo is contacting the promontory, we saw this in the Dresden experiments, that there's nearly no, no energy loss. That means you have a good hearing even with the malleus handle touching the promontory. That means if you have stylistic and have an underlay, then you can, make profit of the complete length of the malleus. If not, you convert it to a direct uh, type two on top of the uh, Incas. Okay, so I think we have a good discussion about the malleus. Um, and um, I thought uh, more than uh, to children, because in children uh, with long time ventilation problems, we have very often the situations that we have a retraction pocket in the posterior part, the chain is intact, but the malleus is very steep in a very steep angle. And sometimes once you have to reconstruct the membrane, it's uh, difficult. But I come now to the next topic because we talked about the uh, overlay technique to the incus and an incus uh, interposition. I come now to the topic of a type two reconstruction. It means um, also bridging or rebridging of the long process. And I want to give you a small talk, an introduction on the mechanics of these. Um, problems. So rebridging, that's a Dresden bridge. Um, and uh, as Carbon said, we have intact chains uh, uh, during static pressure, alter alternative static pressure chains. We have an uh, in and outward movement, a large in and outward movement of the malleus. But once you look to the foot plate, uh, the foot plate moves only in the range of micrometer. So we have a good compensation of atmospheric pressure coming from the uh, in Kutumalia joint. And uh, the question now is, is the columella the right concept what we have? Because we have no compensation of atmospheric pressure with the consequences that uh, 
the prosthesis can be dislocated uh, from the modules or from the foot plate uh, with the resulting airborne gap. So um, in former times, we dissected cholesteatoma in every case with dissection of the ossicular chain. Uh, but sometimes you have uh, only a flat erosion of the bone and uh, you can leave the chain intact. And that comes to the concept of bridging. Uh, one standard situation is that the long process of incus could be overhanging the stavis with a cleft, could be have a cleft uh, less than 30%, or you have a large defect more than 30%. And you can uh, decide now different reconstruction technique. Once it's overhanging here in grade one, you can insert bone or you can use cement. If you have more less than 30%, you can use an angle prosthesis or you can use cement. These are the hip prosthesis from the Kurtz company. You can get uh, the insertion is. Uh, is not in every case easy, and you have to prevent a tension at the annular ligament. You don't sh should press your stavis to the promontory. But you can get very good results um, with this reconstruction, this bridging. And uh, the uh, bridging has the effect that you reconstruct not only the acoustic function of the mirror, you can also reconstruct the um, um, the compensation of atmospheric pressure, and that gives uh, better results. I want to like to show you the one experiment on temporal bones with music. That is a disruption of the incudistapedial joint. And now we have this the chain. The sound is changed, and when it's open, it's completely changed. But once you go back, once you go back. To when once you close the joints and you have the normal natural sound. And uh, that is also an, an one idea of bridging um, that you can reconstruct the natural sound. And my question is, is this also your experience? And I'd like to announce the first um, uh, video presentation coming from Carl Bernd Hüttenbrink about bridging. Please. Yeah, please. I will try. Well, you showed already the. Uh, well, wait a minute. Oh, yeah. This one. Bildschirm freigeben. No. Oh. Wait. Doesn't work. Doesn't work. Wait a second. No. Okay. Sorry. Freigabe. Bildschirm freigabe. It's, it's, it's free. It's free. You should change to the presentation models, please. Yes. Wait. Oh, yeah. Next. Yeah. So this is a video. This was before. So if you, and then you see, if you have only 20, 30 decibels, then you see it's often the defect of the tip of the long angles process. So you cut the uh, connective tissue strands there, the scar tissue, and then why not make use of the original uh, anatomical behavior? So you put in this little uh, clip, angular clip prosthesis. Design is based on our Dresden clip mechanism on the stapes, and you just put it, and of course, this is a short video of uh, sometimes a bit longer surgery. It sometimes takes a little bit more time to to place it in the correct way, but you only need to, to crimp like the stapes piston crimping on the long ingles process because the clip on the stapes holds by itself. And you see that is a good mechanically stable contact. And you saw the paper we published some years ago, about 20 of these cases. And they were all 
it will be very fascinated by seeing that this, these are good ears, these are good aeration, and this is a good tympanic membrane. And we always place cartilage on top, not, to, for, not only for protecting, but also for being sure that there is also a direct sound transmission, the type two transmission, we place back the uh, tympanometal fold and you see and you see we had always a airbone closure only in one case it was not closed and we were wondering why didn't it work and we made tympanometry on all these ears and we saw this was the ear where there was an, an effusion afterwards so this shows also the importance of being sure that in your post operative results you don't confound uh, the, uh, um, um, a bad result of your prosthesis, but it is perhaps only a fusion in the middle ear. And uh, so we had good results in these uh, rare, but uh, sometimes occurring cases where the long incus process is eroded. Thank you. That's it. Stop. Okay. Uh, Short thank video. You much. Very nice. Uh, also, we can see an alternative technique uh, managed by cement reconstruction, I think. Cesar. Yeah. You are on now. Now I'm going to share the, the, the display. Let me see. Yeah. Okay. Did you see the video? Yes. Okay. This video is about uh, ossicular change bridging with cement. We show you the otoscopy. As you see, this is a complete tympanic membrane atelectasis with a posterior retraction, which is uh, mean a uh, stapedopexy and erosion grade two of the long process of the incus. We began with a rosin incision. We carefully separate the flap. It's very important to Detach the entire ESRM without a leading epithelium that can generate a cholesteatoma. You have to do a, caref a gentle and carefully dissection. We remove, we detach the ESRM for the stapes. This is a, the usual procedure in this situation. And now begins the key point for this technique. It's very important before applying the cement to remove the remains of mucosa from the ossicles and also to dry the field. If you don't, if you don't that, if you don't need that, the cement does not adhere properly to the bone. So what we need is to fill the cavity with the spongo sand, dry spongo sand, to absorb the liquid and the humidity possible inside. So remember, remove all the mucosa of the remaining ossicles and dry the fill. And as you can see here, we put this before with with uh, with the spongo sand, and we move later. And we began to do the, 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 the mix. We put the powder and then we add the liquid and mix until we get the right texture. And this is the other key point of this technique. The uh, automatic texture should be enough, soft enough for it can be modeling or sculpting, but hard enough to prevent and dripping. And you will see the first application is the most difficult because autonomic is very sticky and it sticks in all places everywhere except by the right place. But you should be patient and reposition the autonomics within the incus and the head step. You see here, it sticks on the quarter tympani, it sticks on the diodram. You don't to be patient and try to repositioning the, the autonomics. I don't modify the radio because I would like to see how it works because the first time you do it, do you do that. You think the, it's impossible to do, but if you are patient, you can re, uh, reconvert the situation. You see, now we remove the automimic from the corda tympani. Now the automimic fell down to the facial. <laughs> you think you, you can do it, but you have to be patient and you will see that at the end, the texture of the automimic change and it's more easy to to manage, and you see here, we put over the head of the stapes and the, the, the necrosis of the incus, you see here. And now you can sculpt without any problem. And now it seems yeah, the connection is good enough. You will see. We add more quantity 
of uh, to mimics to the incus and more quantity to the head of the steps. And you will see this is the final aspect of the connection. And before closing, it's very important to check if you get a good connection between, you will see now. We see the membrane of the round window when you touch the cartilage and when you touch the, 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 the autonomics and the handle of the, of the malleus, we have a quick transmission. And that means that the, 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 the joint has been completely solved. We add a cartilage of, of, for the reinforcement of the, of the retection pocket. And in this case, replacing the, the, the eardrum. And in this case, we put a grommet because they have a second tubes problem, a chronic second tube problem. And we think that it's important the first day to ensure a good ventilation. And you will see the result. Six months for soft, we close the gap in the, in, in the uh, low frequencies. That's all, thank you. Okay, thank you for your very interesting case because the prosthesis would be not work because the long process was too short. But I think, the, and I would like to open the discussion, I think the most surgeons here in the panel would use in this case uh, pop reconstruction. Um, but uh, congratulations, it works. And I think, uh, yeah, the results may be uh, better than pop or not. That is a question to the audience. Do we have also experience with bridging in comparison to top, uh, to, to pop reconstruction? Chris? Um, I, I used to use cement many years ago, and although I got really nice results in the short term, I found that they failed over time, so I stopped using them. Um, that was Serena Sem, and I gather from colleagues that, like Cesar, that Otomimics is much better, but I was put off using that. I've also tried the angular vincle clip. And I was slightly disappointed with my results. And so I tend to use the, uh, the, I'm delighted to be here and to say that I use the Dresden clip in almost all of these cases, even when there's a really good, quite, quite good residual ink as I tend to use a partial clip of your design. Okay. Uh, Alex, do you have uh, experience with bridging? No, I don't do any bridging. Um, and the reason is that uh, with the incus interposition of the patient's own incus, um, you don't need any other material. You don't need any other prosthesis. Um, it's relatively quick to do. And uh, the results are so good that I don't think you need anything else. OK. Another point opinions about this? Chuck? The first three patients that were referred to me who had uh, mimics, um, it lasted for about six to 12 months and then it came off. And as Cesar said, it may be a matter of technique. Perhaps they did not dry the bone well. Uh, but so because of that, I didn't use it myself. Um, I like Carl's uh, prosthesis, but our struts work so well when there is um, erosion of the lenticular process, I simply remove it and put in a strut. Okay, how about? Yes, <clears throat> there is uh, one important thing, which is important, which we learned also. The, what you also saw, he put, uh, Caesar put his cartilage on top. And this comes to that direct transmission from the tympanic membrane to the prosthesis and to the stapes. That means, Chris, what you're doing, if you put a porp, it's the same thing. You pull, have a direct transmission. And so if you, place, if you place your cartilage on top of this prosthesis, even the angular clip, sometimes I say angular clip is in reality a porp, but with the additional anchoring and stabilization at the Ingolstadt process so that it will not dislodge because I put the prosthesis and put my cartilage on top. 
So it is Carl. a form of a port, but additionally anchoring, so stabilization at the incus. I think that makes sense, Carl. And in fact, it would be interesting to get a CT scan to eventually see if you're really just getting the type two and the cement is no longer benefiting. It's really the cartilage that is causing the vibration. That is, that's it. Daniel, do we do use, do you use bridging or do you use uh, always pops? I think that when you have adjust a small defect of the incus, I'm using a bony cement. I think that is a really nice material in order to connect the stapes and the incus. And um, this is one of the most simple, uh, um, simple material to use in order to, to get uh, really nice results. So, and endoscopically is really simple. Honestly. Okay, I'd like to share my screen and want to show you um, one picture of a movie. My screen looks so, oh, sorry. Um, yes. Um, I want to show you this picture. Um, no, it's a wrong one, sorry. It's this one. So we have a nice case here. Uh, it looks intact, but once you, uh, once you fill with your needle uh, and you detach the long process, you will see that it's not intact. It was an airborne gap around 15 dB and more in the higher frequencies. So my question is, what would you do in this case? Um, because as uh, we are definitely taking, we could make a pop of course, but we would uh, dis, uh, disrupt the chain once we use a pop. Uh, we could uh, enlarge a piece of cartilage with conduct to the membrane, or we could disrupt the cannulation of the chain and insert an, uh, insert an anchor prosthesis. What, what, do you, what would your preferred technique in this case? Alex. It, it has not become completely clear to me. Where, where is the defect? <laughs> That's good. That's a good question. Okay, I'll go back. There's a video. We, you can see no defect. It's a granulation tissue here. And when you touch... Uh, when um, you touch maybe it, I don't see the video, actually. I just see a, um, a stand... Picture. A standing picture. Yes. I'd like to go back, but it's not working. Maybe you're sharing the wrong screen. Okay. Or maybe it's something wrong with my screen. No, no, no. no I'm, not, I'm not seeing the video either. Yeah, it's the wrong screen shared. Um, one option is to just end the. Um, so we switch to German. When Sie die Bildschirmübertragung noch mal kurz beenden, das Video starten und dann noch mal teilen. Yeah. Thomas. Yeah. I have experience with these cases and some similar. We 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 see a, a head trauma with a subluxation of the lenticular process from the head of the safe. And when you go to the theater, you don't see any defect, but the problem was the disconnection. In these cases, I usually use cartilage, interposed cartilage in between the incus and the staves and it works properly. Okay. But you have to, you have to, to, to explore properly the, 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 the disconnection because in the first uh, view, you don't see nothing. Okay. Uh, other opinions about this? So can you see my screen now? No, we didn't. We don't have your screen, Thomas. Okay. Still have to share. I think I, as Cesar said, if this was post-traumatic, 
<clears throat> subluxation, then you could probably get by with some type of interposition in the past. I oh. think people might use an apple bomb uh, rather than a piece of cartilage or bone. But I think if this was due to chronic ear disease, there's going to be ischemic necrosis there. It's going to progress. And I'd rather just remove the incus and put in a strut. Okay, it was not running this uh, video, but uh, I think we have several options, but one option is really to use uh, cement because you cannot insert in this case good equipped prosthesis or angle prosthesis because the chain is not completely uh, disrupted. Uh, we have granulation tissue and the mobile uh, a, a, a slippage between the long process and uh, the head of the status. And concerning uh, the repurging, I found the publication here uh, with cement and they observed five years. So we have not really extra long term results, but five years are not bad. My question to you is what about this technique? We have here, you can see my screen, a reconstruction with cartilage to the stapes head and the long process is elongated by a piece of cartilage. Would you do this or not? Do you use cartilage to elong the long process? Yes, I, I'm, uh, Thomas, I'm, I'm using this technique when uh, I'm performing a cholesterol surgery and uh, it's not possible to use the incus, and uh, I, I have to reconstruct uh, uh, the drum with the cartilage, uh, and probably this technique helped me to improve uh, the hearing results. So I have experience with this technique, and I think that is a good option, especially doing cholestatoma without any other possibility to use, for example, remodeling incus. So, um... Another question is, I stop my screen work right now. Once you have this situation, um, the long process is disrupted and you have the choice to use uh, pore prosthesis or to use an angle prosthesis. What would be your decision? Turing surgery. It's, um, do you use a pore angle pros position? Angle prosthesis or port or um, uh, increase interposition. Alex, do you do uh, increase interposition? Yes, increase interposition gives very, very good results and is very reliable. So I uh, almost never see prosthesis extruded or actually um, uh, bone extruded. So uh, I would use this technique. But the uh, resorption of the incus in case of inflammated uh, mucosa, in case of cholesterol, you don't feel? Uh, I'm, I'm not quite sure if I understood you correctly. Maybe that... Um... If you have, if you have um, cholesterol surgery and you yeah. use incus in the position. Oh, I see. So if, um, if, if you think there is uh, some cholesterol uh, left on the incus, is that the question? No, I fear that you get an, uh, will get a resorption of the incus by a chronic inflammation. Yes, um, it's, I don't see that actually. So if the, um, if the cholesterol has, has been taken out and um, uh, then we, we get very stable results. Um, but in, in many cases that uh, you do a reconstruction, then a reconstruction, you don't have enough incas uh, present anyway, and then uh, you can do a direct uh, type three uh, of the uh, tympanic membrane on the, on the state piece. Okay. Um, and dislocation of the incas during atmospheric pressure change? Yes. Uh, so directly, directly the tympanic membrane directly on the on the state piece. Okay. But uh, I prefer in the most cases um, titanium prosthesis um, because I fear the resorption of the ink position of the incus. How bad? 
Yes, I, uh, these are rare cases, but uh, we must consider, uh, we learned the hard way when I started ear surgery in the 70s, 80s, 90s, we only had incusts. And of course, we never saw an extrusion because in these cases where at that period, we were not so successful in, in doing good cholecystoma surgery, we all had granulation and infection afterwards. So it just resorbed. And this is why everybody said, oh, incus is good. We never see the dead incus outside, but we saw the, metallia, the metallic and, and all these others extruded. But on the other hand, I had a case, it's rare cases. I had a case, for example, 12 year old boy, he had a trauma playing soccer and he had um, a fracture uh, and, and a disruption of the ossicular chain. So I decided to take his own incus and place it drilled deep a hole so that he had really a good contact to the stapes head. That is also important. In former times, we only drilled little niches, but we must drill a deep, deep hole so that it really sits stably on the stapes head. Because, and then I put back the, the tympanic membrane. Why? Because this young boy still had around 60, 70 years of life in front of him. So with incus replacement, with his own ossicle in the middle ear, we know that, that it will stand the time if there's no infection which was not the case, that it will stand the time for the next 60, 70 years. But even with the best titanium prosthesis, we do not know how it will work in 40 years, in 50 years, and 60 years. So these are rare cases uh, of a really post-traumatic, for example, there I would always prefer to use the own ossicle, but stably fixed. That means really deep hole to put it on top of the stapes head. Okay. okay. And I had one, one comment because I, I rarely do this um, uh, auto uh, incus because I, I'm not that much afraid of the resorption, but isn't there a case of, of fixation of the incus to the stapes? And then in case of the recurrent big, big air bone gap, for whatever reason, you want to um, uh, revisit this uh, tympanoplasty and then taking off an incus sitting and being fixated to the stapes for years is really kind of challenging. That that is, at least for me, a, a point where I was uh, restrained from, from you, or in many cases, restrained from using uh, um, the Autolocus uh, Incus. Is that a case for you guys? Yes. Okay. Yeah, uh, I've definitely seen cases of ankylosis with Incus. You know, I, I don't use the Incus, I never, never use it, but I obviously do lots of revision surgery. And I've had cases where the incus has been displaced, that, but then has become fixed, and it can be really tricky, particularly if it's enclosed onto the stapes head. Okay, I use it also only rare and only in cases where I have no inflammation of the mucosa and no cholesteratoma. Um, okay, so I thank you very much. We have now a break of uh, 30 minutes, and I want to give back to, the, uh, to Matthias Mertens to the Kam Kurz Kalini. Thanks a lot. Just a short remark. I think we have two types of discussions going on, one in the chat and one in the question answer um, function. I would just ask the audience to um, move the questions into the chat because this is where the main activity is going on. Then let's go to a break. I think we continue at 1.30. Okay, then see you soon. So, Herr Mertens, hören Sie mich noch? Ja, okay. wir sind noch komplett online. Ja. Ah, okay. Dann äh, werde ich auch eine kurze Pause machen. Alles klar, dann in 30 Minuten. 30 Minuten, ja. Okay, danke, bis gleich. Noch eine, noch eine Präsentation dazwischen von Ihnen noch? Ja, da starten gleich in Minutenabständen noch ein Video, zwei Stück. Die starten. Okay, gut. Dann. Sonst den Bildschirm sehen Sie, ne? Den ja. Bildschirm? Okay, alles klar. Okay. Danke. Thank you. 
Ihr Mikro ist noch an.
series.
So, müssen wir noch irgendwas anderes machen, Herr Mertens? Ich denke, nein. Ich denke, alles soweit bestens. Ich bringe noch mal das Programm kurz rein. So. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Hi, great, great. Yeah, it was a really good session, Thomas. Well done. I think it's, Thank you. It's, it's excellent so far. Really good. Very Thank interesting. So... In a few minutes, seconds, we will start. And Thomas, Herr Mertens, darf ich kurz eine Frage stellen? Ja, gerne. Ja. Ich habe ähm, hab ja so eine, so eine App gemacht, auch auf dem internationalen Bereich. Haben Sie was dagegen, wenn ich auch in meinem letzten Vortrag irgendwo oder bei meinen Videos im Hintergrund ein bisschen Werbung dafür reinspiele, nur einen Link reinsetze in den Hintergrund? Machen Sie das gerne, natürlich. Kein Problem. Okay. Wird nicht viel ablenken, denke ich. <lacht> Haben wir nur gerade in den Sinn bei so einer großen Audience und wir versuchen das ja weltweit so ein bisschen bekannt zu machen. Das ist das Gleiche, wie wir das im Deutschen auch schon haben. Dann ja. dachte ich, ich nutze es hier mal. Kein Problem, selbstverständlich. Chris. <lacht> Chris, the sound is good. The sound is good. Can you hear me good? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Some, sometimes, Thomas, you're a little bit quiet. It's a little bit variable from you, but generally the sound from most of the speakers is really good. And, and most of the time it's fine from you. It's just occasionally it seems slightly quiet. Maybe you sit slightly further from the microphone occasionally. I could change to, um, to a headphone. It's no problem. Yeah, I mean, it's good now, but there were just a couple of times this morning it was a little quiet. I think somebody... Uh, sent a message to say that, but then most of the time it was good. So, hello, Chris. Hi, hi, Carl. Ah, you had already your fish and chips for lunch? Yeah, have my lunch, yeah. <laughs> fish and chips, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if only, yeah. <laughs> well, it's nice to see you. I, I really enjoy these sessions. It's very interesting, you know, hearing different opinions and learning, and I'm really learning from people, actually. I'm astonished about these many participants because is it correct that at the same parallel time there is Lions also running? No, 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 it's not. That was yesterday and Tuesday. Ah, okay, okay. So it, 
it on. doesn't overlap and and we had very good uh, you know really good number of people attending that as well so, so but this is great i mean a thousand people is fantastic it's really yeah. good the only no, the line, the line was very successful. I think so many people are stuck uh, at home, not traveling, and yeah. to be able to just uh, come to these meetings for free, it's very popular. It's really and good. Imagine when we have a Dresden or Cologne course, we had 15 or 20 maximum participants. And yes, of course. Of course. <laughs> of course. Yeah. Yeah. Chris, do you know how many participants um, the lines have had the last two days? I don't know. I don't know. But, you know, typically it's this sort of number. It's a thousand or more. It's it's, it's very popular. Yeah. Um, and on purpose, so, we didn't try to compete. So that's why we put it. No, that's great. Purpose. I'm really pleased course, you didn't. Um, of course, no. Uh, yesterday, we still performed uh, only with uh, six or seven participants, a live surgery course in Hamm. Perhaps for course that might be interesting also next time. Okay. Okay. Still live yeah. surgery. Oh. With Patients we had to continue, to I think. Uh, yeah. We yeah. are over the time of within one minute. <laughs> so, Matthias Merns, could you give me free? Yes, you should be able to um, sh share everything. Everything is online. Now? Yeah. Okay. Okay, dear colleagues and audience. We come now to the second part of this course, and I changed uh, the microphone. Hope the sound is better. Now you could understand me good. And we go now deeper to the middle ear. We were started with the morning membrane, and uh, we had changed to um, intact chain or rebridging. And now we comes to type three re reconstruction. It means interposition or reconstruction with total prosthesis. So I'd like to give you a small um, a small uh, lecture about mechanics again, about type three reconstruction and share my, my screen. Please uh, close your microphone, Chris. Good. Um, type 3A reconstruction. What does it mean? It means sound, better sound in the middle ear uh, from Dresden. <laughs> no, we have um, in this case, uh, Cesar reported about uh, rebridging with cement, but mostly in this case, so most people would choose an incus in the position or an interposition with a pop and I'd like to go back to the Indus in the interposition I have some ideas what could be happened with the incus you need a deep hole in the incus body otherwise you can get a dislocation of your incus but once you insert a deep hole um, it's difficult to make a um, revision surgery and uh, to dissect it from the stabus, you can get a dislocation of your stabus. So that is a critical point. Another critical point is that the incus is also a huge mass, a huge body, and it can come in contact with the bony walls of the um, tympanic cavity. Uh, so in the most cases, uh, I use uh, prosthesis and one question an experiment was how to couple a prosthesis. It's better to couple it on the membrane or it couples to the malleus handle. And I did a lot of experiments uh, with laser Doppler vibrometry to uh, investigate these different uh, positions. And there are also a lot of publications about this. And it's clear once you couple it to the malleus handle, you get better to sound transfer in the higher frequencies than if you couple it only um, at the that's a membrane. So you can see it in this experiment, membrane coupling, malleus contact. Thomas, we can't hear anything. It's just the movie. Yes, yes, no sound. Oh, it's no sound. Uh, I don't know why, 
Uh, try it again. It's now more sound? No. No? no. Okay, we have no sound. I don't know why. Um, good, but the experiments, I cannot imagine that it depends from the headphone. I changed only the headphone. I want to go out with the headphone. Try it again. It's no oh, sound? Oh, yes, yes, it's a headphone. Now we have sound. Sound? Yeah. Yes? Yeah. So membrane coupling and coupling to the minus handle. Membrane, Marius handle. So uh, we have better, higher frequencies once we couple it to the Marius handle. And so a lot of prosthesis are designed by a notch to couple it uh, to the Marius handle. Sometimes you cannot underneath it once you have a steep angle of the Marius. And then, in my opinion, it's enough to contact it side by side or to use such a all joint prosthesis, all the publication with uh, improvement of airborne gap. Another problem is once you use a pop, you don't uh, tilt or move your prosthesis to the promontory because you get a tension here in the under ligament. So that's once you contact it uh, to the malleus, it's difficult to uh, reach the malleo sometimes. And when you get such a position, it could be um, a damping, lead to a damping in the, in the annular ligament. So now I'd like to stop here and I want to give the way free for the uh, video presentation, for the surgery presentations. And uh, so if we go to the alphabet, and the first is Chris Aldrin with his uh, surgery video. And the second is Alex Huber and then Cesar and then uh, Jack, Jack and Daniel. Please, Chris. Okay, thanks. I just need to get my... Okay, so I'd like to thank uh, Thomas uh, so much for inviting me to speak at this Dresden course. Uh, I'm particularly... Uh, keen to and happy to speak because uh, as you'll see I use their design of the partial clip prosthesis when I'm doing a partial reconstruction. Um, this is the prosthesis uh, that I use and the, the beauty of this I think in the design is this clip which is made from very thin titanium foil which I was amazed to find is hand, uh, hand bent around a little former. And this sits over the stapedius tendon and these goes over the uh, stapes itself. There is a two and a half millimeter or approximately diameter fenestrated titanium head. And it's got a little marker here that allows you to line up this bit of the clip with the stapedius tendon. So if we go to the video, um, you will see the prosthesis here and the beauty of it is that it, it clips really just sufficiently tightly to be very stable on the stabies head and I found when I started using this prosthesis that it made a massive difference to my results I think all the prostheses I've used before did not have a secure coupling at the stapes, and when I came to revise them they'd tilted or they'd fallen off and that really doesn't seem to be an issue with this prosthesis. So um, I was, it was uh, Professor Wilco Grolman who put me onto it. And once I started using it, I found that I use pretty much use it all the time now. So here's the prosthesis upside down to show you that, and this is a, an erosion that one could reconstruct, but I tend not to do that. As I said, my results with, car, with cement were only short lived. And here we put the prosthesis on, you see it sits very snugly. We've lined up this little swelling with the stapedius tendon. Here's another stapedius tendon, stapes seen end on with the facial nerve up here. We just rotate. So I hold the clip on my sucker with my left hand and then rotate it until we've lined up this little swelling with the stapedius tendon and then just gently advance it 
and just press it on with a needle. Um, and that makes it nice and snug. And then we need a little bit of cartilage over the top. So uh, you'll see in a minute that I'm just putting a piece of cartilage back over the top. But it's the stability and the design of that clip that seems to make all the difference here. So I no longer use cement, even if there's a small defect in the ink, as I tend to go straight to this prosthesis. Here you can see one, it's a combined approach to impanoplasty. Here's the prosthesis sitting very nicely on the stapes. A little bit of cartilage coming back to reconstruct the drum. Here's the posterior canal wall with the mastoid uh, at the back. Just gently put that cartilage back in place. And you can see that I've used a, an island graft here. And then looking through the posterior tympanotomy, you can see it nicely positioned. And the results of this are, I think, pretty spectacular with this clip. We get an average 20 decibel of improvement, 20 decibel reduction in our air bone gap. Uh, and what I found with results previously with partial reconstruction, I got plenty within 20 decibels, but not that many within 10 dB. And when we look by pathology, when there's no cholesteatoma, I'm getting 60% within 10 decibels, 50% with, with, in the presence of cholesteatoma. So these have been transformative. And so I'm very grateful to the Dresden team for their design uh, and thank them very much. So that's my presentation. Thanks, Thomas. So thank you so much. Very instructive. And uh, I think we can come later to a discussion about this. Uh, I hope you can hear me well. Yeah, we can hear you, yeah. Okay. So um, the next is Alex. Alex, please show us your video. Yes, I will share my screen. Hang on a second. And uh, can you see it? Yes. All right. So um, what I would like to show you is uh, the incus interposition. And I would like to introduce a little bit the different uh, shape of the incus. You can see it in here. And um, it's important to shape the incus. Um, so for one hand that it becomes small, um, the other hand that it has a light weight for better transmission and, and third so that it doesn't fall off. And I use an uh, end oral approach for that, uh, doing the tympanomantal flap, as you can see at this moment, lift off uh, the tympanic membrane. Now, the example that I, I show you here is a um, malleus incus fixation. Um, but of course, this is the same for, uh, for, the, for all other types of incus in position too. You can see the Sapies moves well in this uh, particular case, but the incus and the malleus is completely fixed. So of course, you need to cut here the incudostapedial joint um, with a little joint knife, and then the incus is rotated out. And um, the next step then is to, to shape um, this incus according um, to the size, uh, of course. First, you need to um, cut the, the malleus head in this case. And uh, this is an important step here. If you use the malleus, um, uh, the, uh, the malleus uh, niche, uh, the, the malleus um, nipper, uh, then you will cut the malleus um, superior to the anterior malleal ligament. So the ligament will stay in touch. If you want to cut the ligament, you have to do it uh, with a drill. And um, then you have to size the prosthesis so that it has the, the right size and then shape the incus. As you can see here now, um, make a shoulder for the malleus, make a, a hole for the, for the stapes. And um, I use this, uh, this fish respiratory, as you can see by the graphs um, from the, from the Tympanoplasty fish book uh, and um, make this, this little incision here for the stay piece, the shoulder for the malleus on top and um, make the, uh, the prosthesis relatively small. And that can be done relatively quick. So maybe you need five, five minutes or so to, to shape um, this prosthesis. And you can see now the prosthesis with, with its size and um, the, the prosthesis can then be put inside. And the question you asked before about the 
uh, call this deltoma remnants. If you drill the if you drill the incus, this will all be um, drilled off, and um, so it should not be a problem. And then the incus can be rotated um, in uh, in in the right position, so it's going to be placed under the malleus. And I fix the state piece with uh, with the suction, as you can see here. And then we'll put, we put put over the state piece head. Sometimes it takes uh, one than more attempt until it um, until it really fixes. Um, it's uncut here, so you can can see that. So it's not perfect yet, um, as you can see. And um, so you need to really put it in the in a right position. And then um, it's all, it's like wedged in between the, the malleus and the stapes, and you have a good uh, a good position and a good fixation of the prosthesis. And then you can uh, close um, the eardrum again, test it, and I use some foil then uh, before I I close it. Um, use some uh, foams. Uh, on that foil to to press the uh, membrane against the the bone and uh, use two stitches uh, to close it and I think I can stop the video here. Okay, Alex, thank you so much. You can hear me, Alex. Yeah, I can hear you well. Okay, good. So uh, I think we can discuss it um, in the in the um, in the panel. Then thank you so much. And I want to please uh, now Cesar about your case. Sure. Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Okay, let's be. Okay, um, this video is about, uh, as you said, a circular reconstruction in a case of only uh, one cura in the stapes. I think this is a very interesting and challenging case because it's not unusual and I have many solutions and we can discuss about that later. I will show you now the surgery. This is a right ear, you see, they have a retraction pocket in the posterior superior part of the ear. And as always, it turns to the, to the cavity, tympanic cavity. And we see the long process of the incus necrosis. There was only a, a breach of mucosa, okay? And now we detach the eardrum from the head of the stapes. Very usual scenario, nothing to say. But now begins the surprise, an expected finding, erosion of the anterior cura of the stapes. As you see, we are only posterior cura. The anterior cura has been eroded. And this is a surprise and we didn't know what to do. And this is the dilemma. The question is, is just one cura enough for a good sound transmission? If you think the answer is yes, you can bridge the chain, pisimen, plaster prosthesis, or can you put a pop also? But if you think it's not enough, you have to go to a torp. What we did, you will see. First of all, we check the transmission of the sound and it seems good. So we move to a plaster prosthesis and you will see what happened. See, this is the transmission. We thought that was enough, good enough. And we move to this, this, uh, this uh, prosthesis to be honest, I don't have very much experience with this prosthesis. And what happened, have, uh, just told Dr. Thanner, this is a type three necrosis and the, the plaster is only for type one and type two. And you see it's short. The second line of the creeps are in, were in, in supported. So we learned the lesson with this prosthesis is only for one, two, for, for tips one and two, which is the angle to improve the the, the process is, it, it improved a little bit, but 
we have we still having the same problem. The second grip doesn't work. In this moment, we don't have cement, so we move to uh, the same prosthesis that use Dr. Aldrin. We use this prosthesis, Dresden Torp. We are in love with this uh, prosthesis because it's very stable. Here you have the notch, and you see the the, the two little legs should put should be put between the tendon that of the step tendon and you push gentle and it's very 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 stable you see you can see the membrane of the round window and we close of course with a compost cartilage perichondrium and cartilage the perichondrium rests in the bone and the cartilage rests in the platform you have to avoid that the, the cartilage touch the bone for fixation as you can see here we check the proper contact between the cartilage and the platform of the pulp, and we reposition the of the tympanic membrane, and you will see the result of this case with a, only a, a little gap of uh, 50, 10, 50 dBs in uh, in low frequencies. That's all. Thank you. Okay, Cesar, many thanks. Um, I will. Very, very interesting case. And now, uh, please check, check, sorry, check, check out this. Yes, I you. want to close your, my presentation. Okay, done. Yes, and close your mic, please. Thank you, Tomas. I'd like to now discuss the synergy of using the over-under tympanoplasty technique with a secular reconstruction, especially if you prioritize integrating your prosthesis with the malleus. <clears throat> By placing the graft lateral, there is clear unimpeded access to the undersurface of the malleus, which not only assures proper fit, but also allows osseointegration to occur between the malleus and prosthesis. Here's an example using an Inca strut, which is threaded over a curved needle, placed on the capitulum, and then after elevating the malleus, tilted forward to lock into place. <clears throat> There's always an offset between the malleus and the stapes. As long as the offset is less than 60 degrees, there will be negligible impact on sound conduction as demonstrated by laser Doppler done from a years ago by Dick Good at Stanford. <clears throat> if the offset is too great, you have four options. Reconstruct to the drum, mobilize the malleus, create a neomalleus, or use a Vincent malleus replacement prosthesis, which can nicely integrate with the strut. <clears throat> We assure optimal prosthesis length by touching the malleus and demonstrating movement and then shaking the patient's head, proving secure fit. As you can see, the strut design is self-stabilizing and not dependent on middle ear packing. Here's an Inca stapy strut to the foot plate, also independent of packing. In summary, our 30 year experience demonstrates that over under technique is effective free of complications and enhances ossicular reconstruction when integrating with the malleus, whether using these strut designs or any other prosthesis that cradles the malleus. Vielen Dank. Okay, Jack, vielen Dank. Zurück. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, very interesting. I, I, Looking forward to the discussion. So now we have Daniel Mercuni, endoscopic reconstruction of the ossicular chain. Okay, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Uh, okay, regarding uh, the endoscopic approach and my behavior is to perform uh, uh, remodeling incus always. In, uh, in, uh, in our 
a casistic serial, especially for cholesteatoma. And uh, I agree with uh, my colleague before that just to drill the incus, and uh, it's really important the dimension of the uh, remodeling incus to avoid uh, to touch the incus uh, around, uh, of course, the tympanic cavity. And also it's really important to coupling uh, the uh, remodeling incus with the malleus. And when you are reconstructing the drum with the cartilage, you can use also the cartilage in order to have more contact with your reconstruction. So in, in our experience, this material is one of the best material. We didn't observe any uh, extrusion and also any ossification, honestly, in the second look procedure that we, we did. And this is our idea. You can see here the, the blue area is the, uh, the area where we uh, usually remove uh, on the incus and it's really important to uh, perform uh, osseculoplastic, uh, reduce as much as possible the body of the incus just in order to avoid the touching uh, of the incus around uh, the tympanic cavity. And after, of course, uh, you have to put uh, a hole uh, in, in your uh, in your ossicular uh, reconstruction. And this is the side with a uh, uh, little piece for the malleus. And this is a typical example after cholesteatoma removal, you can see here the incus. We have to remove the incus and after we can check the movement of the stapes and we can put the incus uh, between the malleus and uh, the stapes. It's really important uh, uh, to fix before uh, the stapes and after the malleus in this way in order to uh, have uh, the right uh, position between uh, the malleus and the incus. And you can see that the incus uh, don't touch uh, around the, the tympanic cavity. And we are using, in this case, also some uh, cartilage to reconstruct uh, the heel drum. And another case is like this, another cholestatoma. You can see after cholestatoma removal, and this is the cholestatoma removal, but uh, we want to see the reconstruction after the, this is the cavity. At the end, you can see here the stapes, and the facial nerve and anterior attic. So now we have to reconstruct the uh, defect. And so we are using the incus between the stapes and the malleus. Again, it's really important to see the movement of the stapes and the movement of the round window membrane before the reconstruction. And after we can reconstruct uh, our and um, our defect. This is again the incus before in the stepes. Of course, it's a cha quite challenging because you have to use one hand, and uh, but you have to use a really soft uh, movement on the ossicular chain. And you can see the coupling of between uh, the stepes and the malleus. And, and after, of course, you can put the cartilage in the attic, and this is the, the final result. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, NASA incus technique. Thank you so much. And um, now comes Professor Neulert from my clinic with uh, flexible prosthesis. Yeah, hello. Um, I'd like to show you two cases of uh, partial reconstruction, um, but not only the flexible. Um, so as you can yeah, assume, I'm a compulsive user of the, of the clip prosthesis, but of course there are rights to exist for other mechanisms as well. So um, the first case, which I show you here, is a bell prosthesis, because in this case of the revision surgery, the facial, the bony canal of the facial nerve was comparatively high and the oval niche was pretty narrow. So that was the reason why we were not able to put in a clip prosthesis since the clips are kind of space consuming. And uh, to 
uh, ensure a better fitting of the bell prosthesis I was bending the uh, prosthesis uh, foot a little bit uh, inward so that the prosthesis has not that nice fit like a clip prosthesis of course but uh, fair enough to um, to ensure a coupling here. And then of course it was uh, reconstructed with cartilage and the remnants of the tympanic membrane were uh, folded back and um, the rest is just uh, reconstruction of the lateral attic. Uh, and as this was a reconstruction, I used the uh, other cartilage which was already uh, used before. So, but then the next one, um, is the um, the clip prosthesis, and um, it's not the clip prosthesis in its uh, actual fashion, but it has a um, it's the clip prosthesis 2.0 or reloaded, um, because it kind of combines our knowledge about uh, atmospheric pressure changes, and our knowledge about the effect of annular ligament pretension on sound transmission, and we had a great discussion this morning. Um, that a steep or the, the off offset and the angle of the uh, malleus handle sometimes uh, is in our way. And especially when it comes to partial reconstruction, um, and if you want to ensure a good coupling and get a prosthesis in touch with the malleus handle, then this is a very nice prosthesis because on one side, and this is the stapes head side, we have the clip mechanism, which ensures us a very good coupling to the stapes his head. So this is a different patient, but uh, fairly looks the same. Uh, so the clip me mechanism works uh, right the same way as uh, Chris Aldrin and the others have, have showed it before. But uh, we have a ball joint, and this is not non-resilient, which means uh, um, you put on the clip and then you orientate the head plate of the prosthesis and the orientation gets in good touch and in good in alignment with the, your cartilage reconstruction. And this is not meant to follow the oscillation patterns or the vibration of the tympanic membrane during sound transmission, but kind of get an orientation after wound healing, which is in a flexible and a variable manner to the um, resulting um, uh, level and orientation of the reconstructed tympanic membrane. And again, this is folded back and uh, yeah. I think this is a very, very nice prosthesis, especially if you have advanced uh, or difficult uh, situations with the uh, malleus handle in reconstruction with clip prosthesis. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Marcus. Welcome. So I hope that I not forgot anybody who has a video in type 3A. So we can start with a discussion. And uh, Matthias Mertens, um, I'd like to ask you if there are some questions from the audience left uh, to this topic. Otherwise, I'd like to introduce some questions. So on my opinion, we have seen two different strategies in type three. The so first is what's shown by um, Chris Eltron. It's um, clip prosthesis. Um, it's also shown by Cesar Oros, um, Incus uh, replacement. Um, the clip prosthesis and the Incus replacement um, has um, a similar shape. You have uh, you have a short arm for the in for the Stavis head, and you have a long arm to underneath the um, the malleus handle or to underneath uh, the tumoring membrane. So you have something like an angled um, uh, reconstruction. The other strategy is the strut reconstruction. It was shown by Alex. And uh, it was also shown by Jack. So my question to the speakers is why the one group is preferring a strut reconstruction between the stable's head and the malleus handle, and the other group 
use more such an angled reconstruction, which looks like more uh, inclus or um, 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 yeah, eclipsis. It's, it's such an angle. What do you think? What is the advantage or disadvantage uh, from the ones or the others? Have you an idea, Chris? Yeah, well, I think, you know, most of us try and look carefully at our results and I've have a meticulous database that I've looked at. And as I said, I tried the clip prosthesis years ago and just found the results really good. And I'm sure that's due to the clip and the stability on the stapes head. But I don't particularly worry about going to the malleus handle. I go straight up to the drum. So I've got a nice vertical assembly. It doesn't matter too much on the position of the malleus handle. And it, it's just the, I think the advantage of that clip process is it's incredibly easy. You have to get the right size. I tend to use the Kurtz little partial dummies to get the size right. But once you've got that right, they, it's really, really simple. And one yes. of the things I find interesting with it is that when I've got, I have an otology fellows over the years, and it's always interesting to chat to them years later about what do they do that you've taught them. And a lot of the stuff you teach them, they ignore and they do something else. But pretty much every trainee who's been through my our program ends up using this clip prosthesis. And I think it's because it's easy and it's stable. Yeah. Okay, you have ex you have better experience with the clip prosthesis, but yep. you used before strut. As I just so, so I've used all sorts of different things in the past and was always yeah. changing, always trying new things. I I did haven't used ink as much because I was slightly worried that when I do revision cases from other people I've seen quite a bit of ankylosis and also I think it requires quite a lot of skill the the clip doesn't require much skill not that I I, I mean I hope I'm quite skillful but you know I, I take my hat off to these guys who create beautiful prostheses I like Jack Strutt I think that's got nice simplicity to it as well I can see the attraction of that yes yes um, my question to Alex and to Jack, uh, you use in both cases, it's uh, Alex who uses made from, uh, from say, uh, Incus and Jack, you use your uh, strut uh, prosthesis, but the principle is the same, I think. What is the advantage of this direct contact between the Stabius head and the Marius handle? Well, Tomas, I think you already proved it. You already showed the improvement in high frequencies when you go to the malleus. Yes. So that takes care of that answer. Number two is like Alex, I was a real believer in ink interposition. But here are the four issues. Numero uno, teaching residents and fellows, they don't have Alex's hands. So many times the ink would fly off the table. The sculpting was not as good. The sculpting might be too large and then have ossification to the fallopian canal. The uh, um, opening would not be as good. Next, Plester examined 500 incudi removed in tympanoplasty cases and under histopathology showed microscopic cholestetoma in 75%. I do agree with Alex, if you're careful, you can drill away any cholesterol there, but those are the objective numbers. And then most important is if you've ever had to do the revision as has been brought up, the ossification of the transposed incus onto the stapes is a real issue in trying to revise it. So for those of us that are doing seven cases a day, it's clear that there are nine ways to skin a cat and they're all successful. Conversely, for the 1,100 people who are watching and are not doing seven cases a day, I would try to get something that's straightforward and easy. The cost in America of the time it took for my residents and fellows to effectively sculpt an incus cost more than just using a prosthesis. And the prosthesis was always perfectly sculpted. Fini or Fertig. Okay. Um, you're right. Uh, the contact to the Malleus is uh, important. I show it in 
in experiments, but we can reach it also with um, ball joint plate. And uh, um, Alex, you show it also. You, you did a lot of effort to lift the prosthesis to the stable's head. And um, my question is, uh, we, you did also a lot of studies uh, on middle ear mechanics and um, one risk is the tension of the annular ligament. And uh, once you give too much tension to the annular ligament, um, then you can get an airborne gap. So you can prevent this by, to measure the length, but once you drill, your incus, could you say how long the incus strut is after drilling or how you feel it, how long it should be? <laughs> what is your impression? <laughs> yeah, so um, I agree with uh, with what I said before. Um, it is uh, it is it's maybe not the easiest way to do it, but um, it can be easily trained in the temple bone lab and I, I think compared to other skills that the residents need to do I think um, the shaping of the of the incus is maybe not the most difficult and not also not the most critical um, part of course uh, it is possible that it doesn't work out and then we have to move to a, to a port but for for that I don't think this is the um, that's a reason to to abandon that technique um, I also think that we should always do the, 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 the most anatomically uh, similar um, reconstruction to, to the nature and, and also the easiest one. And um, also cost, of course, is an, is an issue um, that we don't need uh, to do to use um, other materials than the ones that, that are already there. And uh, for patients, uh, also not to mention it at, at last, actually, for the patients, they always like to hear that we don't put anything, uh, any foreign material into their ears. Now, the, the question you, um, uh, you asked, um, Thomas, um, about the, the lifting or the, about the pretension, of course, this is a very important issue. Um, the, the, uh, the, the annular ligament um, should not be uh, tensioned too much because otherwise, as you showed, you will, will lose uh, a, lot of, a lot of hearing. But um, with, with the technique to measure actually the distance between the, the malleus uh, handle and the, the stapes, you can measure that quite precise um, uh, with an instrument and then use that to shape Link is accordingly. So I think that that is probably um, not such a difficult issue in those cases. It's more a problem on what happens um, if you have uh, a reconstruction in, in a post cholesteratoma case that the tympanic membrane moves um, and then maybe you will have some tension. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that you cut say, uh, malleus tendon, so that's right, why? Uh, not in all cases, um, but in some cases, uh, particularly when uh, the situation like I showed in this video, um, where you have a fixation of the malleus incus complex, you will also have a calcification of the anterior malleal ligament. Of course, um, when, you, uh, when you move the, the malleus, you will, you will break that uh, calcification and it, 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 it feels that it has, um, it has a normal motion, but um, after a year or so, this will recalcify and then you will have a similar situation with the fixed malleus and uh, you will lose some hearing. Okay. Marcus? Just, just make sure to comment because uh, coming to the costs, uh, the, the, the autologous material is always uh, Said to be so cheap. I just, I think it was two weeks ago, our controller in our hospital, he was making a calculation and told us that one minute during general anesthesia in, in the OR is about 50 euro. And if you say it, it takes you five minutes, then you're up to 250 euro just for drilling the prosthesis. I don't say that, that <laughs> you shouldn't use it, but uh, 
Yeah. But that's the, exactly the, these the are also hidden costs. market yeah. that we that we made. Yeah. We also okay. need some time to prepare the prosthesis. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> but that can be done in the meantime. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Alex, I read the paper publication about the uh, struts prosthesis made by titanium. Uh, was it done by uh, by Ugo Fisch years ago? And, and you do you use it? Or? Yes, this is uh, this was introduced by Ugo, and um, it was used uh, for a while. But it has not been used widely internationally, so it uh, um, the production has been abandoned. And also, I think um, if I if I use a titanium prosthesis, I would prefer to use a um, a clip prosthesis, uh, tit uh, like a, um, a smaller clip prosthesis that you showed, um, which has a lighter weight. It has also a better see-through um, possibility. You can actually see what's happening, and and uh, also for the OR, we try to have as as, as uh, not too many prostheses, um, not too many different prostheses uh, that uh, NDR have to be kept. Okay. Uh, Daniel, Daniel, do you have experience with your one hand surgery with uh, clip prosthesis or other titanium prosthesis? Yes, yes. Uh, um, I, I use the titanium, but uh, really few cases, honestly, but I have experienced it. And uh, it's, it's possible to perform also with one hand. Probably is more is easier with respect to remodeling incus, performing endoscopic uh, uh, titanium prosthesis. Um, because uh, it, it's true that uh, in order to perform a remodeling incus, you need the experience, you need the skill in order to understand the, the right uh, the right size and shape of uh, your prosthesis because uh, you you need to measure the distance between the stapes and the malleus. It's really important also the condition of the tendon of the malleus because the tendon of the malleus is really important to fix your prosthesis between the malleus and the, and the stapes. But I have experience also in, in titanium. It's, it's, it's with the endoscope. Okay. Um, I'd like to go back to the design of the different prosthesis. I'd like to share my screen. I hope that it works. Um, yes, you can find us several designs from the Kurtz companies. Now my question is, we spoke about clip or not clip and the stable head. Um, some, as we, as we developed the clip prosthesis, many people said, oh, it's dangerous uh, to the stable head because we have here flexible arms and it could come necrosis. And um, so people who fear necrosis at the stable head prefer maybe this prosthesis. So my, my question is um, today, uh, do you more trust clip prosthesis and why? Chris? Yeah, um, well, I think I said it already, really. You know, when I went to the clip, the suddenly my results got a lot better. And so I completely, uh, I'm much, much keener on the clip. It's much more stable. I've used bell prostheses in the past. They've displaced, they've tilted. Um, so I, I think the, the, the key thing of this prosthesis is the clip. I have seen one case of necrosis. Um, but generally, the, you know, I've been using them a long time. It doesn't seem to be a major issue. Uh, so I'm very, very keen on the clip. Uh, do you remember any cases where you don't want to use a clip? Uh, no, actually, it was interesting um, when uh, Marcus was talking about using the bell with the facial nerve. What I tend to do, the, these feet, if you haven't, for people who haven't used it, the feet are incredibly thin and you can move them quite easily. So I've bent them out of the way. I've tilted them. I've 
change them so if i'm close to the facial nerve i can take the those feet that are against the facial nerve out of the way so i i, I never i never use it in fact i don't to be honest i don't have a bell in yeah. my uh in my theater okay so we have a mechanical uh, advantage of the clip that's a stainless head but i agree we don't use it sometimes when we have an uh, a prolapse of the facial nerve and the facial nerve contacts the stabis, then um, I would not use a uh, tuprosis, I would use a bell prosthesis. Um, uh, the uh, advantage, another advantage for the clip prosthesis, in my opinion, is that you have a stable point during your reconstruction, for example, in reticle cavities. Uh, once you had to cre uh, create a new tumoric membrane with cartilage and so on, then you have a stable point uh, in the middle of the ear and you can overlay uh, this uh, head of the prosthesis with cartilage and that's very easy. Um, and, uh, in my opinion, it has an advantage as a prosthesis. We prefer that to this picture of Pat's procedures. Thomas, we've got some yeah, interference in Yes. Professor Tsang, some holes in microphone obviously bring some interference. Yeah. No, maybe it applies the headset again. Can you hear me now? No, it's just a lot of distortions. Okay, so why yet? No. Es wird nicht besser. Vielleicht noch mal kurz das Headset probieren? Ja. I think it depends from... No, it works. Ah, much better. No, works. Better? Ja, viel besser. Perfekt jetzt. Um, so now, now it's better. You can hear me. Perfect. Um, okay. Um, I don't know if you have my screen yet now, but uh, I wanted to show you the variac prosthesis and uh, the possibility to measure the length of the prosthesis. And my question is to you: How often you use it? Uh, it takes also time and how often you use it and why you use it. Yeah, Chris. Uh, so I, I use those little, so the the variac prosthesis for people who don't know, it, it comes with a, a, dump, a set of uh, plastic dummies of different lengths that vary by half a millimeter, but you can actually buy the dummies without the variac prosthesis. And I use those as my measuring when I'm using the partial clip. So that I, you just get the, the that little blue plastic disc with all the, the dummies. You can get that separately, and I use that uh, find the right length and then and then choose the appropriate clip. Yes. So the right length, on my opinion, has uh, is a philosophy of tension, yeah, or of pretension of the unwrap ligament. If you want to, if you want to. Uh, prevent the pretension of the annual ligament, then you should measure the length. Um, in some cases of revision surgery, um, once you dissected the, the uh, lateral attic, attic wall uh, before, and you made a revision surgery, then and sometimes the top prosthesis was lifted up, or you can find that it was lifted up, uh, because you get a lateral, lateralization of your membrane. Uh, what would you do in such a case? When you have a, before inserted the top prosthesis and uh, then uh, you find the lateralization. It's not the topic of pop, I know, but um, it could be also happened in pops. Yeah? Do you change the prosthesis or do you uh, push something between, for example, cartilage or Omega connector in the revision surgery. 
I would, I would, in such a case, um, I would, I would uh, use a longer prosthesis. Um, in in many cases, probably there is also some cart already some cartilage between the eardrum and the prosthesis. And um, apparently the, uh, the eardrum has lateralized and if it heals, it will lateralize again um, with time. So uh, I don't think it's, it's possible to use the same prosthesis and not put anything in between. Um, but uh, if, you, if you use a longer prosthesis, then you have the same assembly as before, which is mm -hmm. probably from an acoustic standpoint of view, the best situation. Okay, the problem of lateralization, everybody is seen who is using a uh, pop or top with uh, coupling to the stable's head or to the foot plate. My question is to the friends of the strut prosthesis, Jack and, uh, and also Alex. Uh, my question is, do you see a dislocation of a strut once you have a lateralization of your membrane? Could it happen or not? Alex? Shall I go first? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course it can happen. Um, everybody has lateralization of the, of the eardrum. And um, in these cases, you just lose contact between uh, the, the tympanic membrane and the stapes. And um, I don't think this is something that depends on, on the prosthesis. It depends on the, on the healing process. And in these cases, I, I think we yeah. need to go in and, uh, and do a revision, use a different prosthesis. Okay, also in case of struts. Yeah. So uh, number one, I agree with Alex that if you're going to deal with a secular head fixation, again, you want to remove the acicular heads and then deal with the tensor tympani. But ordinarily, when that isn't the case and I'm putting a strut in, I like to leave the tensor tympani in to maintain that retraction onto the malleus so that even if you're getting some lateralization of the drum around it, the malleus position tends to remain the same. Conversely, we more often see retraction of the drum because of eustachian tube dysfunction. So again, with the struts, um, we rarely have these issues uh, relative to both the lateralization or medialization of the drum. So leaving in the tensor tympani when I can, uh, I will to maintain that same relationship between malle malleus stapes and foot plate. Okay, good. Um, we have two questions from the audience, that's right. Uh, we have more, two of them are related to the bone cement. The first one is if anyone has experience with using bone glue to fix the incus with the stapes to avoid dislocation, and I just add the second one, maybe it can be discussed together if there have been any issues with dropping automimics on the facial nerve round window or the foot plate. Oh, good. Carbant, you have uh, had yeah. one? No, I, I don't want to add, I just want to make uh, one and a half comment. Uh, I just remembered, I just calculated. When I designed the clip mechanism, clip prosthesis in 19, 1996, three years in Dresden, I came from this uh, old Incos uh, sculpturing and all this stuff. And I wanted to make it simple, very simple, just press it down and keep it. And I'm very happy that Kurz, Kurz company should light a candle now. It's 25 years ago. Mm -hmm. It's the anniversary, <laughs> quarter of a century already. And well, the, the idea behind, and this is why I came my second idea, um, we put it directly on top of the stapes to prevent any dislodgement anteriorly, especially if the promontory is very high. And this is why, although in temporal bones, the attachment to the malleus handle is a bit better for high frequencies. I think in the long term <clears throat> of a prosthesis in the middle ear, stability is the most important part. And so if you put it just on top of the stapy head, you, you are nearly sure to prevent any attachment, any attack to the promontory if you try to go to the malleus. And then came the objections. They said, oh, if you have only the posterior half of the tympanic membrane collected by cartilage towards the prosthesis, you will only get half of the information, half of the sound pressure, half of the energy. That is very bad. But 
then I always, then you just must calculate what means half, if you lose half of the sound pressure and half of the energy, it is only three to six decibel due to the logarithmic uh, cal uh, work functioning of the middle ear. So this is why uh, looking at the stability and not losing very much energy, I think this is the advantage of the clip prothesis. Security first. This was my comment to the clip prothesis. So. Okay. Um, maybe we have later time to discuss again the problem of uh, gluing and of cement. Um, I'd like to go forward with, uh, with the type 3B reconstruction, it means top reconstruction, and I'd want to give you a small, um, in, a small lecture to coming in into this theme and give my screen, yes, okay. So um, 3B reconstruction means that we have a columella directly between the foot plate and the malleus handle or between foot plate and malleus handle and with contact to the malleus handle. But because of the columella, we have the risk of dislocation coming from the atmospheric pressure chains uh, during uh, Valsava maneuver or blowing your nose. Uh, this could looks like here in this video that the prosthesis lifts up from the foot plate and could be dislocated uh, also from the foot plate. So uh, we need. Um, on the other hand, that is a sound. We can't hear the sound, Thomas, because you've got your headset on. Oh, sorry. Okay, uh, you can hear me? Yeah. Yes, microphone works again. So we have a small change of the position at the foot plate. It's an experiment only with a microphone in the round window niche. Um, but we have I fixed here the prosthesis at the membrane, and then I uh, changed the position at the foot plate. And what we can hear is that a little change of the position has an influence of the sound transmission. So. Uh, that it makes sense to fix the, uh, the tall prosthesis at the foot plate. In former times, it was done by soft tissue. Uh, Carl van Tuttenbrink developed such a punch. It's a cartilage punch with a cartilage shoe. And uh, it can um, centralize the prosthesis in the middle. And on the other hand, we have the omega connector and the omega connector um, can be placed in the middle of the foot plate and it works like a joint. Um, you can also uh, direct it, your prosthesis to the malleus handle or the tympanic membrane. And once you give under pressure to the foot plate, uh, in this experiment, we have a slippage here from the omega connector at the foot plate, but also a lift up and down in the joint. So it helps a little bit during under pressure in the ear, kind of over pressure in the middle ear uh, to stabilize um, the, uh, the top. And the other point is the length of the prosthesis. We talked already about it. The length has influence indirectly to the tension or pretension of the annual ligament. And we know as from uh, otis sclerosis, if we have a stiffening of the annual ligament, then you get an airborne gap in the low frequencies. We don't know how the ligament is changed over the time, but uh, our philosophy is to prevent such an overtension um, or pretension at the annual ligament. So I'd like to give the field free 
to the next videos. And I'm glad that now Robert Vincent is in the panel. And he asked me to start with the first uh, video on top reconstruction because um, he's busy today as everyone everywhere. Hello, how are you? I'm fine. I'm very happy to be part of this. It's great pleasure and be part of Chris again, like following Lion and all my friends. And it's just, just a real pleasure. So you asked me to talk about the maladies replacement prosthesis. So I'm going to share the screen and we can start with this. Uh, I guess it's going to be uh, fine. Let me check what I come forward. It. Yeah, there we go. So that's the plan is to uh, talk about this mileage replacement procedure, which is supposed to um, replace the mileage. The point is that uh, I've been uh, seeing many cases where there was this uh, problem, sorry about that, uh, where I had this problem with uh, lots of um, problem with the uh, absence of mileage, where there is, in my opinion, a great difficulties to be able to stabilize any type of reconstruction. So that was the aim to rebuild the new malice with the malice replacement prosthesis, with a, a prosthesis which I designed with quartz, which, may, which is made in titanium and can be inserted all around uh, the external auditory canal. So it can be used for Austin cartouche group D, which means absence of malice and stapes with a mobile full plate. And originally that was the uh, specific condition where I defined uh, this use of these malleus prosthesis, as you can see, we can make two holes through the bony canal wall, in, in, inserting the two hooks, and then using the new malleus handle, which is very flexible, uh, to stabilize the torque with the cartilage interposition. So this is definitely a steam cartouche group D. You can see a mobile foot plate, and you can see the two hooks, uh, 0.4 millimeter in diameter. So I'm using an 0.6 millimeter diameter burr to perform two holes, two tunnels through uh, the bony canal wall, which is at uh, 11 o'clock and 12 o'clock, because that's the left ear. And because of this wire shape, we have this flexibility, allowing the surgeon to place the new malice on the right position, whatever you have in terms of anatomical condition. And then of course, you can stabilize any type of uh, porps or torps to this uh, MRP. Uh, and it, again, you need to interpose cartilage because it, this is made in titanium. This is another case which is pretty interesting right here. Revision operation with a dislocated incus transposition. But the point is that there is no more bone in the attics, which means that we cannot use, uh, we cannot place the MRP at 12 o'clock. So I'm going to put it at 6 o'clock. I just wanted to show you this because you can adapt this uh, technique in, to most of the situations. So we need to plan to make a, uh, to drill out uh, to make a plan area like this and then we can again uh, create the two holes to be able to insert the two hooks and then changing the position of the manage which is at six and not at, at 12 but that's the same thing uh, the aim again is to stabilize the reconstruction uh, so you see i'm using a torque which 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 is having a, cent a central groove which fits nicely underneath the mali sandal. If you have a lateralized tympanic membrane, in the past we did, uh, of course, uh, skin grafting. But what I do now, I just leave the, the, the drum where it is and I'm just placing uh, the MRP uh, uh, a little bit uh, over uh, in, in the external auditory canal at a high level. And then, of course, I stage the, the, the reconstruction and I, uh, six months later, we use a torque. We also can use uh, the MRP in case of group F, which is the worst of the worst, absence of ossicular chain. But I staged the procedure here, and we have, after six months, you notice that the flexibility of the MRP is still there. And I'm drilling out the stapes, which is fixed by tympanal sclerosis, allowing me to perform uh, 0.8 millimeter stapidotomy, just like for regular stapes uh, technique. I use a combination, as usual, of laser and micro drill to perform this uh, 0.8 millimeter uh, fenestra covered by the vein graft and then placing a torque uh, from the malleus to stapedonomy. So it's a malleus to stapedonomy procedure, uh, which helps me a lot to get better results. Uh, quite 
I can show you a very uh, short clip, very short slides like this to, to give you a little bit of idea about my results. Uh, I published this in 2012. That was the preliminary result for this MRP. I will publish soon a new bigger series. I wanted to compare in, in case of absence of mice and stapes, what was my result? Uh, that is prospective study, in fact, between uh, tympanic membrane to full plate without the MRP. That was before 2009 when I introduced the MRP compared to the uh, uh, managed the MRP to full plate. Uh, so you have 34 Ks, 58 Ks uh, on both sides. So the results are this one after at, at three months, I got only 37 plus 11 within 20 dB in the first case uh, compared to the really highest, much better results with the MRP. Uh, but that was, of course, at three months, which doesn't mean anything, but it was interesting to compare both groups. And after one year, you will see that uh, it was even better and, and more in favor of the MRP. The best I could do was like this on the, on the left, as you can see. So worse results, uh, getting worse. And then on the right, it's getting better. And that's, that is my experience in absence of minus and state is what I have now progressively with all my uh, cases uh, of uh, group D. Uh, I also use, uh, uh, so this is the total uh, number of cases which I did with the MRP from 2009 to 2019, with you can see uh, simultaneous TORP or, or total managed piston or PORP and, and 52 cases of MRP to stay epidotomy. And you see the different groups. Um, finally, I just wanted to show you the difference according to the groups. And of course, you see the group D still uh, close to 80% of cases of success rate in absence of malice and state is full plate. And if you look to literature, it's very difficult to find the same rate. Uh, quite good result in group C where the malice is absent and state is present. But of course, group F doesn't give the same result, but this is related also to pathology, but this is better with, than what I had before when I was, uh, when I was performing uh, tympanic membrane to uh, state epidotomy. Okay, that's it. I hope to my, I was not too long. Um, just finished my presentation. Thank you for watching. Thank you so much, Robert. Um, I don't know, uh, you stay in the panel or should we ask you now the question? Because oh, no, I can, I can stay with you. Okay. I'll, be, I'll be at the end with all the friends, okay? okay no so we'd like to continue with Alex. Um, our next speaker is Jan Christoph Lewis. Hello, everyone. I'm going to share my screen with you and show you a video also on, on TORP uh, tympanoplasty, but also starting with the cartilage shoe once again, because uh, for me, um, the uh, TORP uh, almost always comes together with this cartilage shoe, sometimes even connected uh, together with a a omega um, connector. And one of the problems, and you saw it already, is sometimes the remnants of the crura. And in here, you see a case where just the anterior cruise is uh, still present. And then you have a problem to, um, to uh, locate and place your, um, your, your cartilage shoe when it's from, from the original um, cartilage punch coming. But so you just cut off. Um, an edge and then you place it in order to always have your uh, torp foot centralized on the uh, foot plate which you see in here and it's really very stable so without any um, connection to other structures the prosthesis uh, sits nicely in the center of the oval window and you have a nice um, round window reflex as you um, uh, might see here um, and then when um, closing this, I always, uh, as, as most people do, I always um, put some cartilage on top of the um, uh, torps plate, also on, on, on porps plate. Uh, obviously, if you have a well aerated middle ear, sometimes you don't even need a, a piece of cartilage. Um, um, well aerated and nice um, tympanic membrane tolerate uh, prosthesis plates even without cartilage. And then if you have a bigger sort of construction, I even add some very condom to it. 
And then, as you have already also seen before, you remove or rotate the malleus um, handle on top of the prosthesis plate. And um, these, um, these types of um, tympanoplasty type 3B work very well and give the same results like uh, th uh, type 3A. There is no difference um, between torps and porps uh, in my experience. Um, just this one slide once again, of course, you can, uh, and Chris uh, also showed some of these, you can add the uh, Torp Düsseldorf type and also the various procedures with the Omega connector with the Malleut -Nos uh, Notch um, Torp. So you have uh, different um, types of, of settings and combinations um, you can use. We also saw some other non-titanium prosthesis. And now I want to show you a certain uh, a case which you, from time to time, you might um, um, experience that an unsecure foot plate or even a fractured foot plate uh, or a foot plate with micro fractures when you have just removed the cholesterotoma on the oval window. And in here, you see uh, a fractured and now um, a fractured foot plate and now the uh, opened inner ear. And obviously, you, you kind of freeze during surgery and wonder what to do. Uh, can you actually uh, go for any kind of uh, tympanoplasty? Well, there's some literature on it, and some people do it in a single stage surgery, um, putting uh, a certain type of prosthesis on such insecure foot plates. I would uh, actually opt for uh, or decide for a sec uh, two stage uh, surgery here. And what we do is we place um, a cartilage sandwich on there, one closed sandwich or a closed cartilage uh, shoe. Uh, to secure the foot plate, sometimes even added with some perichondrium. Then we have an omega connector in between uh, the two cartilage because there's a second cartilage shoe coming on top of this omega connector. And then you have a big, um, bigger, uh, bigger foil, big, bigger silicone sheeting uh, in here, which has a thickness of, of uh, more than one millimeter. Uh, because normally you otherwise have a medialization of your tympanic membrane and you for a second stage surgery, for the second surgery, you want to have some space in your middle ear to then insert a top prosthesis, which is what you see in the upcoming video then. So like six months afterwards, when we have, when we imagine or think that our foot plate has been secured and hopefully the inner ear is still intact um, uh, with a good uh, and healthy bone conduction, then we go for the second surgery and place this top prosthesis. And what's very nice is that now you have the situation that your omega connector is really very uh, stable inside this oval niche because the uh, um, the second cartilage uh, shoe on top has really stabilized this omega connector and there is no no moving anymore as Chris has just uh, mentioned it that sometimes the single um, uh, omega connector is a little bit difficult to handle on the on the uh, status foot plate. So now this is the revision surgery or the tympanoplasty surgery. You have a nice aerated middle ear with a, uh, and, and the level of your tympanic membrane is already defined. So what I, I, I always use, or in, in most cases use a varial prosthesis because I then can measure the length because you cannot really alter the um, reconstructed tympanic membrane that nicely in the second surgery. But now you can measure the length of the torp and then easily place your uh, Torps foot plate on the Omega connector, which is really very stable inside the oval window niche. And um, then, yeah, as you see here, rotate your prosthesis plate and have a very nice tympanoplasty. And in my experience, those uh, cases where you had a fractured foot plate before, an, an unsecure foot plate and, and, and with danger to your inner ear, Normally, um, in my experience, the um, the results in terms of the, the acoustic results um, are not that good as in um, as with uh, healthy and intact um, foot plates. But nonetheless, they are sufficient, and at least you have a kind of a, a strategy to to manage these uh, cases. So that's it. Thank you. Okay, Jan Christoph, many thanks. And we come to the last video presentation by Carl Bernd Hüttenbrink, please. Carl Bernd. Sorry, there was uh, Marcioni in front of me. You missed him, or he doesn't. No, no, I'm, I'm here. Yeah, so it's not my turn, it's your turn. Okay, sorry, 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 sorry. And 
You are right. Sorry. <laughs> Daniel. Uh, Daniel. Yes. Okay. Can uh, Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. So uh, also during uh, uh, cholecystoma surgery, um, honestly, uh, the the total prosthesis is always uh, a problem because uh, you know uh, we need a fixed prosthesis and in adult also I'm using uh, um, a traditional uh, titanium prosthesis uh, from Kurz uh, but we saw already all uh, the movie but just uh, to uh, to show some uh, video regarding uh, endoscopic approach at the end you can see here uh, a cholesteatoma in, in children in children uh, we always trying to perform uh, everything in the same stage and uh, in the first stage, uh, sometimes I had some problem with the titanium prosthesis and like extrusion. And so uh, in most of the time we are using again the incus in order to uh, performing the total uh, prosthesis. You can see now uh, the condition of uh, the, the patient and look at the infiltration of the oval window from uh, the skin. So it's really important to remove everything from uh, the oval window. And after it's really important for tor, tor prosthesis to check the mobility of the, of the uh, foot plants of the stapes. But you know that is really uh, and unstable sometimes the uh, foot plants of the stapes. And in this case, sometimes it's better to perform in the second loop procedure. And you can see now, uh, the condition of the foot plants and we can check the mobility and we can see that there is a good mobility with also a, a good con conduction uh, from uh, the round window and so we can check the final situation uh, at the end this is the final results and uh, okay the cholesterol is over there so at the end we are in this condition you can see the cavity at the end, and we are using a, a incus uh, just in order to fix the incus in the in the oval window and connecting with the malleus is really important to couple the the, the two bone in order to reach the the right uh, the right fixing uh, stable uh, reconstruction, and only in this way I'm using. Uh, honestly gel form in order to uh, fix everything and the cartilage over the uh, reconstruction. And uh, this is uh, uh, the end of the surgery. And uh, my technique is especially in the first uh, look operation in children when uh, we try to uh, improve also the hearing results immediately. And uh, in the second loop procedure, of course, uh, and in adult, we can use also um, titanium prosthesis, but we uh, are comparing the results between the remodeling incus and uh, the titanium, and uh, we have uh, honestly uh, almost the same results. Thank you very much. Okay, Daniel, thank you so much. And now comes Calvin to break. Now I come. Okay. Um, so uh, this lecture uh, deals with the same same problem that uh, Christopher Lewis already mentioned. Uh, what to do? Well, it's the same procedure. Uh, what to do? But this happens sometimes, rarely, but especially in in clinics where you have a lot of young doctors doing a revision, try, starting with a revision surgery or cholecystoma, and suddenly you're called and then suddenly the foot plate is broken. And what to do in a cholecystoma here is such a thing. You should not place anything directly on top because then you will have an impalement into the inner ear. So uh, we thought of it combining the uh, cartilage shoe in a closed, stick, in cl closed without a central hole and with a central hole and this is, by the way, the only case where I use the Omega connector because I'm always afraid, like Chris showed already, the naked Omega connector on a foot plate, I'm always afraid that it dislodges a little bit sideways and then it stands on the rim of the, uh, of the oval window niche. So you must get a security um, device to prevent any dislodgement of the Omega connector. 
and then you, you heal it, then it heals after half a year. And so you can go in for a second surgery and then, then you can put in your uh, prosthesis. So it is not advancing. Why is it not advancing? I must put my finger here. Yeah. So this is the first video. So this is the case in the surgery. You see the anterior pole is lift. There is, uh, if I move the water in the around window niche, the anterior part here moves and then we take off some, we start a little bit here. In this case, I wanted to prevent any uh, adhesion, the, the posterior malleus, uh, the posterior crust was still there. So I place a different type, a little sculpture type of a neo cartilage foot plate, place the omega connector on top, and then put in the cartilage shoe, because this, you see the omega connector, it could, if I put it, leave it there, it, it could move in any case, anywhere, uh, around in the oval window niche, but perhaps not staying centralized on the in the center of the oval window niche. So put in the second shoe. Here is and and uh, then we place in a one millimeter thick silicone only for this time in this period between the two surgeries to keep the tympanic membrane up. We learned the hard way that if we don't do it, then in the revision in the second stage, the tympanic membrane will be uh, sitting on the omega shoe. You won't have any. A space for putting in a torque prosthesis. And then, of course, uh, building already a cartilage onto the, um, on, uh, under the tympanic membrane to house the uh, plate of the, the, the prosthesis. So, and this is now the second surgery here after, after six months. You've, you look at the omega connector, you see your cartilage shoe in here, and you, you get rid of some uh, scarification there, place in your prosthesis there and it sits uh, centralized on the reconstructed tympanic membrane and then you can place if this was another surgery there we didn't have so such a good uh, posterior tympanic membrane so we place a new cartilage uh, prosthesis cartilage uh, plate underneath the tympanic membrane so the next one is the same which is even better to be seen there you see the round window reflex there and this is when you open up the ear put out the silicone and you have a wonderful ear and a wonderful fixation anchoring point for the torp prosthesis. You put in the torp prosthesis and it flips down and it cannot dislodge from the round window, from the oval window. You see the cartilage shoe is completely embedded in scar tissue. There is no dislodgement. And then you can flip back your tympanic membrane and the prosthesis stands still. Even better would it be with a variant, you're right, with a little. Uh, uh, strut coming out in the center, which prevent any dislocation at the superior part of the plate. Thank you very much. That's it. Okay, Karant, very impressive. Okay. And I think it's a very nice technique to stabilize your prosthesis at the foot plate. Um, so I'd like to come to the discussion. My first question is, I'd like to show you this slide. Um, yes, it's a publication about PORP and TORP. We have a lot of questions. What is better to use PORPs or to use TORPs? And sometimes you have to choose between it once the Stabis head is eroded or when the stabis is banded to the promontory. And in this study, they saw no significant difference between tops and pops. So my question is why we don't use in every case tops or why we don't use in every uh, pops not possible, but tops may be also a good solution. Uh, what is uh, your experience? Tops from the acoustic point of view, are the tops better or the pops better? Covered. We, we already did this uh, research when in 2003 we uh, placed the cartilage shoe. And I wanted to know what is the difference between a naked cartilage shoe in a matched pair of, of uh, patients. Cartilage shoe or a naked uh, torp or compared with a porp. 
And we saw that it's really the, at that time, you must remember, everybody said, oh, TORP is not so good. If the CP superstructure is not there, you will have less good results and so on. And we could show that it is really the anchoring point on the footplate itself. So because we saw the naked TORP, which can dislodge on the footplate, gives less good results as compared to a PORP. But when you fix it, you centralize it with a cartilage shoe, we got the same good results like in a PORP. So okay. this is really the positioning. My question is now to you, because you have a very good experience with this uh, Omega sandwich technique. Um, would it be an option to do top reconstructions in a two-stage surgery a fashion? You mean you mean now in the in the case if there is still steppy superstructure? No, 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 no. no. If, if you have no, no. If you have the uh, if you need a pop reconstruction because you have only a foot plate, yes. then we do now it in one stage surgery with cholesterol surgery and so on. Yes. But from your results or your my impression to your fixation, we need the fixation of of our prosthesis at the foot plate with omega. Would it be an option to do every pop reconstruction in a two-stage surgery? No, 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 no. This, uh, Thomas, this was only the case when you have no intact foot plate. I know. We had, I know. This, we had I know. this measurements. We had uh, the danger. The question is: Is it dangerous to place a normal torp on the foot plate centered in a cartilage shoe? Could that be a risk? For example, for fracturing the foot plate or making a hole into the foot plate, or would it be better to distribute the pressure? with an omega connector on top. And we made these measurements and we could see that in the normal foot plate, that means not in the destroyed or the partial fracture or disrupted, then any force that can act on the middle ear in the daily life afterwards, that means physiological pressures will not be strong enough, will be even tenfold less strong than you need the force you need to fracture an intact foot plate. So you need a nominal connector only in cases where, for example, the center of the foot plate is very thin or uh, where the very lymph is looking through to you already with a little darkness, then I would also use a cartilage shoe, uh, um, an omega connector, but always, this is my impression, always centered in a cartilage shoe to be sure that this omega connector does not dislodge omega connector alone, is not fixed on the, is not stabilized on the foot plate. But with your technique, it's uh, stabilized. That's a foot. Plate. Yes, but it is. You can use it also in a one uh, in a one term technique. Okay. If you you can use it in one one session. Uh, Thomas, Thomas, can we go back to the previous question about the comparison between porps and torps? Yes. Because I had experience with this. You know, I published a paper in Otology and Otology where I was uh, comparing my results between two groups, porps and torps. There's something more than two hundred cases in each groups. And the first one who was uh, introducing the concept of using a torp despite the presence of stability large was Bill Moretz in the US. And I moved to that because I introduced the synastic bending technique, you know. And uh, my results were clearly statistically much better when I was using torp compared to pork, but of course I was not using the Dresden clip. So I moved to a torp because I was using a uh, synastic bending. But I like the Omega concept. Uh, and we discussed that with Carl in the past, I remember that. I think uh, doing that in two stages, like young Christopher showed that, it was very nice because then you have a very sta stable omega when you go back for the second stage and then put a torque in a nice way. Just like the, the way, the same feeling uh, which I follow when I'm doing the MRP in two stages, placing the MRP first and then placing the torque on the second stage. Yes, I think uh, it's a very difficult question because I think the, in the most cases, the biological differences uh, from the middle ears coming from the mucosa uh, and the, the influence of the biology of the mucosa and the ventilation and so is much more larger than the difference between pops and tops in theory. Or are you in, uh, what, what about Alex? from the mechanical point of view. <laughs> yeah, I, I think um, it's it's even more from a stability standpoint of view is, is from my point of view, uh, more important than uh, than the acoustic standpoint point of view. I, I don't, I didn't see much of a difference in, in terms of the acoustic. 
Okay. Um, so we will see. So we can use both, and um, I think our most problem is the mucosa and the ventilation. Uh, another question is uh, to Robert. Robert, you show uh, this Marius replacement prosthesis, and when I saw it in the first time, I cannot imagine how uh, it works. We know from every hole which we put in the mess to eat that it grows together and um, that uh, your fixation of the Marius re replacement prosthesis in the holes is elastic enough um, for the next years, but you show it in your uh, uh, presentation. Did you, um, what, what did you see in revision surgery once you um, made a revision in, in this hall? Is there soft tissue or what is the trick? Mm -hmm. It's interesting. Well, you know, it's like everything in life and Thomas, love also. Sometimes you think it's gonna work and it's not going to work. And the opposite also is the same thing. Uh, well, the thing is with this MRP is that we have this uh, wire shape uh, designed that with Uwe Steinhardt from uh, at, at that time he was uh, working for Kurz. And because of we, we have this wire shape, it makes this flexibility, gives the flexibility with this uh, Mali symbol. And when I do revision or when I do second stage after six months or one year, it's very interesting to see that the, the, the MRP is still very flexible and moving well in terms of the malus. So the two hooks are fixed, but the malus sandal is moving because of flexibility. And we could see, I think you saw that on one of my videos, you could see that the malus prosthesis is connected to the tympanic membrane by fibrous tissue. So it works very well. I mean, the, of course I had some cases of uh, extrusion and they were all related to the fact that there was either a stachy tooth dysfunction, we all know that, and also problems with the cartilage interposition, which was not well placed by myself in the previous operation. But usually the final aspect looks very nice. Okay. Uh, another question to you is, uh, and also to Jan Christoph Lewis, we have seen this case of fracture with food plate, and we have seen in your case the uh, Waincraft. Uh, Reconstruction with Waincraft and the top. My question is, if you have um, a cholestatoma ear, you know that in every middle ear, this cholestatoma is uh, Pseudomonas bacterius. Um, would you use this technique also in these cases or only in cases once you have normal and non-infected mucosa? Well, um, then I, I can say that would be for Jan Christopher. Um, well, it really depends. It's a case by case discussion. Sometimes I would stage the surgery. I would cover the foot plate with the van graft. I don't put any prosthesis in wait for six months and uh, I do a second stage because it happened to me that sometime I put the prosthesis in this situation and the patient uh, experience vertigo and we have to revise and remove the prosthesis. So if we can, I think in this case, specifically in cholesterol surgery, I think it would be better to stage the surgery. Okay. Um, my question on all is, once you have the situation like the Christoph Lewis was shown, you have a cholesterol and then you see during your work that the food plate is fractured or that you have a dislocation of food plate. What is the, the medical uh, management? What, uh, what would you do? You, uh, first give uh, cortisone and antibiotics and uh, then made a stage surgery or what are you doing in these cases? I do that. I do this. Steroids, steroids and antibiotics and then stage. And how much steroids? How many milligrams? Oh, uh, something like uh, we use uh, dexamethasone or solomedrol 120 milligram IV. Uh, for how much? 120 milligram IV. Uh, prednisolone. Uh, Solimedrol, yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, another ideas? Alex? I would stage. Um, I, I prefer the staging or I, I like the staging. If, if it's an unclear situation, um, it's, uh, it's never wrong to, to wait and, uh, and come back. Okay. Um, 
Okay, we have seen also um, the surgery of Daniel, uh, the nice surgery of the children with cholesteatoma. What I recognize is that the preparation technique in endoscopic surgery is a little bit different from set with the microscope. Is that right? Yes, it's right. Uh, um, of course, uh, requiring uh, um, different skill. And uh, nowadays, it's quite difficult for, um, honestly, uh, microscopic basic surgeon. Probably the best way is to try to, try to train the residents to use uh, the endoscope and the microscope, because the problem is not one hand technique. The problem is to coordinate the eye uh, to the monitor, like in the nose uh, uh, surgery. So uh, it's, it's quite uh, uh, different for uh, like the attitude is completely different. And so I think that is not a huge problem to use one hand because the master in the past, when they performed the stapes surgery, they did everything with one hand. So the problem is just uh, the coordination. And so the technique requiring probably uh, uh, um, uh, a really long uh, learning curve uh, with the uh, dissection, endoscopic dissection, uh, and uh, so this is the only problem. But from the, from the principle I learned for cholesteatoma surgery from Carl Van Tuttenbrink, <laughs> that uh, you, you follow the pathology, so that means you made a preparation of your cholesteatoma sac from inside to outside or from outside to inside. But what I have seen in your preparation is that you use the suction to dissect uh, like in a piecemeal technique, say cholesteatoma. Is it, um, you, you control these patients in other um, as a manner? Uh, you do in every case a second look surgery or do you think because you use a microscope as uh, endoscope, you have uh, such a good view that you have no left any uh, epithelium. No, in the majority of the cases, uh, and uh, we are performing also stage procedure because, of course, you you can see also around the corner, but uh, in the cholesteatoma, uh, you need uh, to understand if some residual is inside. So, and the most of the time uh, we are performing a staged procedure. And, uh, but when we have a child, sometimes we are performing one stage and we can follow the patient and performing MRI during the, the time and after we will decide. So, but in the most of the time we perform the first stage and the second stage after one year. Okay, thank you. So we have uh, questions from the audience. Uh, I look see. No, I cannot read anything more. Is there any questions from the surgeons to this topic? I'd like to ask a question to uh, Roberta because you had this uh, impressive number of, uh, I it was like 300 MVPs in 10 years, wasn't it? So yes. could you just once again comment on the, the on your indication for that, were, were all these 300 cases of originally absent uh, malleus handles? What, what, when do you actually use it today? The, the main indication is absence of malleus for sure. Whatever you have with stapes or, uh, or fixed stapes, mobile stapes, when I have absent malleus, I, I use this, this MRP and I stage in most of the cases. I prefer, I compare what I did before with that staging. If I stage, I get better results because of the measurement between uh, malice, the MRP to the full plate. Uh, the other indication would be loose malleus, you know, when you have this malleus like this, or eroded malleus, partially eroded malleus. These are the three indications, but the main one is absence of malleus. Yeah. Okay. So I would summarize that the most uh, surgeons would do a stage surgery in cases of uh, food plate problems like fractures or dislocations and um, made uh, a second surgery after after three months, half a year, around this. At least six months for me, at least. Okay, good. Uh, 
I'd like to come to the next topic and this is well, may I have a comment? Yes, of course. Just a very short comment for those doctors who don't have bariac and who don't measure. For it, I just want to give an advice. I never measure the length, neither of the porp nor of the torp. Why? Because non, so I only need about two, three prothesis length. I have no variac. It is time consuming. I take a normal to normal torp 4.5, and then the rest is can be done with cartilage. Anyhow, we have cartilage slices of different thicknesses already prepared for the tympanic membrane reconstruction. And so we can play around with these different cartilage thicknesses for having the good length or having, having the good niveau for the, uh, for the torp or the pore placement. Just to mention that even if you measure it to fractions of a millimeter, who tells you that afterwards your cartilage is in the correct position? So play around a little bit with the cartilage, then you don't need to have so exact measurement with the torp or pore. Uh, Thomas, Thomas, may I say something? Yes. Um, well, Carl, I like you very much, but I don't like your advice. <laughs> I disagree. I disagree. I really think we need to measure. Um, and I've seen also cases where I, I had to revise. And uh, when I saw the previous surgeon was using a piece of cartilage, uh, which was moving too much and was not good, I really prefer to measure. But uh, again, if I'm, I'm joking. I, I, I'm saying it's my personal vision, of course. You're a great surgeon. I know that. But I prefer to measure. I, 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 I put on my database, I put lots of information, including the distance and the length of my prosthesis, you know, on ONDB. And I found that the vast majority of case for TORP is around 5.5 to 6, uh, sorry, 5, uh, 6 to 6.5. So it, that, but there are many differences in my uh, experience. It's just the point. Yes, I would make a, a diplomatic uh, com comment. Uh, it depends from cases <laughs> because once you made a radical cavity, yes, and uh, reconstruction with a uh, pop, then uh, the measurement is not so important as if you do a revision surgery with an intact membrane. Then you need the measurement, in my opinion, too. So now, the most lovely tema, tema for all surgeons is stable surgery. And I'd like to give you a small presentation about. Uh, mechanical backgrounds and stavis plasty. It's very interesting. Um, it's very good standardized. Um, we have normal mucosa. We have um, a normal tumonic membrane. And so from this point of view, it's standardized. And I think the most used technique is the stability to me. We have a small trauma for the inner ear. And uh, the question is, um, what is the best technique for this to couple it to the long process and to couple it to the hood bed or inner ear? Um, one question is why it works so good, because we replace the full plate against a small piston. And the answer is that we have here the vibration of the malleus and the incus. And once you dissect the, um, the stable superstructure and open the inner ear, then you overbridge the impedance of the annular ligament. So the malleus, uh, the incus vibration, uh, is, and the piston is much more deeper going into uh, the inner ear as once the chain is intact. So the overbridgement of the annular ligament gives the good results. What we need is a free vibration of the incus, and we have also some piston factors in, which influence the mechanics, its mass, friction, stiffness, diameter, and coupling. And one question is, what is a proper coupling? Um, Alex, you did a lot of uh, investigation on it. We did it also in experiments. That's a loose coupling here uh, with a shift, vibration shift between the loop and the long process. And that is a good coupling. And uh, you did, did publication about it. It's, it's made 
uh, around uh, between 10 and 15 decibel on some frequencies. And the solution is uh, our prosthesis with uh, self climping or crimping mechanism or with um, memory metals. And we can also see here in this publication uh, by Archan the uh, improvement and the advantage of a, um, a nitinol piston airborne gap is after nine months much more less than in a, um, in a classical titanium piston. So also the clip mechanisms at the long process are important and give us a standard in the, the coupling. That's important. Once you do it by hand, you have no defined uh, uh, coupling forces. Once you use a preformed prosthesis, you have more defined forces. Yes, and uh, I think it makes around 50 to 20 decibels. Another question is the diameter of the piston. What is the right diameter? And um, the problem is if you have if you have a large dia uh, piston and small in the low frequencies, you can see no difference. But in the higher frequencies, the piston has done much more work against the impedance of the fluid, and then the smaller one have some advantages. And um, so the best um, the question is what is the best diameter and what is the best ceiling? I have some hypothesis about this and I want to go um, to this topic too deep, but we did investigations on the diameter and found out that the higher the diameter, the better is the transfer function. So one question today is what are you using for diameters? But before I find an answer to this question, I want to open the uh, video presentation. And I want to please, uh, the first speaker is again, Robert Vincent. For once you want to be the number one, you have the number one in this session. For everything. <laughs> so uh, let, let's uh, share my, my screen now. So the plan here is to uh, present according to what you asked me, Thomas, um, my experience in stapy surgery with my technique. And of course, as you know, I, I, I never say that my technique is the best one. I'm just showing what I'm doing. And what I want to do is to uh, present the technique for uh, the basic case and then the complication. This is why I'm entitled it basic to complication. So uh, the first step, I just explained the technique I'm using, which is the First step is to separate the joint. This is a transcanal approach, like all my surgery. So I'm separating the joint first using a joint knife prior uh, determining the malleus increased mobility like this. And then the step is fixation like this from the top of the head. Then as you know, I use a combination of laser and macro drill using now CO2 of luminous Sotola system, but whatever, uh, vaporizing the posterior cruise and then the anterior cruise and I'm not cutting the superstructure with a laser. I, I like to use the combination. And of course the laser helps me to facilitate the drilling up procedure. And then I measure, I think even in stapes is very important to use the stapes measuring rod to determine the length. And then the step of the stapidotomy again is a combination of uh, laser. We'll always will handle the problem. I never use a micro manipulator uh, to perform a, a spot now with the lumen is it's only one spot, which is very nice, followed by a uh, drilling out procedure like this. So I use a 0.7 millimeter verb, creating 0.8 millimeter stapedotomy. And, and of course, the specific C of our technique is the vein graph, which is the cost technique interposition. And then the piston, the vein is taken from the, from the dorsal face of the hand. And the, you know, the end, the tissue side should face the foot plate. So I use the cost Teflon piston, the basic one 0.4 millimeter in diameter so the shaft is introduced within the stapedotomy first then the loop around the anchors and crimped around the anchors with the hooks or uh, the, 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 the curve forceps and then i'm looking for the bending sign the piston should bend but not move that's important if it's too short then you can see the piston moving away from the stapedotomy 
this is a very basic step. Now, the complications. I'm not going to talk about all complications, but the first one will be obliterate table to the, the only difference, and I showed that during the line uh, live surgery on Tuesday, is to drill uh, differently. I'm not performing a straightforward stay epidermis, but I am enlarging the drilling out until I reach the, the blue line and then creating a uh, fenestra. The disinfection nerve, we need to drill out the promontory like this to increase the approach and to have a better approach and safer approach until I reach the full plate and then I perform the stay epidermis. And the second point is the, the usual process, which I use is different. I use a, um, this process which goes underneath the lenticular process of the incus, which is not the same because with the piston, then the shaft will be in contact with the, with the fascia. And then if I have a simultaneous malleus ankylosis, like in this case, then I would do, of course, the malleus relocation technique and do a malleus to stay epidotomy procedure. So we need to dissect the malleus first to separate the malleus from the tympanic membrane. And then after having removed the incus, relocating the malleus by overstretching the anterior ligament and then measuring the distance from malleus to foot plate and then creating a stay epidotomy. Same, 0.8 millimeter, followed by Van Graaff, which I think is mandatory if you use a, a torp. Uh, and the torp with a uh, HA Teflon torp is inserted between the malleus and the uh, stay epidotomy. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much for watching again. Thank you so much, Robert. And um, we see the next, the next uh, video coming from Chris. That's right. Sorry. No, is that Chris? No, is that no. Chris Lewis? I think. No, no, Chris, not not me. No, it's uh, coming from Cesar. Cesar? Yes, do you hear me? Yes. Okay. I go. Okay, this case is a case of total patinectomy, but not in a case of, of otosclerosis. It's a, timp a severe oval window tympanosclerosis and with the NMP myelus notch prosthesis. You will see this is also a young boy, 13 years old, with many history of otitis, with vomits, with a previous tympanoplasty when he was 10 years old that suffers this kind of hearing loss, a transmissive hearing loss. And look at the, the CT scan. This is the transposed incus that is fixed to the promontorium. The oval window is filled with sclerosis, and the other point is the head of the of the malleus is fixed to the to the attic. This is a right ear. You see the incus has been removed, and the point the point of this case is we we found a severe tympanic sclerosis in the staves, in the malleus, in the whole cavity. And uh, the point is, if you if uh, we talk to the father, if the we need a surgery because this is a high risk procedure because we can have a sensory neural uh, damage, and we talk about that, the possibilities, and they agree to make surgery, and we did. The first thing we did was put the head of the of the malleus, as you see here. And then we explore the oval window. We have a completely extensive, uh, massive flakes. In these times, we I would prefer to go home and not do the work, but we, we tried to do it. And we began with the, removing the place surrounding the, the staves. You see calcification of the tendon. And with patient and carefully dissection, we, 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 were, we remove the whole quantity, the, 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 the most quantity of the, of the plaques you see here. All the bone is fragile. You see the head of the steps is very easy to, to remove. And when we remove the sclerosis in between the crudas, we have we see, we saw the the 
the full plate. It was a so a nice vision. And when we continue with the removing of the sclerosis, this is the posterior cura. You see, this is a weird case. And we continue with the same procedure. And the point is we when to arrive to remove, and we see the, like here, the vast part of the foot plate, we decided to stop to decrease the risk of sensory neural uh, hearing loss, uh, we perform a huge or big proctinectomy of the, of the of the two the, the the posterior part of the of the of the foot plate as you see here. The procedure was quite aggressive, but we performed with with care and. Once we have removed the posterior uh, proteinectomy, we put the uh, pericondium, you will see. And after that, place of the prosthesis. We usually measure, but we put always 4.5. I don't know if I measure properly, but always put 4.5 NPM prosthesis, and you will see here, it fits properly. This is the handle of the malleus, and, the, the, and this is the, the, the good measure. And finally, we put the cartilage, and I will show you the, the, the result. because we have a, a, a considerable improvement. You will see now. This is pre-op, three months with uh, good result, but year, a year later, a year worsening in the low frequencies. And that's all, thank you. Okay, that was a very nice case of tumor sclerosis and the management of huge tumor sclerosis. Thank you so much. And Alex, we have the next case. All right. Um, let me share my screen and start the video. So what I would like to show you is a, um, a stapedotomy classical autosclerosis. And I uh, show you the 90 bone prosthesis that you have uh, showed before. And um, this prosthesis has been developed for um, long-term st long stability on one hand, and also for standardization in the uh, fixation process. It has these four distinct points of contact, free zones, and um, it also, uh, for these free zones allow for the um, uh, blood supply to the lenticular process <clears throat> through the uh, mucoperiosteum. And um, you can see here the tympanoplasty, you can, uh, the uh, opening of the tympanomiatal flap, and you can see the malleus already that is um, now moves nicely. Sometimes we can keep the corda attached to the tympanic membrane, but uh, sometimes um, it's better to uh, move it off the tympanic membrane so you have a better view, and then do a small posterior tympanotomy uh, until you can see the facial nerve down here and the lenticular process here. And if you see that, you have always enough space um, to do whatever you need to do. And now this is the uh, view onto the foot plate. I always measure. I, I think it's very important to measure, uh, particularly in stapy surgery, because there will be no change in the length. Um, so you can really um, put the, the right length, of course, cut the um, incutus the pedial joint and um, then remove the stapy suprastructure with the, di with the diet laser. You can see here um, cutting the, um, the, the tendon and the posterior cross and now the anterior cross you can um, use with this nice hand piece. You can get um, to the anterior cross and, and, and cut it um, so that even in, in uh, only light autosclerosis uh, you can you can be sure that you don't uh, get a, um, a foot plate that um, that is floating, 
And uh, then I also used the laser to make a small hole into the foot plate and use the drill. Uh, similarly, as you've um, seen uh, by Robert, uh, to, to make the hole round and smooth um, with this micro drill. And uh, then uh, you can see how this this nice hole. And now this is the prosthesis that comes um, uh, in two parts. One is the dummy prosthesis that you can see here. You can use this dummy prosthesis to calibrate the laser. Um, so it's a 19 all prosthesis. When you heat it, it will, it will close. And um, then there is a parking part uh, where you can put the prosthesis, grab it um, with a, a little hook and then put it in. So this is always the uh, the uh, most difficult part or most important part, at least I think in stapy surgery, how is the um, prosthesis fixed to the incus? So you can place it into the, into the stapedotomy hole and park it here on the incus and then uh, put it to the right position um, with, with a little hook. Um, you can see there is still a little, um, a little bit of uh, mucosa, mucosal fold, a little that needs to be removed uh, before the prosthesis can be properly placed. Voila. And now uh, the prosthesis can be put in, in the, on the right spot, having it almost the right angle, and then um, use the laser to fix it. And as you can see, those free zones, or the, the heat active zones, uh, have no contact to the mucoperiosteum so that the heat is not transferred. And um, it closes from the anterior part uh, to the posterior part. You can, uh, that these are these three heat active zones um, that, that, are, that are fixed. And then the prosthesis has a, um, a very good fixation. Um, you can see everything moves nicely. And um, then I use some, uh, some blood of the patient that has already uh, been on the foot plate to, um, uh, to seal it. And that's, that's my five minutes. Yes, thank you so much. With one of the best prosthesis, Stavis Plasti, thank you so. Um, okay, we go forward and I like to look. And the next in the alphabet is uh, Jan Christoph Lewis. All right, I'm going to show you my screens uh, talking about Stapes Plus. Um, uh, these three types of um, Stapes prosthesis you already got to know in the talk of uh, Thomas Sarnet. Um, uh, basically, there are three mechanisms. Uh, like crimping, clipping, and heating, as you just saw with Alex Huber. Um, and uh, the, the procedures related to these are uh, those from the Kurz um, uh, company, are the K piston, the Niti Flex, and the Niti Bond. And all these, uh, these uh, three types of procedures uh, do actually fulfill the requirements for stapes plasty in terms of, let's say, biotolerance, biostability. Uh, weight, of course, the weight of the human stapes is about, I think, like 2.8 milligrams, and all these also have this this weight and rigidity and handling and and smooth design, of course. So I'm now going to talk about the um, the Niti Flex procedures, which is my personal favorite, I must say, for stapes surgery. Meanwhile, uh, or by now, um, this clipping mechanism is something we we know from middle ear surgery from the uh, clip partial prosthesis and it just works very well as you can just clip it onto the incus long process um, the clip up here uh, is made of, um, of of super elastic nitinol with, while the uh, the shaft is made of uh, pure titanium and in my opinion it uh, this procedure just allows a very straightforward and standardized procedure uh, important to remember when um, we're moving this um, prosthesis onto the long, uh, the incus long process, the movement should go anteriorly and a little bit inferiorly uh, towards the promontory so that the clip really uh, nicely opens up and you then need uh, less pressure. Uh, before showing you my video, I just want to mention that I have 
used all these uh, three types of uh, prosthesis many times and although the Niti Flex is my personal favorite uh, the uh, or, or the one I use most often I think that all these prosthesis work actually nicely and and all have their reason to to exist eventually in in my opinion and what you should always keep in mind is that the most decisive uh, decisive factor for successful surgery is not the type of prosthesis but the uh, surgical experience with a specific type of procedure and the general experience, uh, experience or expertise in um, uh, in um, microsurgical techniques. So now I'm going to show you um, a video, which would be I just need to change to the other screen. There we go. So um, I'm going to skip all these um, procedures and steps uh, to to prepare the oval window to to remove the staples. I, I have already prepared my perforation in the staples foot plate. Um, I always or in most cases use micro perforators for, for these uh, cases then. And now what I just want to um, concentrate on is this uh, this dance with the prosthesis, how to insert this prosthesis and where are the advantages of this uh, Niti Flex prosthesis. So I, actually I always it sometimes you know it just takes seconds, but sometimes it it might take minutes to really get your status prosthesis, uh, in my experience, to the right position. Sometimes it might even uh, dislocate and go beyond the level of the of the bony ear canal wall, and you must find it once again with your hook, and and just to get it into the right position is can be really challenging in my uh, experience. Uh, this is a a real speed, a true speed uh, video. Uh, where you can see me, uh, uh, let's say, struggling to uh, get this prosthesis uh, into the right place. But what I want to show you is that, well, this dance with the prosthesis can be challenging in the beginning, but what is really nice about this Niti Flex prosthesis is that once you have it in the right prosthesis, then there is no dance anymore, and you don't have this dance with the prosthesis by, um, by fixating it uh, onto the incus long process, as you will see now, once we have the foot uh, of the prosthesis inside the uh, perforation. And um, now we have good contact to the incus long process. And then uh, you, uh, you take a small hook, put it into the right place of this prosthesis in between the two posterior uh, um, um, little um, areas. And then you just clip it onto the uh, incus long process. And as soon as you have this little uh, thing here on the th center of the incus long process, then you know that your prosthesis is correctly um, placed. And once again, your your movement uh, goes towards uh, anteriorly and a little bit medially. Uh, and now you can uh, just check whether uh, you have um, a good uh, contact. Uh, but before that, I always uh, make sure that my um, my prosthesis shaft is in the right position inside the perforation. The perforation is always done in, in, in uh, what I always, always do. I always don't put it in the center of the prosthesis of the stapes foot plate, but in the posterior third, because then you uh, have more or less no risk to get in contact with the otolith organs, which are in the anterior and superior area of the foot plate. Uh, foot plate. So you um, really place your, was that actually visible? So you try to uh, move your prosthesis shaft towards the posterior edge of your perforation, as you just saw. And so you have some, still some possibilities to, to do some movements which you're, with your Nitiflex prosthesis clipped onto the Ingus long process. And now you really see that you have a stable contact by seeing that actually your, the, uh, the uh, prosthesis shaft here uh, is actually doing a movement, not just uh, medially into the uh, perforation, but it goes slightly anteriorly, and that tells you that your um, that your um, malleus incus joint is already intact because of the rotational axis. Uh, this should be the movement you should hear, uh, you should see once you clip on, uh, once you once you touch the uh, long incus process, and uh, I then end up with uh, some connective tissue uh, surrounding my uh, the prosthesis shaft inside the. Um, oval window niche to just cover uh, the perforation. Normally perforation in my cases is 0.6 and then I insert an 0.4 um, um, diameter uh, prosthesis and that works fine in my hands. So that's it.
Thank you very much. And Christopher, and now the last, uh, not least, is coming from Carl van Hüttenbrink. Oh, Daniel Marcioni is in front of me. Sorry, I forget every time. Daniel. <laughs> well, Marcioni is nearly like Hüttenbrink, so no. Sorry. <laughs> No, from the alphabet, I think. Okay. Uh, we have no sound. Daniel, Daniel. Daniel, we have no sound. Your mic is out. Okay, okay, okay. I'm here. Sorry. So uh, endoscopic uh, stapes is a particular topic because uh, you can do endoscopic uh, stapes, but of course it's quite uh, uh, challenging. And you need to correct the, the, the posterior wall of the um, tympanic cavity in order to have a good movement during uh, your surgery. Uh, really simple, before I had cut the, the tendon of the stapes and after I cut the posterior crura, really simple, uh, directly like this, and anterior crura I have to remove uh, with the hook. And after this, uh, we can uh, check uh, the foot plants and uh, I'm performing uh, with the skeeter a uh, 06 uh, uh, hole, and after I can put the prosthesis. It's really important uh, to, uh, to use uh, um, uh, uh, coarse prosthesis with open, with open uh, 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 part. You can see this is the hole. And when you have to put the prosthesis, you have to uh, bring the prosthesis with the suction and uh, put inside the hole like this. And after you can uh, put in uh, before in the hole and after over the incus. And this is the traditional technique endoscopically and you have to crimp, of course. And this is the surgery, uh, surgery is finished. Uh, you can check the movement of the prosthesis really close. And so it's uh, the great advantage is the possibility to see in a really close view. And uh, I found that this technique uh, really nice, especially for a uh, condition like this, when uh, you have, uh, for example, a uh, descent of the facial nerve, and this is the elevation of the flap. And you can see now, the condition of the fixing stapes and uh, look the dashes here of the facial nerve over the, um, the crura. And so the correcting is really important. After this, and uh, you have to see the facial nerve, you have to cut the tendon and look uh, the, the facial nerve is really, really close to, uh, touching uh, the posterior crura. And you can see here the dashes. After you have to remove uh, the, um, the silver status of the stapes and look here the facial nerve and you have to perform the hole uh, looking for the facial nerve and this is the, the, the hole and after you can put uh, also the prosthesis and it's really important to have uh, this close view and the detail just in order to see the, the situation of the facial nerve when you put the prosthesis because it's really important that the prosthesis don't touch or don't push the facial nerve. And this is the crimping. Also in the malformation or in the revision surgery, I think that is really important because you can have some cases like this. This was a revision surgery and look at the tympanic cavity was really difficult to, to manage. So in my view is to looking for the facial nerve, looking for the round window in order to have a right orientation. You have to remove the mucosa and you have to drill in the oval window that now there is a obstruction because of the obliterative autosclerosis. And so step by step, really close, you have to looking for the, 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 the right position of the oval window until you can find, of course, the, the vestibule like this. And after this, you can put the prosthesis. It's really 
important to have a right orientation in these cases and endoscopically in my hands I can help uh, I can have some help with the, the endoscopic view especially in these challenging cases so thank you uh, very much thank you very much for this very nice pictures and it's very impressive and we will discuss this at the end but now Carl van Schittenbrink well, I want to concentrate, wait, will I fix it? A little bit, a little bit on the, oh, that doesn't move. A little bit on the crimping here. The, the, this is crucial, whatever you, we learned this, whatever you place in between the long incus process and the stapes foot plate, is regardless. We had very good results also with the shoe plate via prosthesis and whatsoever. But we learned, and this was Alex Hubers also who showed us, we learned that the most important part is the good coupling from the long incus process to the wire loop. And therefore, crimping was until 10, 20 years the only possibility to fix it. We had all these different prosthesis on the market and they all had to be crimped. And I must admit, I am still crimping. But this was always considered as the most difficult movement or maneuver in the middle ear, crimping the prosthesis on the long incus process. And this is why these new nitty bond, nitty flex and whatever there is are much easier to use, especially for beginners in stapes surgery. And there's a new prosthesis, which I'm using since some time, which is made all completely like this one from nitty flex. That means you just put it on and press it down because it's so very soft and it clings to the long incus process. But we don't talk about that now. We talk about the problem of crimping here. And uh, this was always my concern. When you crimp, when you take the McGee forceps here, for example, this is the McGee wire crimper. And when you crimp, you will always connect it only on two parts here. And there, due to the elasticity of the material, it will always go out a little bit. So you will never have this mechanically stable uh, anchoring like uh, Alex Huber showed, which was so important not to lose any decibel of hearing. So with the, my, with the McGee fire forceps, it is not good because it's not working. So we designed in Dresden, we designed uh, another type of crimper that looks a little bit round and that crimps around, that wraps, that wraps around the um, wire loop around the Ingus long process. And uh, you can see this you can you can uh, verify if you have really a very good contact here of the prosthesis to the long incus process by just checking. You must, uh, Dr. Lewis just mentioned it, uh, in these movements when we take the needle and we move the, the incus inward outward due to the rotation around the rotation and axis, the tip, if there's really a 100% fixed uh, anchoring, that means there is no mechanical loose contact, then this piston, the lower edge of the piston, should move in the oval, in the round, in the perforation, not in and out, but up and down. Look at this point down here. Here you see when I move up and down, when I press it in, inwards pressing means upward. Can you see that how it moves inside the perforation? And this means there is really 100% mechanical contact here. So you can see this, this is the new crimper we designed and it wraps around just one crimp. And then you can see, look down here. If you look down here, you see how it goes up and down. And even with the wire, with the connective tissue, it goes up and down. And that means just by wrapping it around, you will have a solid contact to the long incus process. And then you will have no energy loss due to a loose contact here between the incus and the, um, uh, the titanium loop. Uh, I'm still using it because it is, you can individualize very well. If you do, if you use a nitty flex, for example, nitty bond, which will make a rigid contact, sometimes the piston stands or, or makes contact to the border of the perforation, which means it will decrease the amplitudes of the vibration. And that can give not so good results. You must remember in some cases, the long incus process runs a little bit conically. So if you use a flex, a nitty flex, for example, or nitty bond, and when it comes to a close contact, 
then suddenly the prosthesis sticks up to the upper part of the, the piston. And this is the advantage of this individually crimping. There you can play around a little bit and shift it and move it and then crimp again and then have it in the center of your perforation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Carl um, So very nice presentations. I see a lot of techniques, different techniques. And I want to start with um, discussion about these different things. First discussion is, I saw only one ceiling. It was done by uh, Robert Vincent with Raycraft. All other guides, you don't use any ceiling or do you use uh, soft tissue or gel form? Oh, yes. You, uh, sorry, sorry. You saw that I placed connective tissue. I always wrap the piston in connective tissue to reduce the atmospheric pressure variation movements. So there's always ceiling with connective tissue, yes. not with blood, like Alex Huber said, but really with connective tissue. Uh, I read the publication said also gel form is working instead of uh, gel form, uh, instead of soft tissue. Chris, do you use uh, ceiling? Yeah, so I use a, I very much use Robert's type of technique. So I use a vein graft. Um, so a slightly larger stapedotomy, 0.7 stapedotomy with a 0.4 piston, just to give enough room to have a vein graft underneath. And I, and I usually use the Teflon piston. The only time I, I don't is in a revision surgery where I've got an eroded lenticular process. And then I tend to use the knitted bond prosthesis because I think it's it's stable on a, an eroded incus. Is anybody who is using almost only gel form for ceiling? Well, I can tell you Ted McGee was my partner. And when he switched to using a laser, he felt that the small finestra was such that he no longer needed tissue. So he switched to gel foam. Um, and then I ended up correcting some of his perilymph fistulas. So then he went back to tissue. Okay. Daniel, uh, you have no soft tissue once you work through the canal without cut, cut uh, without Hermann incision or something like this. What do you use for ceiling? Uh, do you use, sorry? sorry? Um, you seal the, um, the stapedo to me with any uh, material or not? Yeah, sometimes, just sometime uh, uh, with the gel form, but uh, in the majority of the cases, I don't use uh, anything. Oh, that's surprising. Yeah. It's working. Yeah. It's working. It's working. No, no problem. Sometimes I put the gel form just around, but uh, honestly, in the majority of the cases, uh, if uh, uh, the, the prosthesis fit in the right way, I, I usually I don't use uh, material. Okay, my, my next question is to the uh, Raincraft experts. I know it's, it's, uh, it's coming from history to use a Raincraft, but um, you need to, another surgical step, you need another incision at the skin to take off the skin. Why do you wait <coughs> in graft and not, for example, perichondrium or fascia? So uh, when I do it, and I think it's the same for Robert, we're using a per oral approach, so we're not using an end oral approach. So you have to make a separate incision. So we make it from the dorsum of the hand. The incision is about three millimeters across with a single stitch. So you find that your patients really don't mind that. Um, of course, you could use pericondrum. Pericondrum is a little bit stiffer. So the vein graft is very nice on the foot plate. Yeah, I don't I, know what I, you I, think, I, Robert. Yeah, exactly the same. I've seen uh, cases where I, I revised following pericondrum, uh, which was used by the previous surgeon, and it doesn't fit very well to the other window because it's much thicker and it doesn't uh, uh, you know, stitch very well, um, stick very well to the other window. And there are many more risk of fistula for the perichondrium. Uh, fascia is about the same. I would say fascia is probably better than perichondrium. But the interesting thing with vein graft, apart the fact that you have to, to use it to take it from the other place, is that it's very thin and very elastic. And if you do revise uh, after several years, you can still find the vein graft, which is already there and completely alive. 
So it's a very nice material, I think, and very easy to use. And sometimes, you know, if I feel it, it's too, too thick, then I press it into a press and then make it thinner. Hmm. Uh, Alex, um, what do you think about the mechanical point of uh, Waincraft ceiling? Because if you have no ceiling, like Daniel, it's, it's uh, done. And, and otherwise, we have a Waincraft uh, uh, between. Do you, don't you think that uh, the impedance is different and that we get, we'll get other results? Um, I'm sure that the impedance at the foot plate uh, might be uh, different. However, um, there is also uh, uh, some of the impedance coming from the eardrum and uh, some of the foot plate itself, uh, I mean, from the, from the fluid in the, in the cochlea itself. So um, from, a, from a theoretical point of view, I would think that the, that the vein graft would not give us good results, but we see from the clinical situation that apparently the, um, the, the, the vein graft gives, gives equal results. So that to me proves that this, uh, this works fine. And, um, and uh, the, the other, in the other direction, if you have, I don't think it's possible to have no seal. Um, even if you don't place anything um, with the healing, it will seal because uh, otherwise the, the perilymph would flow out. So um, it's probably at the end, it's probably more or less the same if you, if you, um, if you don't do anything or if you put uh, some blood or uh, some tissue um, because it will not stick to the, the prosthesis, um, it, will, it will somehow give, uh, give a seal. Yeah, I, I fully agree. In fact, Alex, to my opinion, the Vengra doesn't make any difference in terms of functional results. It just helps for the ceiling. That's the main point to me. Sorry, ju just a, a clarification. And uh, because probably uh, I, I was working for another, but I didn't understand better the question. You are speaking about stapedectomy, removing everything. It's, it's right, not stapedotomy. Or stapedotomy. No, stapedotomy. Stapedotomy. Okay, stapedotomy. Okay, so this is right. I, I don't put uh, any material around, just uh, gel from the stock. Okay. That's interesting. May okay. I, may I ask, add something, some ideas on it? Uh, the first thing is that uh, this is why we put connective tissue around is that we measure this. Uh, the movement of the piston, and this is how I started in middle ear research anyhow, I wanted to know how much does the piston move in the vestibule when you make tympanometry. And I could measure that it goes up to 0 0.5 millimeters, 500 micrometers. Now remember that Ugo Fisch always, concerned, uh, always advised that the piston should enter the vestibule at least 0 0.5 millimeters in order to prevent any dislodgement outwards after Vasalva maneuver then you can imagine that the piston will go in and out inside the vestibule quite a long way. And this is why we place connective tissue around, ex ex except uh, apart from placing the prosthesis in the posterior part of the vestibule and so on, but, but put, um, put uh, connective tissue around that wraps the piston a little <clears throat> bit like in a glove. And that reduces this atmospheric induced movement in and out. It has nothing to do with vibration, but this huge movement will be reduced to the, to, due to the um, uh, wrapping in the connective tissue. And one remark to the vein graft. Uh, there is an interesting little point that you say, Vincent, Robert, you make a perforation of 0 0.7 and put in a 0 0.4 Piston. That means you have a very large vibrating area, not zero, just 0 0.4, but 0 0.5, 0 0.6, up to 0 0.7. And we know the larger the vibration area is, the less you, the less you need the large amplitude because you have a large area. Area and amplitude gives the, the volume displacement. And this is why you have good results, or at least even if the amplitude <clears throat> are reduced a little bit, still remember how the ear works even if they are reduced by half, then you still have only three to six decibel hearing loss, which you cannot measure. So they won't be reduced by half, but even if they're reduced a little bit, then you won't measure it. You will still give a perfect hearing, but the advantage with your design is that you will have a perfect 
protection against a dislodgement or <clears throat> too deep penetration of the piston into the inner ear. That was just under, uh, just a. No, no, that, that, I fully agree. I fully agree. That's the main point. Yeah. So I think also from the mechanical point of view, it's it's uh, a, we are agree because you enlarge your surface of the piston once you use the rain curve. Um, another question is: We discuss the diameter. What is your preferred diameter, Alex? Your favorite di diameter? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, and uh, and uh, as as you did um, in our lab, we also did some uh, some theoretical experiments uh, using different uh, prosthesis diameters, and um, and uh, found that the thicker the prosthesis or the, the bigger the diameter, the better the results. And um, and we added um, a literature review. Um, uh, systematic review and uh, also there was the same trend um, the, the bigger the prosthesis the better it is now um, there was a bit of a challenge uh, in Zurich since um, uh, the 0.4 prosthesis was uh, was introduced by Hugo Fisch and uh, for good reasons actually and um, uh, but however the, the results are a little bit better with thicker prosthesis so we changed um, uh, to uh, optimally 0.6 prosthesis, which is obviously not, not always possible. If we have an overhanging facial or something, then we use a 0.4, but if possible, we use a 0.6. And I think if you're going to wrap your prosthesis in tissue, then going to 0.4, you're adding that additional amount around it. Okay, Chris, uh, you use, what, what diameter you use? The diameter you use? Or yeah, sorry, I'm just unmuting. Yeah, I so I use 0.4 and I agree with what Carl and Jack have just said that because I use a vein graft and a slightly bigger uh, stapedotomy, I think functionally it's probably about a 0.6. Um, so I'd, I'm using a 0.7 hole, 0.4 prosthesis, but I think functionally around about 0 0.5, 0 0.6. Okay, Daniel? Zero, uh, 0 0.6 is the best or 0 0.5? Depending. Jan Christoph. Um, well, it, I think in my case, it, it, it's always a little bit related to, to the technique how I open the foot base because I use the micro perforators. And when you do that, you're always happy that you don't have uh, your, your uh, uh, moving, floating foot plate end up with this. And, and also, also sometimes you use your micro perforator of let's say 0 0.4, 0 0.5, but um, all of a sudden, um, uh, you, you, the posterior part of your um, of your foot plate might be might be gone, um, and you might have a fracture in there. And so, whenever I insert the 0.6 microperforator and then see a, a nice hole, then I kind of don't. I'm not brave enough to to go further and think, okay, I have my 0.6 hole. My 0.4 fits in there, so let's do it. And let's not just go too strongly for the 0.6. But I think that uh, strategy would change once I, I use the laser um, probably. Okay. Cesar, 0.6 or 0.5? If the anatomy lets me try, let me choose, I put 0.6 ever. Okay. So we have a tendency <laughs> to 0.6. The next question is uh, I saw that uh, the most uh, people. Um, made the uh, stapedo to me with first with the laser, but not open the inner ear with the laser. Uh, they open the inner ear with a micro drill or with a hand. Um, in former times, they uh, were done um, also laser uh, stapedo to me. Who, uh, why you change from the laser to the drill and not open the inner ear with a laser? It's a right. trauma you fear. Well, I can just say something about that. Uh, <clears throat> I always do. I always did the same technique of uh, a prior vaporization of the foot plate, uh, like rosette technique, and then finalizing the job with the micro drill. If you want to perform uh, laser stapedotomy, you really need to increase the, the sending up to ten watt or more, especially with a CO two laser. And I'm always afraid of uh, heating the labyrinth. 
even with the CO2, which is, uh, of course, we know the safest one. So I prefer to uh, just vaporize the foot plate to decrease the thickness and the resistance of the foot plate and uh, finalizing the, the job with the micro drill. And it's better than going directly with the micro drill because, of course, the trauma will be more important if you dry, if you drill directly, in my opinion. So I prefer, I prefer to use the combination of this. And my, just one point, my state economy is 0.8. I use a 0.7 millimeter burr, and this creates uh, 0.8 millimeter opening. And I use 0.4 millimeter uh, stapes pistons since the beginning with Jean Bernard Cross. Okay. Is there anybody who used uh, laser only without micro drilling? No. Tomas, I was, uh, I helped Surgiplan uh, work to create the one shot scanner. Yes. So, um, and then they were bought by Luminous. So that used to create the perfect 0 0.6 or 0 0.7 um, Finestra one shot. You did not need to drill. And once it was done in a tenth of a second, you put your prosthesis in. But I know in recent years, every, everyone's gone to the fiber optic probes, but, but that was extremely useful at the time. Okay. Uh, next question is um, um, ceiling diameter drill. Yes, uh, Daniel, I saw your endoscopic technique and I wonder a little bit that you use uh, courage or the house spoon to dissect uh, the overhanging um, lateral wall. Um, I thought once you use the endoscope, it's not necessary to dissect any bone because uh, you can use an, an uh, angled optic um, and then it's not, uh, is it right or not? Yeah, uh, honestly, it's not right because uh, uh, the problem is not the view because uh, you can see in a perfect view with the uh, step is uh, big like this, but you are not able to move the instrument. Yes. So you have to correct just in order to gain the space uh, to manage with uh, one hand uh, and uh, the surgery. So the secret of the endoscopic step is, is to remove just a little bit the bone in the posterior aspect of the canal, like in the microscopic uh, surgery. Okay, so that's what I thought. Uh, um, lots of questions, yes? How about? Yes, yes. But then comes this is uh, the question which came into my mind when I saw you taking out uh, the lateral attic bone wall, <clears throat> which is always mandatory if you go by microscope in there. And I also thought that the advantage, the only advantage of endoscopic surgery is that you don't need to take off this uh, lateral attic wall, that you can keep the corda in its running bone because it can come from more from anteriorly. But as you do, I could also do it with microscope. I look straight forward into the over window niche by taking out uh, some of the bones. So why use the endoscope if I can work with microscope in the same way, but even with both hands? What is the advantage of endoscopic surgery if you have to take out a piece of the overhanging bone? Uh, it is really simple. And the view, especially the management of the malformation, because this is the most important aspect. When you have a monopodalic stapes, when you have a, a artery run over the foot plants, when you have a descent facial nerve, if you are working with the angle scope, you can have a, a really nice view and you can understand better the relationship between the facial nerve, the foot plants, and, and, and when you reach the skill, the same skill with the microscope and bring the endoscope. This is the endoscopic approach. This is the only uh, way because we are using the endoscope because the view is a completely different. Uh, so, but it's not the problem of the corda. Sometimes you can leave the corda in place if you have uh, a good conformation of the stem of the Tori canal using a 45 degree. But honestly, in my opinion, is not this the advantages of the endoscopic approach to the status. May I ask Daniel, um, you know, I was doing a couple acoustic neuromas a week and towards the end, we were starting to do some endoscopic and they made a holder for the endoscope so you could use two hands. Is there not a holder for otologic endoscopic approaches? 
Yeah, now, now uh, there are some older for uh, endoscopic transcanal approach, uh, or not just for this, but you can use uh, for the transcanal endoscopic approach. But honestly, uh, the canal is, is quite narrow in order to use two hand and the uh, endoscope in the middle of the field. And so probably in the future, when the, the scope will be really small and uh, will be possible probably to perform the same surgery with two hand uh, with uh, a, a small camera with the 4K uh, monitor uh, and high resolution, uh, but not now, not now. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I want to give you some questions from the audience uh, only to lift up the hands. Uh, one question is, uh, do you every time measure the length of the piston or not? Who is every time measure the piston length? One, two, three. So <laughs> it's half and half, half and half, zero. Professor didn't bring zero. So I think it depends from case. Uh, Thomas, Thomas, can I say something about that? Yes. <clears throat> You know, I'm preparing publication about 7,000 primary cases of stapedotomy. And uh, I, measure, I put that on my database since the beginning. So I, I, I also put the measurement that I, that I measure peroperatively. And over all this series, the, the main length is 4.5 uh, in the vast majority of cases, but not always. We still have five millimeter length and sometimes less than four. So I think it is important to measure because there, there are differences. Okay. That's my point. One question at, at least is um, how to manage the gusher. Once you open the, the, the food plate and fluid comes out. In my opinion, it depends from the gusher. Uh, sometimes you can block it with soft tissue. Sometimes you need cartilage. What is your opinion, experience? I can st maybe I can start. What I use is I use a specific technique. Well, the real gesture is a nightmare. It's one per 1,000. Yeah, so you can one. use the vein graph technique, of course. Yeah, I use the vein graph, but even with the vein graph, it's, if it's a real gesture, the fluid is pushing the, the vein up. So you need to prepare yourself and decrease the blood pressure pressure until you get a better I mean, feeling, and, and uh, then you can do it. I put I put vein graft and I seal completely of the oval window with gel foam to you know to compress the vein down to the oval window, and then I put the piston. Well, how about? I think I'm afraid that gel foam might not be stable enough, and there might be a perilymph leakage in the end uh, coming running through the nose. <clears throat> I'm I've well, I, never I, didn't, I, I, I never had that. I never had that. Oh, you're lucky. No, no, it's it's true. True. Southern France, people are different. Also, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm when I started, I was trained by my old, our old doctors who learned the hard way in the beginning of stapes surgery in the 70s, 60s, and so on. And we learned, and they're still doing it. I take a, when I, when I uh, see the around the over the foot plate, and everything is still intact. I take a little needle and I make a little hole into the foot plate. This was the seeing if there is a gusher. And then if there is a gusher coming out, that of course is rare, one every two or three years it was, uh, there is a little trick for it and I you could use it easily. I took a piece of bean of, of graft, not bean graft, but normal graft, put it on this tiny hole and then took a, a prosthesis, a piston prosthesis, everything was still okay and wrapped it on the ink, long incus process and pressed this piston prosthesis onto this very tiny hole. That means the security hole served its function to prevent a complete e extraction of the uh, stapes or like you do if you perform directly a large drill, then you have a bigger problem in your large, uh, large perforation. And there I had another possibility in one of these cases, I took out the complete stapes, put in a graft and then replaced the stapes like in a cork and place it underneath the incus and press it with the help of the incus into the oval window niche. So I preserved the intact stapes as a, as a, as a, as a cork. It's pressed my wing graft, my, my graft into the oval window niche. Okay. Different techniques, Cesar? Yes. Uh, I think that the best treatment is prevention. 
and we advise to do a CT scan before surgery. I know that it's possible to have a gasher in autosclerosis, but the main cases are a wrong diagnosis. So the first treatment is prevention, CT scan, previous surgery. I have had two cases of real autosclerosis with gasher. I solved with the same with the same technique, and I had a good result. I, if you don't have anything to say, that, that, that you don't uh, uh, lose the hearing. I do a complete stapedectomy. I put a very big pericondium and I put the, the ancient prosthesis, a tube, polyethylene tube. And then in the postoperative, I make a puncture in the lumbar area to the cerebral fluid. And in this case, uh, in two cases, I have a good result. Okay. I was surprised of that. So does, so, it mean, does it mean that you perform in every autosclerosis case a CD scan before? Yeah. Okay. So and I have an interesting publication that it makes sense maybe, but it's, <clears throat> it's also uh, it's also uh, expensive. But uh, I read the publication that you can measure the length of your prosthesis from the CD scan before, so you can do it also. Uh, I would like to change the topic and to come to the obliteration and reconstruction of the posterior wall. And I have here a small presentation about this. Um, yes, obliteration techniques. Um, you can see my presentation. Uh, we have different materials for obliteration. We can use muscle fascia, perichondrum, and bone pate and alloplastic materials. And uh, I think today it's a standard because we can get very good uh, dry um, cavities or enlarged external ear canals in these cases. And there's a nice publication about how you can harvest the material and how we can also uh, harvest um, arterials uh, for the flaps. And we have four or three different layers in the mess eat to harvest materials. Uh, for the obliteration, like here, uh, particular uh, deep mastoid fascia flap and uh, mastoid fascia flaps so that can be also used. Um, uh, in principle, we go first start cholesteatoma surgery in a transcanal approach, retrofacular incisions, and we prefer mastoidectomy if we um, see that the cholestatoma reads the antrum, and then depending on this, we dissect the posterior wall, very rare cases, but much more, we perform a radical cavity and we uh, obliterate the cavity in the third step. We have bone pate, we have bone pate combining with a muscle flap, we have bone pate combining with cartilage and muscle flap, and we, or we have only muscle flap and um, cartilage. Uh, it's important to oversheet the bone pate or the muscle or the cartilage with um, fascia and um, or perichondrum. So that is uh, a few to the obliteration. Postoperative care means we had to follow up these patients and we heard in the morning that it makes sense to make MRI control. Um, the quality of life after obliteration of cavities is much more better as uh, without obliteration of the cavities. Uh, the hearing improvement is only around 5 dB once you compare the closed and the open technique, but after obliteration, you have less discharged ears and better life of quality. And I found also uh, some publications about obliteration of the mastoid cavity with bone pate uh, uh, in cases of intact posterior wall. And it's also very interesting. Uh, we have no experience. So that is a picture with obliteration with uh, glass cement and with uh, cartilage and uh, perichondrum flap and uh, silastic foils. And um, I have also a short video demonstration about this. Uh, that is the bone pate, and over the bone pate comes the cartilage, 
and over the cartilage comes a perishondrum, and that you can use in cases if you have enough bone pate left. Good, but now comes uh, to your suggestions for obliteration techniques. And I want to call the first video presentation. It's given by Chris Aldrin. Right. Hi, can you can you hear me? Yes. Uh, and can you see my screen? Yes. You see the screen? Yeah. Okay. So let's go from the beginning. So we're just going to look at mastoid obliteration. Um, the, just briefly. Uh, so what I do with my cholesterol surgery, I do combined approach to panoplasty, and as you just showed in your slide, my technique is now primary bony obliteration with a canal wall up primary reconstruction of the acicular chain. I use endoscopes and lasers to try and minimize the risk of residual disease. And then I follow up my patients for a minimum of five years with a non-EPI diffusion weight scan at one and five years. And if all's well at five years, I would discharge them. So this is what, uh, this is a canal wall up. Uh, you can see a posterior tympanotomy. There's a prosthesis in place. And then I close that off with a piece of tragal cartilage. So this is, basically closing off the attic. And then I take bone pate and I fill the whole of the cavity. So starting off up the attic <coughs> and um, we soak the bone pate in ciprofloxacin and then just gradually fill this cavity making, trying to push it the pate and so it's nice and tight. And this has been an absolute game changer for me. I'll show you very briefly some figures in a second, but it's made a massive difference to my practice in terms of recurrent disease. So the other thing I'm gonna look at briefly is open cavities. I don't do open cavities, but I get quite a lot that I've been sent to revise. And uh, this is a little bit like Thomas has explained. So I do a standard post-auricular incision. I then usually harvest an inferiorly based Nauman flap. And the advantage of this flap is it allows you to go up over the temporalis fascia and inc incorporate temporalis fascia and then down onto the periosteum. It's pedicled inferiorly here on this right ear. And then I harvest the bone pate and I use a bone pate collector, which is the Robinson Moffat collector. Uh, you have to hold your drill a little bit more vertically than normal to stop the bone pate flying all over. And then it's harvested in this pate collector. There's a little filter in here and you've seen the bone pate. And then we put that to one side and soak that in ciprofloxacin. And it's important to do that prior to opening the mastoid because you don't want to contaminate this bone pate. And then you aim to elevate the whole of your lining. So you're pushing this anteriorly. Uh, if possible, it's nice to get it up in a single piece. Sometimes the lining is poor quality and it's not possible to do that. It's very important, of course, to get all the residual original lining out. I then go through and laser any areas of any, uh, sorry, there's no filter on the camera here. Uh, and then I go in with my endoscopes and check that I've got a satisfactory clearance of all the squamous epithelium. Um, And here I'm actually excising a little bit of really quite uh, poor quality uh, lining. Uh, I'm putting in a Dresden clip here, you'll be pleased to see. And then for these open cavities, we go and take the bone pate, we press to absorb the excess ciprofloxacin. And then as with the closed cavity, we just fill up. Um, in this situation, you're filling up really from the sort of mastoid sump first. And the bone pate is a really lovely material to use. It's very easy to get a nice, smooth cavity. And filling right up into the attic. And then I usually put some cartilage over that and then put in my Nauman flap. So some pieces of cartilage. 
and then turning in this inferiorly pedicled flap. And then obviously the existing lining and canal skin go on top of that. And we aim to have a, ca uh, a canal that's just slightly bigger than a normal, a normal canal. So this is what we do. And then I just put in some Merigel. So that's the video. Uh, and just then we use the monitoring, as I've mentioned, and just briefly looking at results. So originally I would use a combined approach to impanoplasty without any bony obliteration. And these were figures not that dissimilar from the literature, revisions in 21%, but within the first three years, 15%. And since we've gone to primary obliteration, we haven't actually done any revisions at all, and we've not found any residual or recurrent disease. So it's been a complete game changer for me. Okay, so that's my uh, video. Thanks. Very interesting. Very interesting, Chris. Um, I read... oh, it's a dr dramatic difference. Yes, I read some publications about it, but um, now I've seen from you. Very nice. So the next speaker on my plan is Cesar Oros. Do you hear me? We hear you. Yes? yes. Okay, I will show you the, the, the classical surgery of bona life technique that we use usually. This is a secondary obliteration, not primary, not in a in a closed uh, technique is an open cavity. And we use this, uh, this material of life that is very useful because it inhibits bacterial growth and it stimulates bone formation is a regenerator. And it's very really useful in this type of cavities with the patient have a bad surgery with the fascial wall too high and the brise in the mastoid and very frequent infections. We use an auricular incision, as always. Then we perform the inverted pulvar flap. You see here, it's a rectangular. The longer, the better, for to, to achieve a good sealing of the of the material. You see here. We enter into the edge of the cavity. You try to preserve the skin, but it's very difficult. Many times you you, you broke the, the mucosa and it's it's the standard procedure. You, you can do it. Then you do the red vasectomy, removing the pathological mucosa, drilling the osteotic bone. And this is the aspic before the, the, the reconstruction. The first step is cartilage harvesting. We need a huge quantity to achieve a good seal, and we use concha and, and thin cartilage. We remove all this cartilage, and always and and, and also fascia uh, 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 harvesting. And the same, the much fascia, the bigger fascia, the bigger, more easy to seal. And now we begin to fill the cavity and look at this detail. The attic is filled with cartilage, with small pieces. You don't use the, the, uh, <clears throat> the bone knife because it could fall easily and could cause uh, material leakage. So the attic was, is filled with cartilage and the rest of the cavity, we use uh, the bone knife. You see here, that's very simple to use. It can be molded easily. And we, we fill all the cavity. Okay. And this is the most important uh, step, the recreation of a new external channel reconstruction. And we use the cartilage. And you see the concha cartilage and the thimba cartilage are very good for this because uh, they have a curve that is very similar to the normal channel. Like you, you see here, this round shape is very nice because when you see the duotioscopy, it seems a normal channel. It's very important to seal this area to avoid the uh, material leakage. 
from the mastoid. We fully put the material and then the fascia, the bigger the better, because you can achieve a, bit, uh, a, a better ceiling. And the last step is use the pulva flap where we put over the cartilage. Here, and this is the final result. You will see. This is the fascia. Okay. And I will show you the result of this case. This is the result one year. Look at this, a new narrow uh, external canal is narrow, but no problem. And the infection was resolved the problem. And so the, the patient is very happy with the surgery. And look at the aspect of the new channel that it seems and the original one, maybe a little bit narrow. That's all, thank you very much. Thank you, Cesar. And um, I think bone alive is also a good uh, alternative to bone pate, for example, or mostly once you have no bone pate. And now we are uh, in the next speaker. The next speaker is Carl Bernd Hünbrink. Yes, please. Please. Oh, wait. Oh. It was the last one, the next. So <clears throat> um, this is an attic cholesteatoma, large attic cholesteatoma. And since, you know, you know, I, I grew up in the period when there was still the huge discussion about intact canal wall technique, mastoidectomy, radical cavity. And we always said intact canal wall technique, the German plaster technique, they tried to do everything with mastoidectomy. But especially in cholesteatoma, you have a reduced aeration, a used pneumatization. Sometimes we work in dark little holes down trying to get between the sinus and the, the uh, posterior canal wall. So with the respect to all the experience we had with uh, cartilage, we said, well, let's drill down the posterior wall, follow the cholesteatoma, and just take it out without doing a mastoidectomy. Just take, take out the bone which obstructs the view, but leaving the rest of the mastoid intact. And you see in former times, this could not be done. This is a sort of an ethical to me. But nowadays with cartilage, you can reconstruct everything. So we don't do nearly, not, not 100%, but in most of the cases, we just follow the disease, take out the uh, uh, cholesteatoma. Well, you don't need all this here. Drill it out because cholesteatoma is like carcinoma each cell has to be drilled out. So we smoothen the bone behind the cholesteatoma to be sure there is no carcinoma cell left, a cholesteatoma cell left behind. And especially in the anterior groove there, anterior to the tubal orifice. Then we see there's still granulation tissue which obstruct the, and the uh, tender tympani fold, which is important for drainage of the attic, attic cavity for the attic place. And so we place our silicone sheeting in there to, to have a good drainage into the tubal orifice. You will always find a closure of the tensor fold or an obstruction there, sometimes even bony, in cases of attic cholesteatomata. You have to make it open to, to, to have a good view. This is the uh, cilia elastic fold only for the promontory for the end of the surgery. This is just place it in. But so now we have two Celestic folds. And now we reconstruct, we drill a groove into the anterior wall of the, this former attic, lateral attic wall, and then the posterior groove down there, from, starting from the facial canal groove. We have ta already taken out the big piece of cartilage there from the contia, and we measure and we sculpture it and we place it like this inside these grooves. Fix it additionally with some cartilage left over. So that is really stable, a new wall, posterior wall with a good drainage due to the, uh, due to the silastic sheeting towards the tubal orifice. You can reconstruct now 
the to impend the uh, ossicular chain, place remaining cartilage perichondrium on top so that you have a good reconstruction there because in these cases of atecholicytomata, pars tensa mostly is intact. So you can put it there, place, and if you have, now you could leave it open over there. So in, in this case here, we had a lot of bone left, which we took out from the superior part, where, which was not contaminated. And so in these rare cases, I also closed this upper part, but this is not even necessary. This is uh, perichondrium from our carbon conche, and we just reconstruct, we take this bone out here, but really this is, is a rare case where we have so much bone left, and instead of throwing it away, I said, well, let's use it here and reconstruct this superior part. But the real, the lateral and attic wall is reconstructed by this cartilage here, which is a new lateral attic wall. In cases of a pre-existing radical cavity, like I said, we nearly don't drill radical cavities anymore. We just follow the disease and take, down, take away the posterior wall until we can control the disease and reconstruct with cartilage, even the posterior wall down here. But in cases where there is an old radical cavity, we had, like we saw already, we fill the radical cavity after again drilling it out and uh, this is perhaps the reason why Chris Aldrin has so few, res no residues anymore, because we treat these radical cavities which where we know we will put something in there, much more, uh, much more um, delicate, or much more thoroughly than before. And then we cover it with cartilage from the carbon conche. All the cartilage, the bone dust must be covered by cartilage because <clears throat> otherwise this bone dust, even impregnated in antibiotics, will be a wonderful agar, agar for the bacteria in there. And we had a lot of losses of this bone dust. This is the flap because we took out the cone chair cartilage. This flap, the skin flap, will rest on the, on the um, cartilage cover in the uh, radical cavity. And then we have make a large entrance here. And in the end, the result will be just an enlarged ear canal covered with uh, closed with uh, this bone, this cartilage plate to the posterior mastoid wall. It's also a complete obliteration in this case, but without preserving the bony posterior wall. We don't need this bony posterior wall. Sometimes it's very narrow. The ear canal can be a little larger because we have opened the entrance also. So uh, this is the, the, our procedure to reduce the cholesteatoma and to have a good cavity. Thank you very much. That's it. Finish. Finish. Okay. Um, I don't Hans hear you. Oh, yeah. The microphone is off. Okay. Microphone is on. No. Uh, thank you so much. Um, we, I think the lateral attic wall is uh, reconstruction is a very central place in the reconstruction technique. Alex, do you have a presentation now? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if I understood the task correctly. Oh, yeah, so right. I pulled out the subtotal petrosectomy uh, for um, for the uh, cases of like uh, draining uh, possible solution for years, draining uh, ears of several times uh, where operated have, cavities. Uh, but I don't. I, I'm not um, sure if that fits in yeah, actually. Cases so, um, for vibrant okay. and um, and uh, um, and and. Um, uh, discharge cavities for many years with uh, a lot of uh, revision surgery and then we can obliterate the mastoid with uh, fat and close external cowl and insert a white print sandwich. That's a good option in some cases. Okay, but now uh, we want to hear what uh, Jan Christoph Lewis is presenting on obliteration techniques. Right, I was asked to um, concentrate on the um, cartilage um, part, the cartilage um, using it in, in, in radical cavities. Uh, but basically the concept uh, I use is um, similar to what you've seen before. Um, I, I always use a bone pate to obliterate a radical cavity, which I never actually uh, do myself, but it's only for revision surgeries, which have, uh, come to us from other clinics and um, tend to use a lot of this um, bone pate and then um, um, collect it. And as you've already seen or heard from Chris Aldrin, uh, use some um, antibiotics, uh, soak it in, and then have it really dry. And you saw it nicely in Chris' presentation that you can really nicely 
uh, adapted later on to the uh, situation of your radical cavity, which you see in here. And uh, so I now concentrate on this cartilage area. I mean, you, you already saw how to get your cartilage. What is special and, and important, in my opinion, in when taking um, cartilage for uh, obliterating a radical cavity, uh, because I want to cover all my bone pate with my cartilage, is that I really take a very big piece of cartilage, more or less the whole concha, and at least I uh, go really uh, quite beyond down uh, to the area where this uh, cavum uh, concha really ends, because what I always combine my radical cavities, obliteration, obliterated radical uh, cavities later on, is um, uh, a widening of the ear canal entrance, because my aim is to have a, to have a small ear canal later on, not that small as it is in its natural course, but uh, obviously smaller than a radical cavity but uh, to have a nice aeration of this uh, ear canal and not have some discharge once again, uh, you really have, uh, you want to have a very nice and large ear canal and it helps if you remove the bone, which um, covers this anterior part of the cavum concha and then you can use some suturing later on and uh, bend the cavum concha, the, the skin back and enlarge the ear canal. Um, and there are some other techniques how to, to enlarge this later on. So you take a big piece of cartilage and then you once again use your, uh, I use the, um, the the cartilage slice and produce a lot of big pieces, preferably um, uh, from this one to really cover all the area because my one aim is always to cover all the bone pate. I don't have experience with what Chris said, but it seemed to work nicely um, just covering it with, um, with soft tissue. Um, I think, uh, to me, a barrier of cartilage is always um, is always um, what I want. Uh, always, obviously, also uh, trying to get some some perichondrium to use it for a part of the uh, tympanic membrane. Then, um, obliterating the radical cavity, just. Uh, to that extent that just like like it's also saw in Chris um, video and you see it right here I already I, I also always try to fill the uh, area of the attic because that's where you might have your recurrences uh, later on and so I always al also fill this with stone pate I just always also make sure that I don't fully cover the lateral um, semicircular canal because I just imagine that when you do revision surgery later on and have a fully covered uh, lateral semicircular canal, you might just um, miss some of your important landmarks to find your way. Uh, and so I always try to uh, leave this uh, a little bit uncovered, but otherwise have a very nice and wide outer ear canal. Then uh, right afterwards, I insert my prosthesis, a clip prosthesis in this case. I also have my silicon sheeting in there, uh, put it beyond the... Um, below the, the, uh, the malleus handle. And then we have our many pieces of cartilage and starting with the big ones, trying to cover all the area of the bone pate um, up to the level of the, the attic also, but also covering uh, the tympanic membrane and you can use it with the same um, piece with which you cover the attic. It works very well in acoustic um, circumstances. And yeah, that's mainly it. Let's have a look. Okay, then uh, some favorite normally covers my my cartilage pieces of cartilage, and I just make sure, and you see it in here, that you really have a, a full coverage of the bone pate, and I don't want it to to uh, get in contact with some bacteria of my outer ear canal. Um, placing back my my flap, making sure that there is no no lining going um, beyond the edges, so you don't have a, a place yourself. Um, uh, a cholesteatoma in your ear canal. And then I cover this um, lining with some silicone sheeting once again, which you already 
So there are three folds covering the tympanic membrane area. And then you have these radical cavity folds, which are kind of larger. I use three or four of these to cover all my the area of my aortic ear canal. And this will be uh, later on the, um, the, uh, the size, the volume of the aortic ear canal. And I must say with this technique, uh, also have nice results. I have not lost a single uh, obliterated radical cavity, I would say, in terms of uh, infection of the um, uh, obliterated mustard, and it works quite well. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. So now we are at the end of the video presentation, and I'd like to open the last discussion about this. One question comes from the audience to Chris Alban. Uh, it comes it comes not from me, Chris. It comes from the audience. Yeah. The question is, why do you think is the obliteration of the mastoid better than not to obliterate the mastoid? Yeah. So as I was saying, I, I obliterate primarily with the combined approach. And if you look at the literature, if you look at in, in the UK, we were very influenced by a, a surgeon from Northern Ireland called Gordon Smith. At the time, in the sort of 70s and 80s, he was very meticulous looking at his results, and he was comparing and published his results of open and closed cavities. And with closed cavities, what he found, particularly in children, that was a very high recurrence rate of cholesteatoma. And when you obliterate the mastoid, and particularly obliterate the attic, there is nowhere for the cholesteatoma to recur into, really. You know, normally the attic is collapsing, you're getting recurrent disease up there. And that's not possible anymore because it's full of bone pate. And interestingly, uh, if we think about the mastoid, in these cases, it's possibly a diseased mastoid. So you're getting rid of this abnormal disease mucosa. And what you often find is that the middle ear, middle ear ventilation seems to improve when you obliterate the mastoid. So I, I was influenced. I mean, this is not obviously not my technique. It was originally described by Ulf Merker in Sweden, and it was taken on by Erwin Officier in, uh, in Belgium, and Bruce Gantz and many others, and many of the Scandinavians are using this sort of technique. But uh, I took it on initially because I found, just like Gordon Smith had, that although I was doing quite meticulous combined approach surgery, I was getting recurrent disease and it's stopped completely with us it's a remarkable change so that's why okay. I, me, understand. Me. I understand my question is uh, Bogdan, do you have an yeah I, I just want to chris i just want to argue a little bit not against it but just want to continue you know gordon smith smith it was also my period and so he analyzed 100 years Next hundred years were with intact canal wall technique and the next hundred were with radical cavity. And he could show that radical cavity gave a lot less recidives, recurrent cholesteatomata. And he said, don't do any intact canal wall technique anymore. He did, so, he did. So, but, but he, he said that was the result of his paper, his famous paper, yeah. 200. Yeah. And yeah. so what I don't understand a little bit, this is why there's always this discussion. You come back to intact canal wall, you obliterate, yeah. yes. Yeah. 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 All these disadvantages of preserving the posterior canal wall, that means recidives in the shadow of the posterior canal wall, having a limited entrance only because it is so, if there is no good pneumatization, why not take away the posterior canal wall and then obliterate this radical cavity like we because, do because these ears look like normal healthy ears i mean the reason i went back to combined approach and i was taught to do a front back open master just as you described but interestingly without obliteration but through newcastle and john Dawes, who you probably remember dizzy Dawes. um i was taught to do that but then when i started doing combined approach when it worked well I thought this is fantastic. These ears look amazing. They just look like normal ears. But of course, I was getting the recurrent disease. But when you obliterate, you, you get the advantage of both. You've got an intact wall. You've got a predominantly intact attic. If you have to reconstruct the attic with cartilage, you've got a really solid base of an obliterated attic. Uh, and honestly, it's remarkable. I mean, I, I'm stunned how good it is. And, okay. you know, obviously, like many Many people I was concerned, you're going to be burying diseased, you're going to have to revise these operations. But of course, when you scan and follow them up, that just doesn't seem to happen. I mean, it's really, but, you know, you've mentioned it before, there are different ways of doing it.
but some of the the disadvantages that you you talk about i think we've got rid of a lot of those things about access by using endoscopes by using lasers you know the access is not such a problem now you know you occasionally, just, occasionally just, of course it is just let me add one little historical remark the first one who proposed it was moiser in wuppertal in germany and okay. when he presented it, it was he poured cement into this posterior, in this mastoid, and he was torn to pieces by Plester Wurzel and all the very famous. Oh, you are burying the disease. What do you do? And he had to go away like this from the audience. So uh, nowadays everybody is doing it, and he was torn to pieces. You know, this is he was twenty years too early. Visionary, visionary, yeah. yeah. Okay. And of course German. How could I say? <laughs> one, one question, uh, Chris. Uh, you remove all the mucosa from the mastoid before? Well, not not especially, actually. No, I mean, you, you know, as you know, as we all know, you can't remove all the mucosa. And, you know, when you obliterate, you sort of think, well, will you get mucoseals? But we don't get mucoseals. Um, so I, I take out the mucosa, but I don't go for every last little bit. I mean, you can't do that. Okay. Why, why, can, why can't you do that? I mean, if you if you well, I mean, the whole mastoid. Yeah, I mean, if you do a sub, if you take out the whole of the mastoid, you can do, do that. But you know, you have to follow it up to the Peter's apex, and you, you know, we're we're not, you don't you don't need to do that. Um, I think that that mucosa gives a blood supply to your bone pate. I think. May I, I give an explanation for this? We also wondered why we behind the obliteration, why we don't get mucosal cells. Because yeah. in the mastoid, the mucosa is a different type than in the, in the tympanic cavity. In the tympanic cavity, we have mucus producing mucosa, similar to the sinus. Whereas in the mastoid, we have only gas producing mucosa. There is no mucus producing mucosa. And this is why sometimes behind this obliteration, you find air filled cells. There's air in the healthy way. Air, but not mucus, because this mucosa doesn't produce mucus, but air. Uh, that's yeah. the next question. Some, uh, there were some investigations that uh, find out that the mastoid is a buffer for the ventilation of the middle ear. So um, I wanted that we would close the mastoid in the childhood and children and uh, get no retractions of the new, new retractions of the tumoral membrane. But it's, that's your observation, yes? I mean, my feeling with it is that obviously we, for whatever reason, the mastoid's there, um, although we know it's extremely variable. But I think, you know, the ears we're operating on have got unhealthy mastoids. And so, uh, you know, getting rid of them is a positive thing. I'm not saying you should do that to a healthy mastoid, but by definition, really, these are unhealthy ears. That's why we're operating. Yes. May I give an explanation for this? I also thought about it. When you, op when you obliterate your mastoid, you, re you get rid of all this inflammation. What is the mucosa besides an inflammation, next to an inflammation? We know from the sinus surgery that it swell. Where will we have swelling and inflammation also, also in the tympanic cavity? So if you get rid of all this inflammation, then the mucosa and the tympanic cavity can heal, heal. It can produce gas again, and you won't have, and there's a good drainage to the tubal orifice, and then the, the middle ear heals. But if you have remaining infection in the mastoid, in the attic, it will never heal. It's the same like in sinus surgery. It is, the ear is a big sinus. And what we learned from the endoscopic sinus surgery, we can report also to the, uh, bring to the middle ear. The same thing. Okay, so that's an interesting development. Uh, Cesar, we saw your obliteration with bone paint, uh, not with bone and life. I use this material too and have also very good experience, but I think it's important that we cover the bone uh, alive with its, its uh, glass, glass uh, cement, that we cover this with cartilage and with perichondrium. Otherwise, uh, you get a um, uh, resolution or uh, the displacement of your um, of your uh, bone alive. That's right. Yeah, I have a huge experience with bone alive, and in the first surgeries, in ten percent of the cases, I don't get a good ceiling, and I I, I, I obtain a, a leakage of the material. So now I'm very very 
conscious of the problem. And then when I make the ceiling, I use cartilage in the in the attic because it's, it's the best way to avoid fall down. When a life is very is like wet sand, it's very it's very easy to move. The cartilage is is is, is the rest fixed in the in the place that you put. So it's it's very difficult to 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 fall down to the to the cavity. So uh, the, the my, my my recommendation is to fill the attic with uh, cartilage and the mastoid with one life. Okay. So are there any comments or questions? I see not. So I, I'd like to I'd like to make some closing remarks of this course. Yeah, we have seen a lot of different reconstruction techniques and different materials and uh, different philosophies. But I think that uh, some things uh, are, um, in, some, in some topics we have an agreement and I noted some of these agreements. Uh, the first is, um, I think that in the tumoring membrane, Reconstruction cartilage is a, is a favorite material in cases of uh, strong ventilated middle ears or bad ventilated middle ears. That is for the tumoring membrane, in my opinion. An agreement. Another agreement um, is uh, for the bridging, bridging or rebridging of the long process of the incus can give the same results, acoustic results, as um, top reconstructions. But uh, it makes sense in some special cases, uh, for example, in cases of ventilation problems and others. So rebridging uh, makes sense. Uh, Malleus replacement. Uh, Prosthesis. We have seen the Marius displacement from the Robert Amazon. Um, I have no experience with this prosthesis. Maybe that you have some experience or not. But I think if you have no Marius, it would be an option uh, to try it. And type 3A reconstruction. Uh, there was discussion uh, of, uh, to use a strut columnar or to use a clip prosthesis with underneath uh, or with contact to the malleus. I think uh, we cannot say if there are different results today or not. And concerning the top reconstruction, the 3D reconstruction, I think it's an agreement that um, it makes sense to stabilize the prosthesis at the foot plate. Um, and uh, to, uh, to get better results. For Stabis reconstruction, I've seen a recruitment that uh, most guides use uh, 0.6 millimeter or between 0.6 and 0.7 and a, a clip or memory uh, mechanism has advantages at, uh, um, to, to fit the procedures. And uh, the most uh, searches um, recommend the sealing of the uh, stability to me with soft tissue or uh, as a material of aircraft. And obliteration techniques, we have a new aspects now, I think, with the obliteration of semestiate in cases of intact posterior wall. We will see the results in the next years, but maybe. We can prevent in this way retractions and uh, a new cholesteatoma. I have not experience with this, uh, but we 